All right, well, we're getting these teams into picks and bands shortly. They're trying to get the game set up. So we're going to go to a quick break, but we'll be right back with picks and bands for Knights vs. Radiance. The stage is set right now for that lineup of the Pittsburgh Knights to try and make a run. Well, I was going to say like never before, but I guess just like last year, if they get <laughs> their way, they want to make the exact same run they can. If you're Cubo, you're a fresh take into this one. You're going to have to defeat your previous world MVP, Sam, for soccer in the finals, no matter which team gets ahead here. Looking down at the bottom, adapting, still looking to get back to his chair, but everybody else looks locked in here, Agro, And it's kind of shifting over. You had mentioned the jungle, but I think also seeing Aurora on that screen, it brings a lot of presence, reminding and remembering what he can bring. The Kuzenbo, we got to see out of Raffer yesterday. The Hercules I had mentioned earlier, even if he hasn't big as, been as big lately. But he also likes Kabraken. He plays Terra. I mean, he's willing to pull out things other supports aren't. And he's really willing to, willing to change the meta around what he's going to pick. And I think what Aurora is picking during this Smite World Championship is going to be a really big deal for how this Radiance team is going to perform. Because I don't know what Aurora is picking. Aurora is, is always willing to do something very, very strange. That Terra that you mentioned, no one else playing Terra at the time. The Kuzenbo that you mentioned. Some people playing the Kuzenbo, but maybe not quite as often. I think the Radiance is one of those teams that is always willing to come in with a very different game plan than other teams. They don't get rattled by looking at other teams, heavily prioritizing things like Ratatosker, and maybe they think Ratatosker isn't even playable. That That isn't something that would rattle a team like this. They're full of veterans top to bottom. Yeah, there's only one way to find out what he's going to lock in so I can move and get an eye on my picks and bands in front of me. Things that we've been looking at, though, you, you know, Yamoja, Set, Persephone, Guan, Cupid, those have all been top bands so far. It seems like the Knights are leaning a little bit different. Morgan has been up there a lot of today. In fact, I'd say all, all of today, all four games now that we've seen, she's been able to come through. And we don't even get to see it. We mentioned this Kukulin earlier, and he's already taken off the list alongside the Raw, Hell, Yamoja on the other side. It, it seems like the Knights are really narrowing things down for this Radiance roster. Yeah, quick picks and bans, as expected for game number one. That's usually how it goes. And Cupid open, Guan Yu open. Those are the two picks that, that jump off the page right away to me. And as you highlighted, Cupid's been a huge pick for Radiance okay, during the course of the season. I expect wow. him to go Cupid top two, but top twoing the Scylla is something that I'm very, very surprised by. I mean, look, Paul looked really, really good on it yesterday. It's not a coincidence that in their three wins, PK picked Scylla three times, but you leave open the Aphrodite. Yeah, and I was going to say, I, I feel like that's going to be a guaranteed pick here for Paul. You already have such a healer advantage now with Guan Yu and Afro on your side. The sustain 
He's unmatchable from whatever Radiance can take from here. And throughout the rest of the weekend, Afro has been banned a lot by the Knights, not picked as much. So definitely something you have to be worried about. Now you have to factor in the healing, right? I mean, you look at Paul's Hell, and you look at this Yamoja ban, both of those come through oh God, because the sustain is some of the most ridiculous you can have to deal with. Raven, a little bit of self-heal, but Aphrodite, a good pocket, and Guan Yu, good for those late games. This afro Raven combo, though, at least that you expect to see in the mid lane, unless we're seeing something insane out of Neil and he's taking Afro's support, I think we can assume Paul running this. Is, is Raven for Kivo going to be a hand-in-hand -hand matchup? It is. It, that, that's the game plan, and, and I'm surprised that PK prioritizes the, the Robin. I thought they were going to go Sobek in that slot. Make sure that Aurora doesn't take it. It's not a pick that Aurora has played a ton of, but I'm sure it is somewhere in the god pool. Yeah, has to be. And, and you've got so many great dive options still for Fred that he plays that I think you could have found Fred a significant pocket pick anyways, but the big deal here for the Robin is my mind is number one, it's a takeaway <laughs> from adapting. And number two, it's better against the Scylla than something like the Kamazots is, which Kamazots really can struggle against that Sikkim. Robin has that overhead kick that he can use. He has that Mystic Rush. More options to that Scylla in the mid lane. And Radiant's taking a page out of E United's book, adapting, going the route of Scream, picking up this Bastet. It's a great amp to heal applicator. It's really easy to force out Undying Love. It's easy to capitalize on someone mistiming Undying Love. And dots are usually great against him one second immunities like that Aphrodite ultimate. So something like that Razor Whip can be really, really good, though. To be honest, Pounce is where the vast majority of Bastet's late game damage comes mm -hmm. from, and you can immune that pretty well. Uh, and being able to jump in and maybe stick to someone like Aphrodite is a big role as well. And you had mentioned Pounce as part of your damage. Even if you immune it, well, now all of a sudden this Bastet's on top of you. If you get the blink, you maybe can close that gap. I think it'll be interesting to watch how this plays, because again, I'm trying to go through, again, recent memories. Adapting's been playing the game a long time. I guarantee he has a Bastet. But recent memories, Bastet's not really on that list. I'm excited no. to see how this one can shake through. It looks like they're already reaching into their pockets to get some interesting pickups. Uh, Kepri Sobek being banned out. Interesting that Knights banned the Sobek away from Aurora as opposed to trying to get it for themselves. Agreed. But I think it's because they're maybe anticipating that next support pick being fourth for Radiance. Yeah, I wonder if PK... I think PK's likely to either ban Wukong or Cerberus. Those are the two bands that I think I would be mulling over if I'm the Pittsburgh Knights. You either want to take Aurora's God Pool out a little bit more, keep that anti-heal away from this from this Aphrodite, or take away Benji's premier pick. There's another Aurora selection in the Cabracken that you can take away that can also flex over to that solo lane. We've seen it a little bit in the past from players like Nika. I, I think the Cabracken is a pick that can give Aphrodite a lot of trouble with that ultimate, so it does make some sense, but Aurora and Mike are the two guys I think of when I think of support it, 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 Cerberus, but it ends up being the Ymir. Not a traditional Aurora pick this year, but fits his play style, yeah. doesn't it? I mean, aggressive, able to get in there and start the fights and split the fights off. I've got no problems with this with, with this Ymir pick. I mean, we've gotten to see it from PBM. We've seen it from Jake. Now seeing it from Aurora just feels like it fits in with that style, like you said. So perfect pickup for them, especially if that Cabracken comes through the Knights. Looking for their duo lane. And Zapman hovering over someone I believe we haven't gotten to see this tournament. A lot of Apollo, some Heimdall, that Cupid who has been prestigious. But this Jing Wei has not been locked in and many times, if at all. I'm trying to remember one if it has. was. And if it was, it would have been a few days ago. And yeah, you can see played two games, win rate zero. So I'm going to go ahead and say it was either maybe like Mind the Gap. We could have seen in Belt Slap in one of those first dates. It's been a long week to try and keep track of all of these just off the top of your head. Xing Chin locked in as well. Some of those wins that you see under his belt were SSG now eliminated. But Knights, I think, learning from their opposition. Yeah, PK played it once, I think, as well. I, I really like the Xing Chen pick. I would have preferred the Heim here for Zapman. That's been such a signature pick for him during the course of this year. And if you're looking for something that gets around Ymir wall, which is, I imagine, one of the big reasons why we see the Jing Wei here picking up that airstrike and that extra bit of safety, yeah. Haim just feels like he can do a little bit better, but maybe feeling like the Jing Wei can play more safe up against the Cupid than something like even Haim can. I think Radiance came away with a, with a very strong draft despite surprising me with that Scylla top two. I think they got a lot of things <laughs> that they really wanted. I mean, yeah, you get big man comfortable, whether it's stealing a pick away from Paul, I mean, using that kind of as a, a fourth ban against him, or you get yourself something that you're comfortable with. Either way, I think you're going to be happy. The Wukong coming through. Again, I'd mentioned this, but so far he has a 0% win rate. He's played a few games, but that's not the end-all be-all. How does this matchup fare against this Guan Yu? 
I imagine that it's pretty pretty volatile because if you don't put yourself in a position to get Tiger stunned in lane, that Talu Assault's going to get a full channel. Guan has really struggled through the early laning phases a lot of the time, but in some matchups, he starts to get that lead. I think that, that, that being able to heal up that poke is a really big deal and heal up your minions so you don't have to deal with that. But Scary has really made his name for himself, not in lane during these Smite World Championships, but on these early rotations. And Wukong's a god that can match early rotations really well with his really good, quick clear, and of course, being able to bird form through the jungle with that 72 transformations. Now, we're looking at this, again, a team in the Knights that are coming in off of a, a brilliant five-game turnaround yesterday. Radiant's coming in a little warm. This composition feels like, on paper, at the very beginning, you already know what you're going to be doing, right? Like, I'm looking for a warm-up game. Everything is pretty much carte blanche. Everything, you know what you're getting into. This Bastet doesn't necessarily scream that as loud as things like the Ymir and the Scylla. I mean, is this going to be a, an early game oriented adapting or is he looking for the late game potential? I think all of Radiance is looking for the late game potential. And I was going to say, I, I hope Finch and Mifflet are ready to talk a little bit because I think this is going to be <laughs> a longer set just in the, in the way of the play style of these two teams. PK clearly willing to go late game. I mean, they, they turn up the gas when necessary, but looking at all three of those games they won, against SSG yesterday, what, 54 56, minutes, yeah. 44 minutes, 56 or whatever it was. I mean, lengthy games, Radiance typically does the same, and this team composition looks to me like Radiance want to group up and use their very, very potent AOE damage in the midst of a team fight. Yeah, I mean, when you're able to get a win, two wins, I guess, an hour in, one win just shy, you're not – like, the first 30 minutes of a game does not scare you <laughs> if you are the Pittsburgh Knights. We talked about that mental tenacity. But alongside that, I mean, you're getting that performance from the Xingqin. You also have an Aphrodite and a Guan Yu. I mean, even with all the anti-heal in the world, that feels like it's going to be oppressive. It, it will be. And that late-game sustain is going to be a big deal. And that's why this Bastet, I think, is really good for that anti-heal application. Wukong could even get some anti-heal if he needs to in the form of something like a Contagion or a Pestilence or a Brawler's Beat Stick. We've seen Soul laners start to flex a little bit more damage into their builds. I think that PK is much more reliant on what Paul and Fred are going to do in that early mid game. You can turn up the gas pretty quickly with a blink back off damage into Robin damage. You'll be able to start insta-killing people one, two items into the game. Now, I hesitate to say this because we got to see late game Robin yesterday where it was phenomenal from Qvo because he had to be phenomenal at the end of that to make it work. But Robin, you know, we talk about him so much as this th level three oriented jungler. Like that's when he really starts to be able to get the ball rolling for his team. Bastet also has some pretty good damage early on, but is Qvo going to be able to take that damage and, and pour, force the Scylla into an uncomfortable position or maybe the duo lane? Is he going to look for early pressure? Or like you said, I mean, they're comfortable playing into the long game. Are they going to wait that distance? I think that PK is going to look to counter-engage a lot because that's usually what you want to do with Robin and Aphrodite or, or Aphrodite plus insert Blink jungler here is let your duo lane start to be aggressive. Assume the enemy jungler or the enemy mid laner is going to be rotating over and then pinch them on their way in. Blink in with the jungler and let that back off do the work for you. Well, can the reigning world champs continue their tear forward or can Radiance give adapting a third time lifting this hammer? Let's go down to Finch and Mifflin to find out. Go in the desk there, Core and Aggro. It's Finch and Mifflin as we move into game number one of PK up against Radiance. And Mif, for me, this is going to come down to how well Radiance can deal with all this sustain. Guan Yu and Aphrodite allowed through Afro and Paul's hands. I know there's some strong picks. Asil has been big this weekend. So have Cupid and Amir. But can they contest all that sustain? I think they can, Finch. I mean, we already had Aggro highlight how easily it's going to be applied anti heal from the Radiance draft. Benji with the Jinku Bang from downtown, always going to be able to apply a Brawler's Bead Stick. Adapting with a dot is going to be huge. That means that there's going to be a lot less healing for a long time if he's able to get those claws in there. But even Big Man Tings on this Scylla should have a pretty easy time applying that Divine Ruin. I like this from Aurora. Getting disruptive on PK's normal pathing. It does not stop them from securing. That's not even necessarily the point. You want to slow them down, give a Cyclone Spin a chance to get some of that farm going, then get off to a good start. He can oh, get aggressive up. exactly like this. There is the slow, and even without the kill, not a bad start. That man speeds already on cooldown. I'm sure he's counting his lucky stars that he decided to lock in Jingwei this time around. That <laughs> added layer of safety is going to be needed when Radiance is playing as aggressive as they are in this duo lane. Aurora on the Ymir, Cyclone Spin on Cupid. That's a 2013 kill lane if I've ever seen one. Where did Tangs take all that damage from? He's down to half HP. Might have happened here in lane. There's plenty of poke. 
maybe even end up taking some damage somewhere in the jungle. But hard to know. Either way, he'll have to play a bit safe in that middle lane. But you talked about it already, right? How the uh, how the anti application for Radiance should be available rather easily, and that should be enough for them to slow this down. But Agro hypothesized that this might be a bit of a slow game. PK played slow yesterday. Do you see that happening here again? I think it's up to Radiance to set the pace in this one. If they are able to find a lead, this could very easily end quickly. If Paul falls early, he's going to fall constantly throughout the duration of this match. It certainly can go late. It's something that PK flourishes in. They'll drag the game as long as they need it to go, right? <laughs> if it has to be 56 minutes for PK to win, PK is going to 56. And they'll do it happily, man. One of our most patient teams in the entire league. They've always been willing to fall back and play a bit of defense. This seems like that to another level where they've been capable of drawing these games out because SSG put them to the test time and time again, and PK were able to hold on. Unfortunately, that strong squad, we had to say goodbye to them. We are down to our final three teams. Ghost in the finals already, and then one of these joining them is adapting, takes some damage, trading with QFO Fred. No kill potential, but don't you feel like there's maybe some pressure on adapting to get a dub here in his final, potentially final season? Look, yeah, uh, of course there is. My <laughs> man wants the third <laughs> ring, right? Looking for the hat trick up in 2021, but even then, adapting right now, his entire job is not to set the pace. He doesn't have to keep up with Cubo Fred. He's scaling into the late game much better on this past set. I wouldn't be surprised. We already had it highlighted earlier. He's one of the more selfish junglers in the league. He's going to be playing for him. Expect him to be farming like an ADC. Right, right. In terms of the play style, right, in terms of what his goals are going to be in this game and adapting, going to be playing to make sure he's in a position that when this team needs to carry, he's there and ready to do it. And I got to think a lot of his job is going to be making sure that it's not just that Paul's not doing healing, but probably getting rid of Paul, pressuring him out of the fight, if not outright killing him. But now showing some presence for Scary D, who's pushed up a little bit in the lane. Adapting does not have ult. No one here does, but there's the slow, and there's the dash, and that should be it. With Scary D out of movement options, first blood of your second semifinal goes to Adapting. And he's called Adapt King for a reason. You're Kenneth right. Keeps the crown on his head and he keeps it warm. First blood for Radiance. And that's such a huge start for him. Scary D has been a star player for this PK roster yeah. all week. If you're able to put him on the back foot initially, we were already saying, Benji, this guy is one of the most consistent we got. I'm sure he'll bring it to him. But here's the counter game. Cubo Fred goes to left. And I don't think Aurora's got an option. He's put down. And Cubo Fred responds in kind. I think there's pressure on both of these junglers. They have historically battled throughout the history of Smite. And they're continuing it here today. Long time ago, we used to say Cubo Fred. Yeah, that's a adapting light, right? Adapting's yeah. little brother. And now he's trying to prove on the world stage that no longer does he live in his shadow. I love this play style from PK. They see the presence from Radiance on the right side of the map and respond in kind on the opposite duo lane now ahead for PK. I think worth noting, maybe not exactly equal, right? Obviously first blood a bit more, but a kill into the solo laner versus a kill into the support. I mean, you're leaning towards that pick in solo. You almost every single day of the week, but even then, take a peek at the gold. First blood bounty goes the way of Radiance, but still PK has the gold advantage across the board. Wow. They're farming incredibly well. It's a bit impressive, isn't it, from this Pittsburgh Knights team? And that's a big discussion, I think, in terms of who, which team came in hot, which team came in cold. We obviously know the answer. PK are warmed up, and Radiance playing for their first time on a stage like this in weeks. But is that going to necessarily impact the game? Maybe right at the start of this, it is a little bit in PK's favor. As they're warmed up, they know exactly where they're all going. They've done it so many times before. Might be Radiance getting back into the groove just a bit, or might be PK just coming in with a better game plan. It might be this time around, but PK... Warm hands can only bring you so far. Radiance has been the favorite almost the entire year in yep. this matchup. These guys coming in at the higher seed, second seed in the entire tournament. They're absolutely going to be the favorites, despite PK being the defending world champions in this one. But already, we're starting to see that slower pace that Agro highlighted earlier. It seems like both teams kind of contented, waiting it out for that mid-game around maybe 15 minutes to get around that Gold Fury. I think worth noting, there's going to be quite a bit of pressure on Big Man Tings in this set as well. And I think he's perfectly able to rise up to the challenge. He's played so well for this team. Still has been such a priority pick this weekend. It surprised me a bit how much he's been valued, but she's looked great. And Tings can make it work, but Neil's in trouble. Cyclone's been already using the ultimate. Neil Ma makes that with an ultimate of his own, so no harm, no foul. But that's two ultimates down for Radiance, just the one for PK. But as I was saying about Tings, I think he can more than handle rising up to this challenge. He really can. This guy has been a like a crouching tiger for the Radiance <laughs> draft, right? These guys have been really playing well but often you talk about the star studded roster you know cyclone spin hailed as one of the best in the world adapting obviously one of the best who have ever done it even aurora 
But Big Man Tings is a guy who came in at the beginning of the year and he needed to prove himself a little bit. And I think he's certainly done it, becoming a win condition consistently for this Radiance roster. He has. They've known now that they can afford to rely on this Big Man Tings player, man. And he's, he's really, it, it's tough to come into it. Not just these guys are all real good, but some personalities on this team as well. And Tings has, has really ingratiated himself in there well. And there's a lot of ch world champs in this in this lobby, just in general, right? I mean, obviously most of PK already won, just not Cuba, Fred, and then everyone except for Tings on this Radiant side. This is two squads that are very, very familiar with being in this exact position and can help bring up some of the ones that maybe haven't just yet. And I'm loving what we're seeing so far already. We're going back to farming. We're consistently trying to find advantage wherever we can. PK has been bringing the fight more to Radiance a little bit more so than Radiance has been in the return trying to find those opportunities to look for pressure. And it's because of this player you see on the screen right now. It's this Neil Ma. It's him on Jing Shen, constantly moving forward, trying to find the sky hook to facilitate some aggression. Well, let's talk a little bit then about some assignments. We had to wait, adapting. Maybe thinking about getting a bit aggressive. Does not get down there in time for any speed buff, but they are on time. Still away some harpies. Not that adapting and Tings work together on that. But to talk about assignments, who would you say is the priority target here on both these teams? Think obviously Paul for PK, and then whose job is it to try and mitigate them on that opposite side? In the early game, keep your eyes on adapting around these 3v3 fights. It's really going to be on him to try and shut down this Aphrodite, Paul, on the other side. But for PK, Huvo Fred is looking to shut down Big Mad Tings. This is a, a tale as old as time. Jungler is looking for mid laners. It's almost just a, a direct opposition there. And I expect to see PK likely have their soul laner rotate out a little bit earlier than Benji will. Scary D is a player that likes to get involved very early on in the match. Yeah. And as Guan Yu gets over to level 9, level 10, gets some defense under his belt, that cavalry charge is going to be one of the best engage tools on the map. Scary's been great at rotating out early. That's a great point to talk about. I mean, not just early, like, like very early in the game, but I mean sooner than what his opposition will do, getting over there and finding those impactful moments. A lot of the times he has to do it because his team has fallen behind, as Benji can't find the Tiger stun there, so he takes all the Talu assaults. Meanwhile, adapting, I think it's one. The other two go to PK, so still favorable for them as, as Radiant still try to be on time for continued invades. And this is going to be a really late when it looks like, as we thought, both of these teams approaching it rather patiently here in the early, but here's a grouping as all of PK push up try and get to the Harpers on the other side, but they get there a bit late. Yeah, Ymir is so good at locking down these small jungle corridors. You want to get aggressive, you're going to have to commit your leaps to get over that wall. So already, Radiance have been constantly looking to find pressure. And this is an interesting hold of the ultimate for Zatman here. Going to trade about 50% about of his HP bar, but he is going to maintain the airstrike as PK. They're looking at gold. What a great call here from the Knights. No one in position from Radiance to do a thing about this. Adapting on the right side. Information from Scary D and the Fury going over to the defending champs. And Scary might even live despite all the pressure on his side. I'm a monster, though. Absolutely flattens him for Big Man Tings. Big Man Tings with a big man plays. Heads up in the mid lane, catching him on that rotation. Good communication from Radiance to let him know which route Scary D's taking. But unfortunately for Radiance fans, that is always going to go the way of PK. That right. neutral objective is going to bolster that gold. Plus a couple of ultimates used, right? Adapting and Tings had to do it. Cyclone Spin used his to try and force Zap Man to overreact. And how about Zap? That guy is unwilling to overreact to anything. He will not give you that respect of dropping the relics, of overreacting. You have got to force them as once again, PK move up to try and strip away some hearts. That man absolutely stoic as a roar moves forward, finds the freeze. And Paul will be the target. He is so low on mana, but over the top comes Cubo Fred to back him up, but adapting has oh. the damage, and Paul has been removed quickly. Four members of Radiance are going to bear down on Cubo Fred, two for zero, and they might get one more off a nasty wall. A roar finds the freeze. Benji finds the kill. Two for the solo laner of Radiance, but what are they going to do with this lead? Scary D still alive. Cyclone's been one step. And Zapman barely makes it out of there, gets over the wall to the tier two tower, so he does survive. But what a fight from Radiance. If you want to talk about getting back what they lost on that Fury, they certainly just did it there. You guys want a PVE? Radiance came to PVP, <laughs> and now they're going to do that as well. Pyromancer getting aggressed on by Radiance. No one in range from PK except for Scary D. But he knows better. He can't step forward here. This is going to be a neutral objective that goes the way of Radiance absolutely for free. This team is so strong at exactly this, at team fighting early, at out-rotating you to these fights and catching you off guard. That was PK thinking they could push up in the jungle, but Radiance had more numbers. Radiance were ready. 
and they came in with the reaction. And look at this start from Aurora. This is a bit odd. It's the Magi's cloak in that second slot. Interesting. It means to me that he wants to play uber aggressive in yep. the early game. He doesn't want to get stopped by anything. Paul using Kiss to disengage. Good luck, bud. We got CC immunity coming through. And can peek at what Aurora's moving into for the next item. That can either be a Void Stone or a Stone of Binding. He's foregoing Aura defense items altogether. It looks to me, Radiance wants to end this early. It does seem as though they're investing a bit into this early. I was also wondering, because we know that this flat pen build has become so popular for these Scylla mids, if we see Divine Ruin prioritized early, but goes to the Spirit Desolation, almost certainly will be Divine Ruin in the second slot anyway. And to be fair, they killed Paul without it, right? So it seems to be the right call. Yeah, I like it. everything I'm seeing from Radiance right now, but with both neutral objectives removed from the map, this should be a time where both teams can go back to farming just passively, is what I'd like to say. But Aurora finds Neoma in the jungle, gets the freeze, but no fight afterward. And already, we're seeing that it's going to go back to neutral. They're going to go back to farming. Yep. And it's going to be about two minutes left on the Fury respawn. That's where Sparks are going to fly. They'll be taking a little bit of a breather now, as Radiance have proven that when they're there in numbers, they can win these fights handily. And Aurora making this Amir look great. I mean, there was a while where it was all Hercules. It's a red buff invade. And Aurora's here to force a bit of a reset. Neil Maul moves nice in. Wall. There's the Magi's Cloak to try and help out. Freeze lands, and they secure the red buff. Or does it end up going over to PK? No one's stepping in to claim it, so it must belong to the Order Side team. And maybe Radiance can get a kill after all as Neil Maul's low and adapting claims his life. Aurora is stuck behind the wall, so Cubo Fred claims his life. They make it one for one. That man forced to use the airstrike to escape the situation. I think it was Paul with the back off that was able to confirm uh. that red buff for his team. Well played, but it does come at a cost. Support for support here, and it's Radiance constantly looking for that aggression. Already, they're starting to group up. We thought Scary D was going to be the first one rotating out, but this time, it's Benji. Scary, on the other hand, trying to strip away whatever he can in the jungle. Well, Cyclones, but has the pressure in the duo. You can tell just by looking at these towers, has one low, and Zap takes some damage. In fact, the beads are down for Zap. That's a great opportunity, potentially a gank. You don't even necessarily need adapting. I mean, a roar could potentially cause problems for Zap all on his own with a little bit of backup from Cyclone. Yeah, and already, look at this. Cyclone spin, one level lead. A roar, one level lead. Two levels up in mid for wow. Big Man Tings. Radiance is controlling the map as far as XP goes, but there it is. Scary D punishing Benji for all these early rotations. Takes out that tower very early. That's the right call there from Scary. There's not much he can do once Benji's already made it over there to the other side of the fight and impact that battle. So instead, he just keeps up the pressure in his lane. That's the right call from him. But this is what you were talking about earlier. Fury respawning in about 15 seconds or so. And I think that's where we might see a bit more action. I mean, certainly Radiance will be willing to force a fight there. They should be looking to fight, but already PK's hit some very important power spikes. Paul's got the Lotus Crown online as well as the Kronos Pennant, so he's going to be healing often and supplying defense to his team. The front line of PK is going to be very strong. Another good wall. Magi's gives an opportunity to put the damage on the Neil, and that is the Undying Love. What a cooldown to have secured for Radiance. I don't know if they should do all that much backing up without that cooldown. Radiance should be at a good spot. But PK have the vision control. They got the oracles from themselves, so anything Radiance do, PK will be privy. Another good wall. Aurora's making it look so easy as Paul has to use both relics just to survive. Whirlwind of Rage and Steel brings oh. in Aurora. I'm a monster is there for backup. But in the background, Cubo Fred stomps adapting to try and get one up against the king. But Benji trades it back. It's jungle for mid laner. And now Benji in an awful position at the back of the fight. But he still has his ult. Yeah, Summer Salt Cloud is going to be forced out here, but what are ratings going to do with this time? Adapting's dead. Paul's dead. Neither team feeling confident, but Gold Fury's still available. It seems like we're going to let this one fizzle until both of them respawn, but I'd like to see Radiance try and push this lead. Paul being the healer for his team, that's such a huge loss. It really is. I mean, they did so much work. They got Paul's ultimate, they got Paul's life, both of his relics, and still felt like Radiance weren't comfortable pulling the trigger. Now, even when Paul makes it back and he has an ultimate available again, without beads or Aegis, it should still be much easier than normal to take care of this afro. Yeah, Radiance is going to have a huge advantage moving to this next engagement. I would be surprised if it's not around the gold tree, but we might see them also go for the Pyromancer, as it's just going to be a little bit easier going for them. And already, Neoma feeling the pressure. Aurora constantly finding these walls, these breezes in mid. Yeah. Neoma struggling to keep up. Those walls have been have been really wild, haven't they? I mean, Aurora's just finding the perfect ones, sometimes locking down two, forcing them to take inefficient pathing. It's been excellent from Aurora so far. I was saying earlier that we used to see him and Mike be the real difference makers on things like the Hercules, but doesn't this Amir do something similar? Maybe not the displacement, but it still lets you be aggressive in the early game. 
It's the early pressure as well as the frostbite passive with Hercules getting that recent nerf to his auto attacks. Ymir is the next best thing. He's going to be the guy who can solo just about anyone in lane. And that's where Aurora and players like Neil really thrive when they're able to act as these solo agents. But this is it. Radiant starting up the gold fury. PK has to respond. But even can they? 50 seconds on Paul's beads, even more on the Aegis. And so Radiance would love to force them into a bad battle, but some of them moving over towards left. Rather than moving into the actual Fire Giant pit, they've got Benji in mid, but now they have Aurora and Tings on the actual Fury itself. In come Adapting and Cyclone Spin to help, and Pittsburgh Knights a little bit slow to respond. They're kind of stuck in between Arcubo and Paul, but the Fury gets dropped. They look for the freeze instead. It's not there, so they go back to the Fury. Scary D takes a slow rotation path just now crossing over to mid. Radiance may have missed an opportunity here as Scary finally rejoins his team and Aurora's half. Nice little stun ends up landing. Scary D with the instant stun. Actually, do you like it there? I mean, how much potential do they have to really shut down Benji? I'd say just about zero. Maybe they're just looking to force him out or potentially force the ultimate. Sure. So Benji can't be this backline disruption factor that he has been. But instead, all they lose is that engagement factor for PK. Cavalry charge is going to be down for a very long time. The beads are back up for Paul, though, but not the Aegis yet. 15 more seconds, a little bit less than that now. So Radiance have kind of given PK time to get their big star, Paul, back into action, even without scaring these all. But there is the wall. Benji right there behind. This is all in, and Paul is the target. And he's already in some trouble. Benji the only one that's still with him. As it looks like Adapting had to back back up. So Benji on the Somersault Cloud, looking to heal, retreating back to the team. I'm a monster a little bit south of the target. Now Neomai able to make it out of that situation alive. And if the fight keeps going like this, DK is going to have the advantage. This Aphrodite is yeah. getting so much value from the healing. Yeah, Radiance maybe pulled the trigger just a tad late. DK have the primal down to half, and Neomai gets frozen at the top of the fight, gets low, and then comes the cat. But Scary D doing his work in the back line, has the horse back, and Cyclone Spin is the target. Has to use the Aegis and the Beads just to survive. But now Radiance can look for a repush, but adapting falls. A roar falls as well. What a fight from BK, though it does cost them Neil Ma. Divide and conquer strategy. Zapman alone in the back. Take the one you want up against Cyclone. And absolutely making it work. Benji's there too, but Zapman gets a double, and he's turning back the clock. Big work from PK here in this fight. He's but home. now Zapman found a way to fall. Kings is in some trouble as well. Overall, ends up being a four for two, and PK take that just about every time. Radiance keeps getting sucked into the pace that PK is trying to establish around yeah. these team fights. They need to be more decisive on when they go in. They need to take advantage when Scary D is not in the fight, when they don't have the healing to match what PK is able to bring. And unfortunately, an elongated fight, it's going to favor PK every time. Benji's here, and he what? does it, Benji! What a nutcase as he finds a way to steal away the primal with the cudgel. I mean, I saw him there. PK thought it was free, but not enough work on the confirm. Cannot believe it. Jinku Bang stealing the gold fury for Radiance, keeping them afloat. 1,000 gold in the lead. That changes the whole fight, fight doesn't that, it? That changes everything. Now, Radiance uh, effectively grandfather claws themselves on one <laughs> fight in there. PK cannot be feeling good about that one. But they still, it's just 1,000 gold. 20 minutes in, it's not really that much. But Pyromancer's still on the menu. PK have learned that they're able to take these fights in an even state. So I don't think they should be too concerned. They could still win. They absolutely can. They've been fighting very, very well so far. And Radiance, maybe the opportunities aren't quite as good as we think. I mean, we've got so much information, and Radiance don't quite have all the same. But it's created some opportunities for PK to move right back into this game and still cause problems as Kubo Fred and Scary threaten Benji. What they really would love to do here is get him to use the ultimate, strip that away from him. Meanwhile, Radiance take care of the Pyromancer, so Fury and Pyro go to Radiance. And now, Psycho's been getting aggressive, dropping the fields of love and forcing Scary D to use his own ultimate. Meanwhile, on the opposite side of the map, Zapman taking away the tier one tower. If no one rotates to stop him, he'll keep going for the tier two. It's gonna be big man things on the rotation and Scary D locked down by adapting. And another good wall. That should create the space, especially with the freeze to take care of the soul leader. But in comes Kubo, Fred for revenge after the fact. Now here's Tings and Benji trying to deal with Neil and Zapman over in left, but his job is done. He got two Whoa. as I'm a monster connects. How many has Tings just done raw? He's doing it all on his own. Jumps over the wall, doesn't care who's there. Neil Ma forced to use the whirlwind of Rage and Steel. And that's just to slow down Big Man Tings' aggression because over in right, they're going to oh. lose Aurora and adapting PK. They took down Space Station. They're looking great here up against Radiance. Maybe we underestimated this team. 
And Benji not willing to let it go for free, but Zatman much too quick. Might oh, be able to Mule, though. I like this. Benji looked like he was going aggressive, turned around. Not enough to get that kill either. So good work by PK to survive. But what a week from the Pittsburgh Knights so far. This game's not over. It's very, very close. But Radiance did so much right in the early, and PK just handled it well. Well, Radiance has been doing a good job of mitigating losses, Finch. It's still only a 1,000 gold lead, but it's going the way of the Chaos team. Radiance in a good position, transitioning themselves into the late game. But I have to favor this PK draft the longer this game goes. It's so hard to argue against an Aphrodite, especially yeah. when it's piloted by a guy like Paul. Cubo Fred absolutely making a tear on this Robin as well. Five and one, and he's only going to get stronger. What a first game here in this set. It has been back and forth already. If you thought we had another 3-0 lined up, then I'm not so sure. These teams are very evenly matched and battling over the pleasure of facing Ghost in the finals on the back end of this. They'll handle that one tomorrow. 5-1 and 2 for Cubo Fred, 4-0 and 4 for Benji. Man, both these teams have guys stepping up. But look at this grouping from Radiance again. Cyclone spin out rotating Zapman on the Jingwei. He should be able to fly in if Fire Giant becomes an issue. And it looks like the fight's starting now. They've been really willing to use Fields of Love on Scary D. That does get the ultimate out from Scary. But is that a favorable trade for Radiance, Fields of Love, for that Cavalry Charge? I think it is because Cavalry Charge being the sole engage tool is such a huge deal as Benji trades out a large portion of his health just to get a little bit of damage into the back line. PK moving forward and Radiance giving up the defensive positioning. It looks like they are going to fall back and PK can push in with all five members looking strong. They still don't have Relic for Cuba, Fred, no beads for Scary. Just about everything up for Radiance. Five seconds on the sprint, a little longer on Benji's blink. So if they take this fight, a lot of resources available for both teams. Freeze a bit off the mark. So maybe they can't engage, but there's a wall. Mule Maul isolated. Benji comes up for damage, but they're not going to hard commit. Mule Maul loses a ton of that health, but there's the healing already. He was 50% just two seconds ago. Now already back to full. PK making fantastic use of the sustain. Just got to be careful here. He's a little bit alone. Scary D doing the same thing, though, diving the mid-tier one. Both solo laners make it away. Largely okay, but only one team is going to run back to an Aphrodite. And only one team is going to be able to run back here. It's going to be PK and stepping a, a little bit further away. Guan Yu healing, not to be scoffed at. But nothing really comes of that elongated engagement. It's yeah. about a minute of dancing around the Pyromancer, and it just goes the way of Radiance easily. But now we're starting to move into the gold three. 20 seconds left until it respawns. Both teams should be there in numbers, and I think it's going to be very indicative of how the rest of this game is going to go. We're going to get a really good glimpse of these team fights. I think the one thing Radiance is getting out of all these prolonged engagements, though, is that Neil just cannot seem to find his farm, can he? He's at level 13 still. Aurora at level 16, comfortably three levels up. Once he's past 12, maybe not the biggest deal. He's got that second relic, and it's a phantom to let you know how pressured they are, are by Aurora at this point, but still, Aurora easily ahead of Neil at this point. He is, but he's still stacking up that Gauntlet of Thieves, not quite getting that defensive aura that Neil Ma is able to afford for his team. So for <laughs> now, I'd say PK might have a slight advantage in the team fight as long as they fight around their support. As long as they make sure they're enabling Neil, who's done so much for them throughout this week. Neil and Scary D, Paul, Cubo, and Zatman, all five of them have stepped up at various points. Meanwhile, Radiance, we still don't quite know what to expect. This is the first game we've had from them all week long, considering they had the bye being the second overall seed. But this goal fury being up, I mean, Miff, we're 24 minutes in, almost 25. Is this something worth having a big fight over, or does one team just end up taking it? With it just being a standard gold fury, I think it's okay to let this one go, but I know these guys, the mentality behind these players, and they're you generally going to be very privy to a fight here. It looks like Radiance is going to be able to move in a little bit more quickly, and it's a slow grouping from PK, burning very fast. Scary D finally on the scene. He's here alongside Neil Ma, but the fury has been reset. Still, Paw's not here, and Zapman... A bit further back as the wall locks in Neil Ma. Benji goes for the damage. Freeze, not on the mark. So Neil escapes the trouble well. Still, though, a bit back to neutral here in this fight over Fury. That man, the furthest one forward in that engagement, yeah. he walks up straight up and forces them to respect him. This is huge damage, but Radiance, it's still that trepidation. They find a little bit of poke, and then PK backs up and gets the healing. If they want to win these fights, they're going to have to commit at some point. These are such patient fights, aren't they? Neither team wanting to expose weakness to the other. All of them playing so carefully as Neil Maul will be the front member this time, taking a little bit of poke out on the other side from Cyclone Spin and then Odysseus Bow popping through 
But look at that. Pittsburgh Knights are healed right back up again. I don't know if Poke is the way for Radiance to win this. It really isn't. But it is the way for PK to win this. If right. they step up and just keep fighting these Skyhook into back off combos, that's a huge chunk of damage into Benji. And ADC is just trading autos on an immune gold fury. Not much happening. Another big wall. Neil Ma takes quite a bit of damage from Crush from the cats being thrown out as well. But still, no real commitment here from Radiance. They are waiting for someone on PK to overstep. But now, they're pushing up. Benji moves in first. Adap behind him is Adapting, who puts the damage in. But there's the Undying Love that keeps them alive. And in the back, Psychone's been in trouble as well. This time needs to work as Big Man Tings puts down Scary D. But it costs them Adapting as he ends up falling on the front line of this fight. I'm a monster. Nice jump. Does not get Neil Ma, who remains elusive. Crush does tickle him, though, as there's four up against four. And now now PK gonna be on the offensive, Cyclone's been caught in the pit and loses his life. What a play there from Cubo Fred moving in. PK don't have any trouble pulling the trigger and it's Aurora who's gonna end up hurt from it. Three for one in favor of PK. Look, you cannot stare down a team that has Aphrodite and Guan Yu for that long. It's gonna right? favor PK every single time. 20 seconds left on adapting. 40 seconds left on Aurora and Cyclone Spin. Healing coming through, let's get some fire. And the thing is, if it's just going to end up in the end, as you go in for a blink in dive with no big advantage anyway, then why not blink in and commit when those, in those scenarios when they had some advantage, when they forced some relics or some ultimates out? They waited until it was a purely neutral fight, and now PK are starting up fire. Tings and Benji are nearby, though. Take a peek at the relic usage. Aurora didn't even get that honk off. That, that engagement, the healing is unmitigated essentially, but Big Man Tings hovering around could look for the steal. Fire Giant's getting low. Oh, there's some pings. They know that Tings is here. He's been blocked out by the Whirlwind of Rage and Steel. So Benji, can he take another objective? No, PK, secure the first Fire Giant of this semifinal and take the lead over, over Radiance. Adapting, hovering around, seeing what he could do, but he gets spotted out by Scary D. Radiance, you get a Constellation Prize, Pyromancer for Fire Giant. PK is happy with it every single time. I don't know how many more games you got to watch from PK to not want to sit on your hands, man. I understand. You want to fight with an advantage. You don't want to leave up an opening. But PK apparently are the kings of this part of the game, right? They did it three times in a row to Space Station. And now here they are doing the same thing to Radiance, being patient, picking their spots, and punishing Radiance when they take an engagement where they don't have an advantage. But don't count Radiance out just yet. Sure, five members with Fire Giant on PK, but the defensive composition of Radiance is going to be really easy to utilize once the game simplifies on these tower defenses. Five people standing in front of you means that it's five easy targets to line up with a crush. Yeah. Or a, I'm a monster. These Aurora walls are going to only find more value, and he's going to be able to use them to make sure that these towers stay up a little bit longer. They don't have to put up a hard defense here, but that's exactly what I want to see from Aurora. Buy as much time as possible so this Fire Giant buff picks away. And with as little commitment as possible, doesn't cost Aurora much put a wall out there and contest that way. So now Radiant's showing a little presence on the Tier 2. They're only down 2k in real gold. Well, we all know how much the Fire Giant actually adds, if we want to be the honest. Yeah, 10,000 gold is what I like to equate Fire Giant to. Another <laughs> fantastic wall from Aurora there. Yeah, I appreciate it. Freeze off the mark. Scary D lives, but in the back line comes Neil Ma getting the beads out from Big Man Tings. So they will take the battle underneath the Tier 2 as he pushes out PK. But PK at fire, all the healing. They're happy with this type of engagement. They can come right back in. And they've got so much time to play with. Two and a half minutes left on this Fire Giant buff. Scary D, he's half health, what, just two seconds ago? One Aphrodite heal tops him right off. And look at this, PK, so disciplined. They don't want to risk it on the bird. Instead, clear out every single tower, expose the neck of Radiance so that the next push can succeed. Yeah, Pittsburgh Knights should be able to take the Phoenix but, uh, Tower, excuse me, but in comes Radiance to contest yet again. They put up a wall and keep PK at bay. They are willing to put up, at the very least, a soft defense on these Tier 2s and not make them free. But in comes the Pittsburgh Knights. The wall is there again to deny. So Zapman switches targets. But they know that Scary D is low. There's a Field of Love, and that lands on so Massive. many members. Neil Ma is low. I'm a monster, though, off the mark. But Neil Ma will still fall. Kibble Fred has been rooted. And in comes Adapting, looking to find a bit more. Aurora, I think, finally uses the Cursed Donk on the tail end, but doesn't get much out of it. Adapting Who's on the man? chase, that man all alone. Benji can't find him, the damage is there. But does he live the cause? Dot damage, take it through. Well, they, they know he's gonna heal off these camps. They gotta get in there quick. And the Aphrodite connects as well, so that man survives. And ends up being the old mom that falls, all of Radiance alive. But they did defend a Fire Giant team. Not bad, as you said, Radiance still have some life. Radiance, fantastic defense there, but they're not quite through it. Still a full entire minute of Fire Giant buff on four members. This gives PK the opportunity to group up around the gold tree as that respawns in a minute. 
force Radiance to respond somewhere on the map to the aggression that they have, but it's only 3,000 gold 31 minutes in. That's peanuts. That's literally nothing separating these two teams. The second that Fire Giant buff wears off, this game is dead even. Absolutely is. This game is so, so close. Miff, do you think Aurora's missing Blink? I mean, I know you want Sprint in this situation to deal with the slows, and you got to have the Cursed Donk upgraded, but doesn't it feel like he could use a better way to get into some of these fights? Look, the Heavenly was so good for that chase in particular, though, on the right side. He was able to give it to his entire team, and it resulted in a kill onto Neil Ma. Without it, sure, he could have blinked forward, potentially found a freeze, or maybe even a wall. But I think that playing around your team, playing as a unit, is really what's going to push Radiance over the edge. So I like this more team-oriented relic selection. Make sure you bring in the whole squad with him as PK set up around this next period. They'll get Oracle Vision as well. Meanwhile, Radiance don't seem to want to push up too far at this point. They push up that middle wave, and now they're taking some backs. It looks like Radiance maybe expecting themselves on defense. Though, of course, this Fury at this point, not a big deal. They'd much rather be ready for the fire in 45 seconds. But this Fury is going to allow PK to have a slight advantage on the fire. The Primal Fury making it much easier to confirm that objective. More damage to the Giant, less the damage to them. And Radiance, they show up. But that's a weird grouping, man. They do throw up one wall. That allows them to move up a bit more safely. There's a Crush and a Lovebirds thrown out as the Fury not really started or committed to by either team. Still no sprint for a war, only five seconds from that, but no relics for Zapman. If Radiance have that information, and they should, he's got to be their target. This is, I'm getting deja vu to the last Gold Fury fight. Radiance not looking for the confirmation. PK looking for as much poke as possible. It's always, always going to favor the healer here. Radiance have to make a decision. Do we want to fight or do we want to get ready for the Fire Giant? Because if they lose a fight here, it's almost giving away the Fire Giant or even potentially the game. PK trying to move forward when that freeze is down. That's a great opportunity for them as the wall disrupts them. Aurora trying to get the freeze without the wall because Neilma has been jumping on reaction to that wall and not getting frozen. He has been, or he's been just standing in front of the wall, forcing Aurora to step himself forward and then committing his body. Right. This time he's able to isolate Scary D, but he's able to make it out of there with the Warrior's Will incredibly well. But it's a, such a slow fight, it's such a patient engagement from both teams just waiting for the right opportunity to work their way into the back line. It's Aurora who lost his Magi's proc in that last little skirmish, still available for Neil Ma on his side of things. And Radiant's still struggling to figure out what their opportunity is to all in commit. And I agree, it's a tough task because they've got all these healers on the other side and, and they've kind of given them a point to get to their strongest moment of the match. So decent damage coming out in this poke though. Duck highlight on those Odysseus' bow. That's gonna bounce around throughout these team fights. The biggest advantage Radiance had coming into this Gold Fury dance was Zapman's relics. Right. Yeah, no longer. Zapman has beads and Aegis available to him. Every relic available to every member in the game. But the thing is, as they get that freeze off on the scary D, the big thing they're waiting for is not even that strong as Benji has to use the ultimate right away. It takes a ton of damage on the front side of that fight. Looks like there's not going to be much more commitment. He falls back to the team. But but that's kind of my point. Even when they got the mode they wanted for, they, they dropped the freeze on the scary. They don't even have the big burst potential on him. There's no way they kill scary D that quickly. Nice freeze on the scary again but he's already healed back up. Benji, on the other hand, has to heal up the old-fashioned way. Soul Leader on the wave, but he's almost out of mana at this point. Radiance running on fumes. Neoma starting to take some damage now on the tail end of this fight. That should get healed up, but there's Huge. a two-man freeze into the Fields of Love. And so Adapting commits on the back of it, has to leap back right away. So Kilbo Fred makes his dive, and Adapting gets absolutely dunked. I'm a monster, though. Lands on the Neo Maw, who's low in the back. But who can afford to chase? It's Radiance that ended up losing a member again. PK, get the back up. Scary D's done his job. Soaked up a ton of damage from Radiance. Yeah. And now, healing back, Primal Fury should go their way. Radiance got the Oracle, so they get to watch on his horror as the Gold Fury <laughs> goes the way of PK, making that subsequent fire giant that much easier. Adapting dead for 40. I don't think Radiance can step up here. I don't think they can either. Adapting is going to be gone for a while. They don't have the sprint there from Aurora. This is tough, man. That's twice in a row Radiance have insisted on this slower pace kind of engagement around PK. I mean, I'm not saying an all-in engagement is guaranteed to work either, but I think they got plenty of evidence now that the slow take isn't working either. It hasn't worked out for him just yet. Scary D so low, what? can't take that damage. He has ended up quite low. Maybe this is the opportunity Radiance saw coming as Scary D manages to just barely escape. Neil Maul low in the back too, but Cyclone Spin has the damage to get him low. Massive Meanwhile, Cubo Fred and Paul are trapped behind a wall. Tings gets the perfect double.
Big man Ting's not done with just two. Wants more. Forces Zap and into the air. Zap and Neil on the retreat side by side. And now Radiance healthy and grouped up around the fire. I don't understand. PK played so slowly all game long. And then all of a sudden, they take this all in commit. And, and lo and behold, it worked perfectly for Radiance. They get two kills. And now they start a fire. And no one from PK is contesting. So this fire giant is going to go to Radiance. What a curious. Two engagements back to back. Yeah, Scary D a little bit too confident in his defensive build. Just holds the W key straight into Psych Floats Man who says, well, okay, three auto attacks <laughs> for me. And he puts him down in the dirt, forcing him to retreat and puts the rest of PK on the back foot. Aurora finds a fantastic wall Perfect. and a four man onk to stop the healing of PK. And now the bird, it's going to go the way to Radiance. Hey man, listen, if this is the moment Radiance was waiting on an overcommit from PK exactly like that, and they're looking pretty wise right now, aren't they? I didn't Too think smart. it was coming. PK had been playing so patiently, but just an odd engagement. I mean, I understand, right? They don't want a 5v4 on that fire with Scylla on the other team. You don't feel like you can confirm freely. But I don't know if that was quite what they were looking for. At least force them back in. Force them to step into the fire giant right. pit itself. But instead, PK deliver himself. Scary D so fast on the horse. I mean, not everyone can just hop onto Epona and ride into the sunset. <laughs> he has to have his team behind him. He gets a little bit overzealous on that engagement. So now we get to talk about the reverse of what we talked about earlier. Radius's offense and PK's defense. This sustained draft is not quite as good. It's not a standard mage like Scylla. They're going to struggle keeping the waves out. They're going to struggle finding the damage output. And Radius has been struggling to sustain in every single team fight. Fire Giant gives you just that. Exactly right, kind of covers up one of those holes for them, so they'll secure some buff speed for adapting red for Tings as they push down the left side minion wave. First and foremost, they're going to have to take care of these tier 2 towers. It looks like for the most part they're planning on doing that all the way in left. No big surprise, that's the furthest lane away from FG. It is, and it's the only one that has a healthy tower as well. Radiance dotting their I's and crossing their T's as they work their way through the map. But this is PK at their strongest. This is where they thrive. It's these elongated 40-minute matches yep. back and forth. These guys are veterans when it comes to defending the base. Radiance are no strangers to long games either, but what have you done for me lately? This last week, <laughs> this has been PK's territory. So that's kind of where I'm leaning right now, at least until Radiance can prove us wrong. It's a 4-1 split for now. They've got Benji in mid. Everyone else is trying to push down the duo lane town. They've got two dealing with Benji, so with a bit of an advantage in left. But they cannot capitalize, and on his way over is Paul, trying to make sure he can cheat in between helping left and mid. We got a nice little micro view of how Radiance want to push in. They Big use work. the wall to separate the fight, creating space to hit the Phoenix, and he's just waiting. Aurora, that is, for the right opportunity to fully engage. Keep your eye on Aurora. He's got the most important ability on the map. That Onk is going to be what separates this fight from a loss and a win for Radiance. And Aurora just got that, that purification beads out from Zatman. That's a big deal. Trying to see if they can lock down him and make this match a little bit easier, though everyone else has their relics available. Aurora moves in, finds the freeze on Daniil, who takes a little bit of damage, but not all that much. But Fields of Love is committed. Everyone makes it out except Neil Ma. But they're not going to all in commit our Radiance. Meanwhile, Benji still drawing attention over towards mid, but Radiance haven't been able to capitalize as there's a bit of a push in from Neo Ma. Twice in a row now, Radiance have waited for the push, and how do they answer? Cyclone Spin is low, I'm a monster connected, but Kyuvo Fred has already taken one, Tings gets one in return. Scary D and Neo in trouble, Kyuvo falls, adapting, oh, it's over. Step. Big Man Tings ends Paul's life! That should be the game, Neo Ma, the last one standing. Twice in a row, Radiance waited for PK to overcommit, and twice in a row, PK PK obliged. I'm so surprised. This team normally, normally known for their patience, for being willing to wait, and they went right into Radiance's clutches. One mistake. That's all it took. One mistake. We thought they were going to get the Fire Giant. We thought we were going to be talking about their push. Radiance strips away hope and gives them despair in its place. Man, I, now i got to disagree, man. If Radiance want to wait, they can wait. If Radiance want to take it late, they sure can. They absolutely win game one and break the streak of PK. But we'll see what happens in game two after the break.
start out with a dull glow and then start shining bright by the end of the game. They find themselves up 1-0 here over the Knights after game number one. But again, before we start to break this one down, we want to see how you are enjoying these games and how you are enjoying watching these sets. Whether they're, you know, watching, I guess, that last one where Re Renegades unfortunately didn't quite get to climb up towards the top, or now this Knights Radiant set. And there you get to go, the halftime Renegades smite going ghost halfway through, really hoping Yo. for a turnaround. I, I got bad news for him. Yeah, not, not looking great there in that one for, for that ultimately, but they had a PS5. I got to get the hookup on that. I've been trying for months <laughs> in order to get one of those. Hit, hit me with the hookups, man. I need it. Well, there you go. You can see, even see chat interaction back there. Here's Mallory as well being, what, five years ago, stepped into the Cobb Energy Center for her first SWC. And there you get a nice doggo in her a dog shirt. Is the best. Being able to run that. Freshly adopted, if I remember correctly, yep. being able to come through. Been loving the dog picks that we've gotten to see out of that one. A lot of interesting ones to come through. And again, we want to see how you are watching. Hashtag SWC at home is the way to get featured on the broadcast. I know Katie just sent me one. I expect that we'll probably Probably see that one by the time things go down for us. Renegades taken down. Knights backs against the wall. Not quite yet, but going up one game here is not the end of the world. But this is something we saw earlier. Where you look at Ghost and the fact that they found their 3 0. The other team on everyone's mind that could do it is Radiance. This isn't necessarily the way you want to start it off here. No, but look. If I'm Radiance, number one, I'm throwing game two. I, I, in no circumstance am I going up against PK 2-0 in a, in a set that matters. Miss me with that. I'm having my worst picks and bans of all time going into game two, and I go, oh, unlucky that we ended up getting a bad draft. In all seriousness, Radiance really just came back in this game, I thought, through a series of individual plays. Yeah. Really, th this play by Benji sealing away the, the Primal Fury was absolutely huge. It just kept momentum away from building for the Pittsburgh Knights. PK played these fights so, so well and so slowly centered around this Aphrodite. But ultimately, Rainier just made too many plays. How many times did we see Cyclone come away with a huge Fields of Love or, or a big Heart Bomb stun? Big Man played out of his mind on this Scylla. Might be time to think about Scylla being just a premier mage right now and not just one of those pocket picks for some other people. Incredible stuff from Benji and for Big Man in particular, but really everybody on Radiance. Aurora was finding great walls. Adapting was getting his damage off. Cyclone Jeez. was getting his damage off. It really impressive stuff from everybody on Radiance on an individual level. I mean, what is that? 6 1 and 8. 5 0 oh, and 10 for Benji, but the 6 1 and 8 picked up for Big Man Tings. Adapting going 5 5 and 9. Just keeping things net neutral for him after all the talk we had about him in the halftime show and going into the, the pregame for this. I like that. He had a Jeez, little bit dude. more of a quiet game damage. because of the damage numbers coming out from everyone. What is that? There's three players in the 30,000 Aurora not even able to break the five digits, but it didn't need to because the rest of them were able to carry up there. Big Man Tings, though, it was specifically that crush at 35 minutes that, that really kind of swung things. Because that was back and forth. I mean, every time Knights got a pick, Radiance got a pick. You get two kills, they get two kills. It felt back and forth up until that final Scylla crush. And that right before that was when PK decided to take an odd fight where they chased into the jungle. Scary D hops up on the horse, tries to get an engagement going, and Cyclone just slams him for all of his HP, makes him turn back around. 
PK, I think, got a, got a little bit too aggressive at times, centered around this healing, using it to stay in fights that maybe they should have just taken the win and, and gotten out. They had gotten a fury at that point, won yeah. the fight, and then they went straight to fire in a five-on-four and then try to take the fight instead of just doing the objective anyways because they knew that Scylla was going to be around. Well, that was more akin, again, if we're drawing parallels to yesterday, to what I would argue was game two up against SSG. Because yeah. game number one, uh, they just got waxed. I mean, there's no way to... Like, you watch the first game in that set, it shouldn't go five. <laughs> he got absolutely no. rolled over. But this time around, they're making sure to keep up with this Radiant squad. Unfortunately, a couple of uh, misplays there at the end is really what loses it for them. Still 40 minutes to make sure that it takes the win there. Radiance, again, I'm frightened to win this, if I'm being honest Me with too. you. I don't want to be up 2-0 against the Knights. I'm quaking in my shoes already, and I'm not even playing. It is the Emoja ban first for Radiance, but on the other side, this Ra, the Cupid coming through as well. After all those fields of love, it makes sense. I agree. I think that was problematic. I mean, obviously, you look at what Benji was able to do at 5-0-10, big man at 6-1. and one. Those two were absolutely huge, but I think the Cupid was a real problem point for the Pittsburgh Knights, and wow, they decide to ban the Scylla as well, and then they stick with the Guan Yu as the top pick, which is interesting to me. I mean, you got a lot of things that are that are left open. Cullen was one of their bands last game. Radiant's gonna come through and take that right away with knowing how, what Scary D has done with that on the past, but he already has his Guan Yu, and there's the Apollo pick for Radiance. Clearly uh, seeing what other players have done with that pick the rest of this tournament. This time, giving it over to Cyclone Spin. I'm excited to see what Cyclone can do with this. I don't know. Again, there's been smatterings well, of Apollo for him in history, but it's not something that you get to see often this year. Plus, it is worth noting that the first guy in NA to really start slamming Apollo jungle in the queues was Kennet. It was yeah, adapting. I don't think we're going to see Apollo jungle here. But, but it you could never happen. Know. It <laughs> could happen. We'll have to watch the rest of the draft to figure out where that Apollo's going. Uh, we're, what, maybe like 80, 20, 90, 10, 95, 5? 95, 5. 95, 5. Split that. Saying. It's going to go over there to Cyclone Spin. Ymir Aphrodite picked up here for the Knights, though. We had mentioned this Ymir last game and how it fits so well for Aurora. Was been kind to everybody. I mean, wrong you the first day Sangwon played with it was really solid against Obey. It has been the strong pick, even though it didn't quite work out there for the Renegades in that set earlier. Alongside an Aphrodite and a Guan Yu, it feels like he should have a pretty good time. I agree. I think that's certainly a possibility here for Neil Ma. This fits their play style of taking these slow team fights. You, especially with the changes to Ymir Wall, it really incentivizes you to, to step up a little bit. Ooh, can I wall that guy? Throw it up? No, no. Bring it down. Just And, and reset that cooldown and just keep throwing those walls consistently. Yeah. If PK is going to play that same style they did in game one, which by this Aphrodite pick, it seems like they will, that really is, is a great way to use that Ymir and abuse it in these objective fights. Well, Discordia locked in on the other side. Some jungle bands starting to come through as well. Ratatosker taken away. Someone that... I thought was only going to be a big pick for the Renegades. Ends up being a big pick for Fine OK, and now is a ban even against the Knights. So something you have to pay attention to as time moves on for the rest of the tournament. Kabraken once again banned away. They don't want Aurora to feel comfortable. The Ymir pick, what was the last time we saw some mm. Kepri bans up there? I mean, it feels like the Knights really want to stifle that duo lane as much as possible. And with how well Aurora and Cyclone played in that game, I think that makes a ton of sense. Uh, I'm looking at Kamazots as the pick now for Fred with this Ratatosker and the Pele ban. A little surprised that we don't see the Kamazots in particular because I think that's looked like Fred's best god potentially so far in this tournament, though the Robin is, has been a huge factor for him, no doubt, on top of that. No, uh, no support bans that have leaps. I'm looking at that Xing Chen as a potential here for Radiance because, like I said, I think that PK's engagement based on what we're seeing so far with their draft and based on what Aphrodite has done for them in the past is going to be fishing for good wall-offs with this Ymir. And so far, the only one you'd be able to wall off effectively is Apollo. And Cyclone's not going to put himself in a position where he's going to get walled to start a team <laughs> fight. That's just not realistic. I think I would have looked to ban away some gods like Xing Chen that could have potentially given you more problems in the support role because walling off a roar seems like one of the easiest initiations you can have. I'm trying to control it. Camazot's being hovered here. I was going to ask about the set, something that's been banned a whole ton. Made it through this time around. Neither jungler going to be opting for that one. Bastet locked in, timed two. 
here for adapting Kamazots. And now Hachiman coming through for the Knights. Now we've seen a lot of varieties. That man had a, a really stellar game on that Jingwei uh, and what we got to see, a lot of good double kills and things like that. Why switch over to the Hachi of all things? I think it's just a god that really pushes leads well and can be aggressive into someone like Apollo who, uh, you know, still has a, has his faster dash now than he used to, but can still have trouble getting people off of him, yeah. even with the use of that dash. I th I'm surprised to not see the Heim because that was such a, a, a Big clear, yeah. consistent pick for, for Zapman during the course of the regular season. But seems like PK may have moved away a little bit from that pick just based on these last two drafts going Jing and Hachiman when Heimdall was open. Well, you had some clairvoyance. Again, I think, what was it said yesterday? Finch might have called it the dollar store clairvoyance. Maybe that was Mifflin. I can't remember. As the You get the right choice. It just didn't come at the time you thought. You were mentioning the Cerberus in Picks and Bands for Game 1, yeah. or as Vinny wanted to call it, Pickles and Buns for, oh, yeah. here for Shout Game out to 2. Vinny, I guess. As it comes through. We have to. He's been doing a lot of good work here. <laughs> yes. Cerberus coming through against the Guan Yu and the Aphrodite, and on top of that, it's a roar. And I love it for him because it's a leap, and that's the big thing you have to worry about with this Ymir comp. I think that this Ymir brings a lot. It's not just about the wall. It's not like he's only a wall. That's all he's going to bring to the team composition. But it's kind of a big percentage of why you're picking the Ymir, right? I mean, what's the change that brought him into viability? It was being able to bring down that wall and reset the cooldown right away and a bunch of other balance changes. But I think that was the really big one. And now... The fact that you can put it up over walls is another big change for him. I think that this wall is not going to be as effective as you'd like up against Radiance's composition, and that's a big deal because you picked it so early, which is typical these days, but then you didn't ban the supports that normally your roar would be picking, which I think would be Cerberus and Ching Chen that would really be able to ignore that wall. And it's not like Cerberus is a bad pick against the rest of what Radiance has. You're going to love having that anti-heal against the yeah. Guan, the Afro, and the Kamazots. Plus, I mean, that nice big AoE ultimate in team fights. it feels like it's just going to fit them really well. And when you're looking at it, like, yes, everyone has a way out of it using their ultimate, but good, you're committing your ultimate. I mean, unless Ymir also has to, like, preemptively decide that as well. So there's a lot of play, I think, for Radiance to wiggle around with now that they have that Cerberus coming through. Bastet seemed to have a pretty good game, but otherwise, changing things up, this Discordia I want to zone in on. Mid laner, you should know more about it, but also Big Man, this was one of the big picks for him throughout the year, it feels like, that he's been going back to. Yeah, I wish I would have seen the win rate for this Discordia, because we've seen her a lot more than I expected to coming into this tournament. Yeah. We've seen a lot of Disco, and I think it's mostly centered around that passive, just being able to give your side lanes that passive to give them that extra power, gives them that potential to out-trade and, and potentially invade around being stronger in the early stages of the game. You're going to be looking to give this to someone like Cyclone Spin and let his team, let his lane fight be better than it already normally is on something like the Apollo. All right, this, this is going to completely break face, but you know how we have Afro Dighty as a mm -hmm. skin? How do we not have a disco-oriented skin for, for Discordia? Or am I just missing out and not paying attention to Discordia? Oh, Maybe I don't... need to go grinder. That just feels like it's a free knockout of the park. She has so many go good ones already, man. Skin team that comes through. I mean, look at these lineups. Apollo may be getting hurt a little early on by this duo lane, but I feel like Apollo Cerberus over Hachiman Ymir is going to be able to control at least the first few levels. I mean, you've got really good all-in potential with a Cerberus Apollo. You dash in off of a Cerberus stun, you're going to be doing a ton of damage right up top. But at the same time, Ymir and Hachiman have really good all-in potential as well. Hachi known for dashing aggressively a lot like Apollo can be. It's just a matter of if you're going to be able to land that stun effectively for Neil Ma, or is that whole ghastly breath channel going to go off on top of you, that prot tread coming from the Cerberus. It can be a very, pretty volatile lane over there, especially if junglers start showing up. It's going to be an interesting one. Those junglers making the biggest difference. This Kamazots has been treating Kyuvo Fred really well. You never want to go up 2-0 against the Knights, but maybe Radiance will find themselves there. Let's find out in game two. Aggro on the desk. Still Finch and Myth here as we move into game number two between PK and Radiance. In that game one, Myth, somehow Radiance being patient was able to outweigh that late game sustained composition in game one. Can they do it here again in game two with a different look? Serb now instead of the Amir for Aurora. I'm just surprised that they were willing to allow PK to have the exact same sustained composition, right? Who wants to play against Guan Yu and Aphrodite twice in a row? Should be no one. Right? Yeah, <laughs> uh, and I guess Radiance is just built different, I guess. They've got a different <laughs> mentality coming to this one. But they do have some new tools, as you already highlighted, that Cerberus will be able to deal with a little bit of that healing, that anti-heal, as well as additional sustain for himself from the passive once he's around Paul, once he's around Scary D as well. 
but I think it's going to be pretty different this time around with Big Man Tings on Discordia. That's a lot less burst potential than Scylla brings. It is, right? So they're not going to have maybe quite the same ability to blow someone up as quickly as before. But Cyclone Spin now on this Apollo, which has just become a meta pick right alongside this Scylla here this week, hasn't it? It's in his hands. They picked it early as if to flex maybe that it could be going into the jungle, but adapting picks the best deck quite quickly. We have seen Apollo ADC be dominant this weekend. I think Psycho Spin's not going to be afraid to rotate out. I don't think he will be, but it's an interesting matchup. Usually when we see the Apollo, it's matched with the Ymir in lane, so you can get that double whammy of early aggression. But now, up against Neil Ma, I think it might be able to stymie a little bit of that early aggression that Psycho and Spin would have likely had liked to have exerted onto PK. We're not going to be the same for them to start this game out in that duel lane. In fact, the Amir in Neil Ma's hands this time, and the Hachiman, which you have not seen a whole lot of throughout this week either. It's been a lot of the Jingwei, the Heimdall, the Apollo, maybe even some of the Rom getting picked up in that spot as well. Certainly the Cupid has been a popular pick there. Do you like this Hachiman then for Zapman? I mean, you heard them talk about it on the desk. It gives you box potential for sure. It does, but often when you're playing Hachiman, you're forced into using your ultimate defensively in these late game team fights. And it's so hard to pick the location. Do I ult towards my team? Well, I really can't. There's four enemies between myself and the team. So Zapman might find himself in a position come late game where he's almost single-handedly isolating himself if he is going to be the target of the aggression, of the dive that Radiance is bringing. And I'm sure he certainly will be when adapting Benji and Cyclone Spin are hovering around. It's going to be him and Paul who are constantly the target. Adapting showed it last game. He is very willing to dive one of these ADCs, Vinci as well. So eventually that becomes harder and harder to pull off as the freeze off to the mark over in duo. No harm though, and no foul. Looks like a bit of a back gonna be taken now from adapting. He'll come out and grab speed perfectly. Meanwhile, QO Fred already took his, so he is vibing there already. If I think it might be in for a very similarly paced game as what we got back in game number one is Neil does quite a bit of damage to Aurora. He does. I'm surprised Zapman doesn't try and rotate over there. The dash stun might have resulted in a kill, or at least forcing a relic off of a roar. The blink, not really the best defensive relic in a situation like that. I think that, if anything, Radiants have learned that we don't want this game going late. They saw the, the potential of the sustained draft <laughs> that PK got. It was, what, four lost team fights that PK was able to strip away around the gold tree before they eventually made one minor misplay around Fire Giant that essentially costed them the game. Yeah. I don't think Rainy's is going to be willing to put themselves in a position like that again. I'd hope they wouldn't, right? I mean, but it seemed as though they were okay with it last game. I mean, at least now they have that data to look back on, as you already confirmed for him. So we'll see if there's going to be an approach. Is this a bit more suited to be aggressive than what we saw last game? I mean, they had plenty of opportunities to be a bit more aggressive, but they chose that slower pace. Does this draft more suited to that? I think it is more suited in certain locations. If Adapting wants to get involved over in the soul lane, Benji is going to be very aggressive over there. The anti-heal into the Guan Yu as well, going to make up some of that. I think that if they want to play around Big Man Tings throughout the early game, Stripe is going to be a fantastic just set-up tool. Just root them there, and then eventually Adapting's dot damage should be able to put someone into the dirt. And you've also got Cyclone Spin on this Apollo who can rotate out a lane at a moment's notice. Right. My man hops into the chariot. No longer is it a 3v3, it's a 4v3. They always should have that numbers advantage, you would think. So that's their big advantage now, right? Is this Discordia passive kind of being passed around, whoever has the top damage, Apollo being able to show up in these fights and potentially some, some bleed or dot damage kind of chewing through some of that sustain. But obviously PK's big advantage is going to be the late game as what we thought was going to be last game until Radiance found a way to overcome it, playing around this Afro and this Guan. And now Neil on this Amir can set up for the team even better than before, right? I mean, we saw how powerful those freezes were, but Cubo Fred rotating over to Solo. Can they gank with Scary so low? The answer is yes, there's the ultimate. Wait, Scary wait. just going to kill him instead. That was the fear, and Benji went for it. Yeah, Cubo, bring as many boys as you want. Benji, my first blood, but it will cost him his life. It takes three people in his lane to get a kill, and they couldn't even do it in a timely manner. Yeah, don't bring just two over here to Benji's lane as he finds the kill. But that was my fear from the beginning. I can't believe how willing Scary was to be aggressive there. Maybe if they get the stun right away, he has the, he has the call. But now Neil being aggressed on adapting 
looping around behind him. So there's the blink, and now the Abra 3 to go for the support on the, the other stun. side. They get the stun, but the wall was good to buy them time, and I think Neil got himself out of there. Yuvo shows face, and it's just enough to create space there. Wow. Adapting a little bit trepidatious around yeah, that engagement. He, committed more. <laughs> he just jumps out. He's done. He said, all right, well, the kill should likely come through. Unfortunately, it does not. And uh, luckily for Neil, he gets out of that one with by the skin of his teeth. Now, PK in a decent position. One level up in the support role. Mid laners back to farming evenly. And even Benji picking up first blood for himself. All it really amounts to is a little bit of extra defense on first back. Right, I mean, it's still a little bit of a gold lead for Pittsburgh Knights. Certainly nothing really even worth talking about. I think the only reason I bring it up is that you'd expect with the first gold bounty going Radiance's way that maybe they'd be out in front, but they're not really at all. So PK doing a great job of farming evenly with Radiant in the early game and then sending themselves up with this sustained centric composition for a good late game. They just hopefully can't give it away they did in game one. Because I think it's a bit more of PK giving it away than Radiant's taking it. It was just that one play around the Fire Giant. Scary D stepping a little bit too far just forward. Radiant's able to turn it around there. This time, though, PK, they've got the theory behind it, right? They know. They've tested it. It's peer reviewed. It can work because <laughs> they won five back to back fights around the Gold Tree. They just got to be able to hold on to it for a little bit longer. That's the blink from Benji, followed up by the ultimate, but it does not net him more then some poke damage, no overreaction from PK on that one at all. But haven't you noticed that's been a bit of a trend this set? Despite how often Scary D usually rotates, Benji has gotten to a couple of fights first. Yeah, it feels like Radiants are really trying to bring the fight to PK throughout the early game. They don't want to get to that point where sustain is the name of the game, but unfortunately they haven't been able to find their footing in a way to put PK on the back foot every single time. PK has been able to answer the aggression of Radiance be it through rotating someone else over to the lane to get a return kill, or going to the opposite side of the map and putting pressure there. Every single time, PK has been able to stay afloat. PK's done a great job all week of kind of holding on. It's what worked for them in S against SSG. And now how here they are in a situation where they're already getting to the late game in game one. It didn't quite go their way, but we saw them bounce back from a deficit before as PK get to the blue buff ahead of Radiance. And they should have an easy time burning that one down didn't pick it up if they did take it away, but you've got to imagine that went to the Knights. Yeah, Benji would have picked it up absolutely yeah, if sure. it were going his way. PK, strip away the blue. I get to say it one more time. One invade makes not for a lead. It's what you do with the timer. You've got to be constantly there. Force Radiance to respect your invade. Take a fight to him right there. But PK, with this heel-centric draft, waiting for the late game, I don't really think they have to. They could just wait it out. Adapting, trying for a solo invade on the red buff. And Neil Mon Paul round the corner in time to slow that down. So Radiance, it's, it's things like that, where despite first blood, they're kind of losing at least a little bit here in this early game. These buff invades, some failed attempts from adapting as well to make them work. Then she made a hero play earlier to get first blood despite the kink. And that's about the only thing that's worked for Radiance is Aurora. Take some poke here in mid. Look, if you need Benji to make hero plays, this is the guy who's going to do it every Not a bad single strat, right? time. <laughs> As Scary D on the receiving end. Hop on Epona, get on out. Benji's showing you what you can do with three members in your lane in the 1v1. I'm sure he's more than comfortable. Benji did a great job there. Not even really willing really to heavily commit on the back of it. Just force out that ultimate for Scary and leave. It's not the easiest gank in the world, even with a little bit of backup from adapting there. But without that ultimate, it does become more feasible. So maybe they'll look for another gank on that side. Or maybe, with some pressure, Benji might just rotate out. But this has, similarly to the previous game, slowed down the pace just a little bit. There's been some attempts for, from, for invades, from steals. But for the most part, we are not going to see a whole lot of action from these two teams. They are content to play this one for the late. If memory serves, it was around the 14-minute mark where both teams started to group up around the Gold Fury, the Pyromancers, see where they could take away these neutral objectives. And that's what I'm expecting to see this time around as well. Until then, it's going to be about who's itemize, itemizing properly for these mid-game fights. Who's rotating into these neutral objectives a little bit earlier? Who's stepping too far forward? It's Neil. Yeah, we have our answer on that one. Aurora finds the second kill of the game for Radiance. And it's a small 5v4 advantage for Radiance, but there's just not enough for them to do, really. They get these mid harpies on the right side, but where really else can they go with this small numbers advantage? Certainly you're not bummed you got the kill. It's not super easy for them to turn that into a lot more. Cyclone Spin actually used his ultimate there, trying to rotate in the mid if he was needed. Fortunately for him, the kill goes their way a little bit too quickly, dumps onto the back camps, and then immediately goes back to base. Had he not used the ultimate, 
they could have potentially gone to the gold here, but because Cyclone no longer has it available, they just have to go ahead and fizzle it back out. But I'm sure Radiant's absolutely happy, able to find a pick for themselves and get the gold lead back, even though it is pretty paltry. He moves that one back into their favor. So now Benji with his lead and solo can get aggressive. He wants to walk right towards Scary, but that dash so strong slows Benji and really denies any bully potential he might have had. But Benji not going to find much. Looking over towards mid, nothing's there. So he ends up heading back. So you can look at this itemization though in the mid. Earlier, we saw Big Man Tinks on Scylla kind of delay that Divine Ruin a, bi a bit in favor of the Spirit Desolation, but on Discordia, it's a different story. He goes right into that Divine Ruin ASAP. Yeah, I think it's really because Scylla gets a lot more off the passive from Sierra's death, so his Cyclone Spin in a little bit of trouble. Zapman stepping up. I like that Cyclone Spin threw off the freeze timing by Neil by walking in, getting the mess, and then just walking back out. Never gets any pressure, doesn't have to worry at all. And showing what Apollo can do, clearly, this isn't something that Cyclone Spin just picked up because it's meta. He knows it as adapting has to run from the three-man rotation. Yeah, Cyclone Spin, no stranger to playing Apollo on the world stage. This guy has got a storied career. He's been around for a long time. Apollo's come in, out, and back into the meta many times, and Cyclone Spin's been behind the wheel of it plenty times as well. I'm sure he's got that down pat. He looking comfortable, isn't he? Cyclone Spin doing a little bit of de-warding on his side of the map as Neil and Zapper getting aggressive. There's the wall, a two-man freeze from Neil into the Heavenly Banner, but the dash gets him nothing, and Cyclone Spin has to run the other way, but the rotation is here. No chance for Cyclone Spin to live with four members in left. And four members in left gets them in the perfect position to group up around the gold tree. It's just a roar in range for the defense, and Neil Ma playing goalie, you can't step up. No, this belongs to the Pittsburgh Knights. A roar in some trouble, not gonna fall but does get pressured out. What a sequence there from the Knights to step up to find the perfect freeze from Neil. And now even looking for a red buff invade on the back side of it. And more than looking for securing it because adapting and Tings cannot step up. That's a great play from left to goal to red. And on a team comp that we already expected would be flourishing in the late game, PK. Right, they've been the aggressive start. They've been looking for it everywhere on the map. Now Radiance gonna have to do something to get that lead back in their favor. It looks like adapting to steal away some back camps, so that's not going to be enough. Well, not by itself, but it can be the start of something to take what they can. Scary D looking for a skirmish, but that thing's on the way. But there are way nice more blank. members of the Knights here than Radiance. So Radiance disengage, get out of there safely, and everyone goes back to their own. But I'm a bit surprised here. PK kind of hedging their bets, being competitive in the early and knowing that they've got the sustain for the late. Yeah, it's very interesting. It's just... It shows how adaptable this team is. They find an opportunity, they take it. I'm sure the strategy coming is, okay, if this game goes to 30, we're favored, let's just not throw this time around. But they're still the competitor at heart. They know, okay, well, this is a good opportunity, let's take it anyway. And it opens up the doors, making that transition into the mid game, into the late game, that much smoother. But despite Gold Fury going their way, despite them being even in kills, it's still a very even match. Only about 500 gold separating these two teams 13 minutes in. Yeah, no big separation at all, huh, at this point. I mean, maybe some inexperience. Benji still has his lead. That man's gained him a lead off that sequence as well. And even a little bit of a lead for Neil Ma and the support. For the most part, things are even aside from those. But a pretty comfortable spot. But Pyromancer going down for the Knights. On his way is Benji. He's stolen one before. But not this time. PK getting out, pinching an awful spot. He will transform. He'll even look to fight. Gets the Undying Love out from Paul and spreads out more damage. Benji using the Kakulan to the fullest. And still, Paul hasn't attached anyone. Scary D isolated. Still has the ultimate available, so he shouldn't be in too much trouble here. Wow. Have to use that one defensively. Benji forced out two ultimates. There's the Stitching in Torment, and it collects Neil Maul, brings him back towards the squad. They don't get much out of that Apple ultimate from Big Man Tings, but KFO Fred puts out the damage. Not enough to get the kill into adapting. But in goes Cyclone Spin, doesn't find much more. They'll at least take the tier one tower. But that man on the opposite side, good eyes, Doug, finds the red buff, steals it away. But what else can he do? This is a big grouping from Radiant to the opposite side of the map. He might be able to strip away a tier one tower, but Cyclone Spin already back to base, starting to rotate over. Clearly Benji comfortable, though, on that Kakulan. Does Benji have a skin that he's earned for that one? Yeah, it's yes, the sir. United skin. So certainly that one belonging to Benji. Comfortable on this pick and absolutely making it work in that last fight. I mean, he, unable to steal the, the Pyromancer on his own, forced out several ultimates in reaction for BK, and now that man, as you covered, taking the Tier 1 easily. My man Cyclone Spin took the scenic route back to lane. He stopped <laughs> to enjoy the views. It's the last look you're going to get that it's the Season 7 map. 
So I guess he's soaking it up <laughs> this time around, though. Zapman, absolutely happy with how that one goes. He picks up the tier one tower. And a, a, a Cyclone Spin wastes the ultimate onto the right side. Doesn't really get much off of that either. PK in a very good spot. Enjoying about a 1,000 gold lead. Really not that big a deal 15 minutes into the game. But I think it is a bit indicative of how this early game has gone for PK. Despite maybe that gank attempt on Benji not completely working out, they have not slowed down their aggression since then. They've done a great job of looking wherever they can to put some pressure onto this Radiance team. Other than that, though, it's still pretty even. Radiance found a way to win despite it last game, right? Even against all the sustain. So I'm not betting against them. But how often does lightning strike? You can't <laughs> bet on it going twice, can you? Radiance are in a very precarious situation. If PK are able to keep up this pace, it's only going to get worse and worse as time goes on. Paul scale incredibly well into the late game. Already, Neoma two levels up on his opposition as well. It seems like Radiance <laughs> have been constantly looking for aggression but it's not really found a held anywhere. No, it sure hasn't. This Pittsburgh Knight seems so good at stalling out these games more than stalling them out, at letting them become the drivers of the aggression here in this game. So four kills in 16 minutes. There has been aggression though. There have been buff invades. There have been attempts at finding fights, just they haven't led to a ton. It's now Benji getting aggressive. Aurora here as well. They want to lock down Sierra D, but when he has the ultimate, it's not likely. They'll force that out instead, and Sierra D should be plenty safe. Scary D has been the focal point of the conversation around Worlds all week. Yeah. This guy has been absolutely dominant in every set. I've been saying constantly, he's the best player on the map. But right now, Benji is making short work of him. He looks so good controlling the lane, controlling the team fights, out rotating every single time. Benji, man, he is doing it all for his team and Radiance are flourishing because of it. Look at this call from PK, ever the objective focused team. Aurora blinks in past the freeze, but has now been stunned out by Zapman, who has to use the ultimate in order to retreat. Radiance do a good job of dissuading PK from going for Primal, and now Radiance can start it up themselves with Cyclone Spin here. Neoma uses the Heavenly Sprint, so that's one defensive relic down. Hasn't gone back to base yet either, so no second relic available to him. No one starts up the Fury, instead Neoma takes some damage. Same can be said for Benji and Aurora. We start to back up. I think Radiance think they've done their job by stopping the Fury, but Knights just go right on it. Constantly, I find myself perplexed here by the way Radiance move into these fights. Maybe that was one they just couldn't take? It feels like to me they just forgot about the healing that PK have. They say to themselves, okay, well, Scary's about a half health. That man's nearly dead. There's no way they go for gold for you, but still, it's a Guan Yu. It's an <laughs> Aphrodite. They're going to stick around in these fights as long as they need to. Radiance. I guess it's not too big a deal in the early game. It still is 2,000 gold in favor of PK. But as time goes on, the closer we get to that 30-minute mark, PK's 2,000 gold lead really starting to mean less and less as time goes on. Radiance, I suppose, choose that that fight isn't really going their way. Look at the way that Neil is itemizing with that relic selection. It is an upgraded Sunder that he gets wow. after turning over to level 12. I got to think they mean to blow up one dude. That's the plan, right? I'm going to find a freeze. Whoever I freeze needs to die, guys. Look, <laughs> I, I did it all. He stunned, he slowed, I shipped his defense, and if he had a shield, he doesn't anymore. Sunder doing it all there, making damage output even higher. But it's so interesting that he decides to go for a non-defensive relic. I would expect it to be something like a shell or even a, a curse or something along those lines. But with Benji being as detrimental in the back line as he has been throughout the duration of this match, I'm sure it's going to be a very good pickup. If Neil's able to isolate him in the back, five people turn around, Benji's going to be down bad pretty quickly. Yeah, it won't matter how tanky this guy's been up to that point. He will struggle once that's dropped onto him. On the other side, we still don't know what a roar wants. They're right on top of a ward, though. So PK know exactly where they are. A roar is level 12, but hasn't backed just yet. So once he does, we'll get to follow up on his second relic selection as well. They had a bit of a grouping near fire, but 19 minutes in, really no separation aside from about 2K gold or so for PK. I don't think Radiance were really looking to start that one up. Yeah, I don't know how Aggro called it so easily. He said at the at the top of the he hour, knew. at the very beginning of the set, this one's going to go the distance. It's the, the strategy PK has been employing the entirety of the week. It almost feels like when PK steps up the bat, they're challenging the opposition, the enemy team, to an endurance battle, a battle of attrition, saying, yep. do you have what it takes to stick with us for as long as it takes to beat us? So far, no one has, but Radiance up 1-0. and 0. 
PK, they're no stranger to the comeback. Maybe they got them exactly where they want them. Maybe so, right? I mean, this team very comfortable playing from behind, from ahead, from wherever. This is just a team that doesn't seem to get rattled in PK, at least not on the big stage. There were some times throughout the season where this squad struggled a little bit, right? Where maybe they weren't chaining together the wins, but it looks like here in a best of five, when they get a shot, they are more than capable of responding to some adversity. A really strong team PK is turning out to be. My only fear is that if PK do win, Ghosts aren't going to let you play slow. No, Ghosts won't let you wait for that 40-minute mark. Battle of attrition. No, it's a battle for your life when Ghost <laughs> Gaming's in the lobby. But we can't get ahead of ourselves right. here. It's still very close in this match. Only 2,000 gold separating these teams 20 minutes in. Radiance in position to defend this Pyromancer. And already, Zatman's made the rotation over. Cyclone Spin has the ultimate available, but he hasn't started channeling it yet. Pyromancer low. That'll belong to the Pittsburgh Knights. Roar and Benji looking for some poke. It's not there, but a two-man freeze from Neil is. He commits the Sunder as well. Heavenly. But no hard and commit. They dropped the sprint though, so that means they want more. Tings has become the target. Scary D is all in. Looking to lock down Tings. He's looking to do more than look. Cubo Fred is the one that completes it. And meanwhile, Cyclone Spin keeps up the split push. But Pittsburgh Knights are hitting the go button faster than Radiance. Who would have expected that? Not me, and they're going to keep going. You want to split push? Feel free, Cyclone. We'll take the more valuable tower. Tier 2 going to fall for free. Radiance lose that fight because they separate in completely separate directions. Two people isolated in mid, immediately dove. Now, finally, Cyclone Spin going in the air. And Pittsburgh Knights are committing to Benji heavily. He's taking a lot of damage, but adapting is in. And Cyclone Spin is on his way. The damage is there, and Zatman low in the back. But that's not stopping Scary D and Paul. Stingy and Torment, though, collects Scary D, pulls him into the back. But it's Aurora who ends up falling. The, the Pittsburgh Phoenix? Knights are all in on this aggression, and it's absolutely the right call. Scary D melts adapting, and the middle Phoenix is a distant memory. Zatman low, Scary D he has to retreat, hops on the cavalry charge, and rides on out like bandits in the night. They've stolen your bird. They've taken a roar's life, and they're done now. They're going to line their pockets and spend the gold. I know it doesn't matter what it feels like because of the reality, but doesn't it feel like PK are up 1-0 in this set? I think they played better for the majority of game one until that slip up, and they've been dominant here in game two. I know they're down 0-1, but PK have felt like the better team so far. It feels like they've been setting the pace almost exclusively yeah. in this set. But Radiance is a known counterpuncher team. They yep. like it when the enemy's willing to put them in these situations. If PK's supplying the test, Radiance has the answers more times than not. But right now, PK is throwing questions left and right constantly. Are you ready for the Pyromancer? Are you ready for a Phoenix push? Are you ready for the Oni Fury? I don't think so. PK, pick it up again. Yeah, Radiance do not have the answers. They have not studied the material because when the test comes, they don't know what to write down. And so far, PK have done an excellent job of spreading out the map yet again. And that's with the Apollo being on Radiance. It's so surprising. Now, I do want to make sure that I say Cyclone Spin's push in left was valuable. They got that 2-2. Two -two. They've opened up that left side Phoenix. They keep the goal relatively close globally as well. So he certainly was valuable going in that direction. But I don't know that it's worth losing that middle Phoenix in particular. That's going to be a real thorn in Radiance's side. This might be the biggest gold lead we've seen all set. 5,000 now <laughs> in favor of PK. Right. They're starting to group up around the Fire Giant as well. Keep your eyes on Zatman because that's where PK are playing around right now. If he's on the right side, that means they're serious about this Fire Giant push. They want to make this one happen. Now remember, Cyclone Spin can rotate over as he goes to deal with left. But he's yet to rotate sooner rather than later. As the Fire Giant's already been started and Radiance are not in position. It's down to half already. But it's a great point for PK to have. And Cyclone Spin still has not taken to the sky. But in come Radiance with the Fire Giant at critical threshold. And in comes Swooping Cubo Fred looking to disrupt the Fire Giant. Seems to have been forgotten. They want the fight instead. And Aurora is their first target. Benji low as well. And Pittsburgh Knights have shredded the front line of Radiant. Cyclone Spin comes in, is adapting, takes care of Stary D, but it might be too little too late as Neomar gets the bees from the ADC. That man forced to retreat, but adapting's healthy. If he's able to make contact with Neil, it should be enough, but Radiant's back up there. Interesting decision. I felt like they had all the momentum. Who is Paul linking up to? That's not Neil Ma. I just can't believe it at this point. My man is in critical condition, but I trust the Pittsburgh Knights at this point. Finally, Neil Ma gets some healing, and the Fire Giant is started up. Cyclone Spin and Adapting are local, but they are not contesting as it looks like this Fire Giant's going over to the Knights, and what 
a sequence starting with that push in mid to now where PK have played great. Look, they just make these micro plays that force Radiance to respect the map state already. Fire minion waves are leading their way into the Titan, the Chaos Titan down a couple hundred health. Radiance has to respond. PK, get the Fire Giant for free. I'm surprised with the ward coverage that they have. Take a peek over there. PK are dominating the Fire Giant pit with only five seconds left on Scary D respawning. I'm sure they could have waited just a second, but no <laughs> reason to give Radiance any opportunity to seal. We've seen what Beji does, given the slightest chance. I agree. I think in this instance, I'm not going to give them too hard of a time for making sure they secure that objective. So now, with the mid Phoenix that low, with this Fire Minion Wave pushing itself up, it looks like they're going to group to push left. Maybe leave one or two members to push up that mid lane for them and start this onslaught. And how do you like the defense here from Radiance? I think it's it's strong. They've got tools to burn beads easily. The Stygian Torment could come in in a big way. Big Man Ting's on this Discordia pick. Should be able to separate the back line with Strife. It's going to make it much harder for PK to work their way in in these engagements. They have to be together at all times, but if they're stacked up, that Strife's only going to get more value. It's only to become stronger as time goes on, but they are going to lose one of their most valuable tools, Cyclone Spin, and the ability to rotate to these team fights to split up the map. The game's too simple when it's a siege time. Apollo ult essentially is only for chase down. Yeah, it's not going to be able to do what it was earlier. So it's Scary D and Cuba Fred pushing mid. And they'll have Neil Ma Zap and Paul pushing over and left. Scary D moving in right away. They know how low the mid Phoenix is. So adapting and Benji doing what they can to contest. But great pressure coming out from Pittsburgh Knights. Dive potential of Scary D and Cuba. Now Neil Ma moving in, but the response is a roar looking for Stygian and Torment. They've got the left side Phoenix down to half as well. As well. And now comes the mid pressure. PK, they don't need Rat and Apollo to split the map. They're just doing it as a team. They're doing it the old fashioned way with pressure. Mid Phoenix already fallen. Scary D with the aggressive position is now a looming threat for this defense of Radiance. He's already worked his way into the back. Big man takes it. Cyclone isolated. Looking for the dive. Instead, they come back towards Benji. And they've got Benji Lowe's. That man finding the very first kill of this engagement. But they are taking some damage on the back end. But oh, yeah, they have Guan. And oh, yeah, they have Aphrodite. And oh, yeah, they have Fire Giant. So they can sustain back up and look for another push. Meanwhile, the minions continue to thunder down mid, and only Aurora is here. To left side, Phoenix belongs to He's PK, alone. and Aurora's life is there as well. Zap man on a killing spree, as in comes Psycho and Spin with the open. How can he dive now, despite the good strike? There's nothing. He dives back down straight into his fountain where he belongs. <laughs> PK leading their way into the base. And now moving in to try and end this game. Zap man taking damage to the back, but the Titan is all the way down to half, and Radiance are hobbled in their defense. PK K have found one more win, and the set's all tied up. Three O's, I'm sick of them. I'm ready for a long set. I haven't had one all weekend. It's my turn. PK, bring it to Radiance. This is going to be sick. I mean, I don't know if you agree with my read, but doesn't it feel like now across two games, PK have just played flat out better? I mean, Radiance had some flashes, some great moments. For the most part, this set's been in PK's control. They have been. They're setting the pace. They're choosing the aggression. They're drafting straight up better. How are you going to win against that in the late game? Guan Yu and Aphrodite two times in a row? It should be illegal. Ballpark bathroom disgusting. <laughs> Absolutely working for PK so far. This set's all tied up. We'll be back after the break to break it down. Don't pause, press play. Don't pause, press play. Don't pause, press play. Don't pause, don't pause, press play.
Don't pause. Press play. Don't pause. Press play. Don't pause. Press play. Don't pause. Don't pause. Press play. 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 Well, the Knights don't have to stress as hard as they did yesterday. They get themselves on the board there in game number two. Pretty clean from them as well. And speaking of clean, you could be looking clean in game. Get yourself some gems and buy some skins. Gems right now are 33% off. You're going to want to act on this Ooh. soon because that's only during the SWC week. So once things are done here, all oh, those gems are going to go back to full price and then your wallet's going to be mad at you if you try to buy them something like you know Wednesday, Thursday, next week you should get in on it now while you have the discount going for you and speaking of discount well i don't know if you can discount either of these two teams overall knights are in a precarious position i would say aggro because uh radiance has managed to swerve activating their passive not down to zero which means that they're not going to come out full force eyes glowing red look this is typical biggie <laughs> i mean we know we we know that biggie's one of the best coaches in the spl he's seen what the pittsburgh knights have done in games like this in the past just brilliant coaching coming out of biggie here but in all seriousness i mean something is going to have to change in these picks and bans here coming from radiance i think you just have to ban the aphrodite it's really that simple yep. to me Neil played lights out on this Ymir, but it really came down to this healing once again from Paul. You can you can deal with other things that are going on in the map. The Guan is obviously a problem as well. I mean, that's certainly contributing to all of this healing, but I don't think anyone is doing quite as much as Paul is, just with, with all of this sustain, all of the immunity coming from everybody else, and all the damage. Yeah, I need to see the healing number after this once we get to the post-game stats because I also want to look at some of the damage. Cyclone and uh, adapting here in kind of, a, I would say, a rare form. They didn't really get to do a whole ton that game. Cyclone, we were talking about it. Every time we saw him go up in the ult, 
didn't go in for the fight. We were kind of hoping for it. Maybe it would have been certain death, and I guess I admire avoiding that for your team, but you can see 0-1-1 didn't really have the impact. Zatman was only 3-0-3. It wasn't necessarily the highest killing game that we would have had, but Zatman, 14K, Cyclone, 8K, adapting just a little above at 8.5K. But that's all taken out. I mean, that's 16,000 damage total. And 17,000 player healing over on the other side by, by Paul. I mean, the two people, your two carries at that, essentially getting completely wiped off the board by this Aphrodite. Got to get rid of it at this point, because clearly the way that PK plays in, in these games around the Aphrodite, they play so patiently. They, they really slow the pace of the game down really, yeah. really well. And I know that a lot of Smite fans probably sitting there like, do something, you know, go in and hit <laughs> each other. And I agree with that to some extent. But at the same time, I think you have to put a lot of respect and give a lot of respect to how they understand how to play these compositions, how yeah. to abuse them. And at this point of your radiance, I think you've got to change up these picks and bans. Take this Aphrodite out of Paul's hands. I think big ups uh, both times these teams have clashed now. They've been able to go kind of toe for toe, at least in the first few minutes. Yeah, you got first blood, but then we got the next kill immediately, or we were able to find it afterward. They've been bouncing back and forth between these. But unfortunately, it feels like at least that time, PK got a better grip on the map, and that's where things really start to spiral out of control. And then the kills start to come afterward. And again, like I said, it wasn't necessarily a high kill count game, not what we've seen out of all of this. but. It does come down to how well you can draft it. And you're asking for this Aphrodite to be banned. We're going to have to see if they start to do that here in picks and bans because oh. this is where game number three is going to potentially get changed up. And this is where one team's going to be able to take the advantage. Right now it's tied up. Essentially, you are playing a best of three just with a little bit more knowledge about what these teams are going to be bringing. So jumping into what is going to be, I imagine, you gotta say the secret phrase. You got to say the secret phrase here, Gormizer. It's not picks and bans. Remember, Vinny has dubbed it uh, pickles, pickles and buns. And buns. And I, there you I go. have it yep. written down on my, my PK. You uh, actually wrote that down. For some reason, I've got a bunch of PK stats and then pickles and buns written <laughs> on the side. Very interesting. I kind of want to keep this one, put it in a time capsule, open it in three years and try to figure out what was going on. Yeah. But they opt for first pick, and immediately they say, hey, you know what, Aggro, you might be onto something. Let's ban that Aphrodite. But now you also have to ban Hell. Most likely, and nope, that's they, exactly they where they're going to go with the second <laughs> band because you have to just keep this play style out of Paul's hands, and you can do that same strategy with the Afro or the Hell. So smart by Radiance in order to take those out. And it's another day at the office for Paul. Three bands coming his way. That's that's what he's dealt with basically his whole career here in the SPL. The interesting thing is that now PK has got to make a couple choices: Scylla and Apollo, yeah. or Scylla, Apollo, Cupid, all on the table. Cupid and Scylla were their two bands last game. They can't ban both here because they've taken Ra away from Big Man Tings, understandably so, who's looked very good on that pick throughout the year. Now PK is going to get two of Cupid, Scylla, Ymir. They just have to decide which way they want to go with it and what do they want to make sure. So they decide to go with the Ymir ban, so they're going to give up one, and it'll be the Scylla pick in the mid lane for Radiance. I mean, a lot of priority. You had mentioned that Ra looked good in game one there for Big Man but Scylla going above all else, above and beyond even for that pick is kind of insane. Again, not a lot of people I think would have called that coming into Worlds based on what we've seen throughout the year. But at the same time, after seeing what we've seen this weekend, I'm not surprised about it either. She's been doing really well. Guan Yu Cupid locked in for the Knights. Guan Yu has been kind of hit or miss over there in the solo lane. The healing is nice, but sometimes he falls apart. And this Cupid has been a gift mm. to the duo lane and not just Jake can play this Ares. It looks like Aurora is willing to bring that out against the Cupid. I like it quite a bit. And in talking about this Scylla, I was talking about it with Glickstick on Twitter, a, a longtime mid lane player, absolute beast, and even though he's a Nox main, which is unfortunate for him. Oh, well, uh, they're not a person. Scylla, very, very strong right now, in particular because of the her percent pen on Crush. Mage pen in particular right now is not particularly strong. You saw the build that Paul was going yesterday with double flat pen and then really abusing that percent pen on Crush. And, and I agree that that's a big reason why Scylla's being played, but if that's the case, I wonder if we're going to start seeing Thoth as the other mage who has pen yeah. in the kit, though his flat pen, so a little bit different in that same vein, but a god that we haven't seen a whole lot of. Going back to the Ares selection here for Aurora, I mean, longtime Smite fans will, will associate these two together. Ares for Aurora is, is an iconic combination, and you look at this Cupid on the other end, I think that's exactly what 
Aurora is going to be looking to abuse here in this long lane. Yeah, it's going to be able to help slow him down a little bit. I want to throw a curveball at you. Neither of these teams, but you had mentioned Nox, and the first thing I thought of was like, man, I know we saw Nox successfully recently. Ghost Plater as, as a support, is that something that either of these teams could potentially pull out as a pocket, or is she a ghost only and honestly, even Your then, is barely come. ever going to be picked? If I had to guess two teams that would play it in the SPL, it would be Ghost, of course, and Renegades, because oh, Jake Jake's one who, who was always down to pull out something a little bit different. I don't think we'll see Nox from either of these teams. Oh, yeah, it's looking like that's going to be true. We see Pele Kamazot's banned out there by Radiance on the other side. It's the Rum as well as the Heimdall to try and control Cyclone Spin a little bit. Not worry about that Apollo at all, I guess, after last game. Raven locked in on her Erlong, fill out Radiance's lineup. It's looking like it might be a Kuzenbo here for Neil. An interesting pickup over there, but more so, I think, this on her in the Erlong. Not necessarily something I associate with adapting as, as much as some of the others, do you think this is going to be something he can pick up with ease? Uh, I agree. I think when I, when I think of adapting, of course, everyone thinks of Thor yeah, and, and, and Ravin and Sir Ket and gods like that. But Erlong Shen has really been more for these control assassins more than someone like adapting who likes to come in and be the cleanup guy. Can he be the initiator for this team yeah. is going to be the question. And, and, and I like getting a jungler that can burn beads really effectively. Normally in this sort of situation, we'll see adapting go to something like Daji which he's been very, very potent with in his career. Going to the Erlong is a slightly different look, and I think it requires him to change up that play style to be that first one in, which is usually not Kenneth's MO. You know, I can't be... Uh, I, well, I would be missed if I, I skipped over this Morgan because she's been banned, what, almost all day? I think all day if I missed one in there. There might have been one game she slipped through, but Paul, you ban Hell, you ban Aphrodite, you ban Persephone, and he goes... Well, I guess I'll go to another one of my gods. You take the Scylla away from him. Just trying to strip him down as much as he can. And now he can still be Scylla if he wants. He can be the Kukulin. He can be Ares. He can be Guan. I mean, where does he want to go with these transformations? It's going to be Guan and Robin. The vast majority of the game would be my guess. I mean, Guan in the early game gives you a whole lot of extra chase potential, maximum mobility with that cavalry charge. And then in the mid to late game, Robin gives you survivability and burst damage pretty much on demand. Erlong Chen's on a great transformation a lot of the time. Kakulin, you transform with minimum rage, so that's not ideal. I, I anticipate he's going to be staying at home with selections on his side, but it's still a, a strong pick in its own right. But this is going to have to be a vastly different look here for PK. They still have sustain. They still have the Guan Yu. They still have the Cupid. They still out-sustain Radiance by leaps and bounds, but they don't have the, the Aphrodite. They don't have that absolute insane sustain to allow them to take these 45 second, 90 second team fights that we've seen from the first two games. Probably going to slow them down a little bit. There, or give Radiance maybe an advantage to go back in. On I think it's going to speed them up. I think they can't. Oh. They can't afford to take these these sh short little poke trades, then back up, and then poke trade, and then back up. It's go in or get out. It's go in or we're out of here. You know, <laughs> we've got to get in there. We've got to get into the back line with this Morrigan. We're going to use this Fields of Love to push the back line back. And you're hoping that Paul's coming around the corner right as that Fields of Love comes up because then they're coming out with no beads coming out of that mm -hmm. ultimate or their ultimate down in order to make, make it an easy flank here for Paul. Well, now you're, you're getting someone else who's going to be jumping into the back line. This Kuzenbo that's going to go back there and, and go for the pick, picks and pushes. I had him listed as an Aurora pick in my notes. I, I didn't even think about it. Uh, you know, Sobek available, a lot of other picks that we've seen for Neil that have been very kind to them, especially after yesterday, some of the sick blink plucks that we got to see out of him versus SSG. This Kuzenbo isn't really that like far-fetched for this team, but is it going to do well? I mean, on her can jump back away. Scylla can get away with Sentinel. Is he going to be able to lock people down consistently? I think he will, because in the mid to late game, this is a pick that Neil is very, very comfortable with it, throughout the entire game. But in the mid to late game specifically, Kuzumbo becomes a threat to the back line because they're doing so much damage that they then take that damage from Kuzumbo himself. Between the Thorns and the Shell Spikes, I'd be shocked if Neil plays it the way that Raffer did up against them yesterday where he built it like a traditional Guardian. He didn't go Thorns. I'd expect Neil to play this more like Mike played the Cerberus in their setup against Renegades. Get some Thorns, get a flat pen item, something like a Divine Ruin. In this game, I'd probably be going for a, a Spear of the Magus. And you just run at someone like it on her. What does he do? He, you, throw, yeah. you, you anticipate the Impale. <laughs> you use Watery Grave. He jumps away. You Shell Spikes in a minion wave. You get your dash back up. You're right on top of him again and he's got nowhere to go. I'd expect Neil to play this very differently than what we saw from Raffer. 
and really try and put more pressure on the back line instead of trying to set the front line up with that sumo slam. Well, especially because yesterday uh, we actually got the matchup that he's going to be facing here, right? That Scylla going up against this Kuzinbo, having to deal with that, that reflect damage, as you had mentioned, with the thorns and also the two being able to just completely spike that back. Ideally, Neil knows what he's doing there. Unfortunately, Neil said in the post-game interview that he couldn't see too much from his position. Let's hope something he learned in that one. It's game number three, Radiance and Knights. Who's going to take the lead? Let's find out. Orion Agro on the desk. We are tied up 1-1 to this critical third game. He's going to give somebody the lead. We're already into the action. Kilbo Fred taking a ton of damage, crushed there as well, but not going to net any kills. Three blinks used on the side of Radiance. So they were clearly the aggressors catching PK off guard. Hot out the gate, Radiance not happy with how game two went. Looked like they want to set a brand new pace here. But it's a new look for PK. Finally, Paul off the Aphrodite has to go to something different instead. It's going to be the Morgan. Nice catch from Fred, or yeah. from Doug rather. Fred goes for the overhead kick in that first slot. Means that it's clear, going to be a lot slower. His kill potential to early, going to be a lot slower. Normally, you start with the Prana Onslaught, that's the one, and then you go for the three. Now it's going to be a long time until he has those available. Yeah, and that's the result of that pressure from Radiance of those three blinks at the start, catching Pittsburgh Knights off guard and kind of putting Kiba Fred in a position where he has to take that two in order to survive. But now Neil Ma getting aggressive, pulling Aurora back into Zatman for the damage. But there's Cyclone spin with some peel, taking the heart bomb. But now Cyclone is low and stunned. In rage, he uses the beads to get out of there. All kinds of aggression in the early. And Cyclone's been under pressure already. I think if Neil connects that Nene Kappa, that's first blood right there instantly. But it's still a pretty good start. You burn off the beads from Cyclone spin on this on her. That's going to just stop the aggression in its tracks. We know on her is a god that wants to be jumping in almost every single wave. Established dominance. Cyclone spin. He's not going to be allowed to do it for another 130 seconds. Yeah, over two minutes. He'll have to slow down as Aurora wants to slow him down on those Alpha Harp. He cannot stop them, though. Pittsburgh Knights come in and grab it. I think Aggro and Gore, though, were hitting onto a really important point for this game. Adapting on the Erlong Shen. For me, that's that's almost the whole thing, is how he's able to play this pick. Adapting is not normally, like they said, the first guy in, the initiator. He likes to kind of sit and wait, bide his time, pick his spots, come in for the cleanup. How do you expect Adapting to play this one? Uh, it, it, it'll be surprising to see him switch up his play style, right? Erlang Shen, almost the antithesis of the MO playbook for Adapting. He likes to be last one in, pick up a couple kills, play around the side of the fight. But on this Erlang Shen, he's going to need to be the initiator. He needs to be one of the first ones in there. Go in with a nine turns blessing and set up every single engagement. I want to see the exact same pace out of Fred as I do from Adapting. They both need to get involved very early. They both need to be the aggressors and see the better jungler win it. What a what a set this has been. It's 1-1 and into this critical game three to see who goes up with that 2-1 advantage. Both Cubo, Fred, and Adapting have the ball in their court, in their hands. They decide how this game will move on. Cubo, Fred now out of those murky waters we talked about with the leveling earlier on. Now up to level three and even up to level four. He is A-OK -okay in terms of his jungle start, but Benji get a little bit of pressure here on Scary D in the solo side. Nothing new for Benji. My man's <laughs> been controlling that lane the entire set, where it feels like PK's been controlling the matches. Benji has been controlling that lane almost single-handedly. Yeah. Maybe the only guy on his team that's been able to find proactive plays consistently and just working it the entire time. I want to see Radiance play around the Skakullin and maybe adapting and Benji Voltron together and get something rolling. Tangs will be that final piece of that aggressive puzzle for Benji and adapting, yes, right? Because he is back on this Scylla. Once more, has been such a big pick throughout this weekend. So I expect to see that same start from him with the boots into that Spear of Desolation, followed by some other flat pen, probably Divine Ruin with the Guan Yu on that other side, and then try and get the Scylla ball rolling. We know that when she gets to the late game and she has that threat for stealing objectives, all that first damage, it feels like the other team is kind of paralyzed and they can't even play. Completely agreed. Scylla has become an absolute game changer yeah. in the SPL meta this week in particular. They've been holding this card close to their chest all year. <laughs> if they've known about it, they haven't told us the casters. Because <laughs> Scylla came out of nowhere, a dark horse for that mid contention. And even Paul going a little bit deeper into his god pool. This isn't the hell. This isn't the Hebo. It's not what we normally associate with them. It's not even the Poseidon. Morgan's almost a new look for this guy. Paul going to be able to to be a bit of an aggressor himself, right? We said Kibo Fred needs to do a lot, but later on in the game, I'll expect more from Paul. A Cyclone spin under some trouble already, but there's the leap in. You can't put on her in trouble that easily. He leaps 
and pushes Zap Man back. And I want to see Cyclone Spin continue to play this way to, to, to leap in with this on her just like you asked for. But it's still a double-edged sword. Until he gets those boots online, you leap in. I don't care if your ultimate's available. If Zapman places that Fields of Love properly, he's at least going to get the damage, if not the Mez, every single time. Cyclone Spin needs to play safe until uh, yeah, maybe the Devo Gloves gets finished, and, as well as the Ninja Tabby. Then he should be able to establish his dominance in that lane consistently. That'll be the focal point, then. See that there's a lot of areas. So maybe not as simple as I initially made it sound. Lots of key players in this game then because Aurora is also going to be a really important factor from them for them in this early game and trying to lock down really a couple of carries without that CC immunity in the ult. Paul though should have time perhaps if he's hit by that chain to transform and, and get a little bit of safety or is he often going to get pulled? I think he should be able to transform almost every time. It's a long time until the no escape really does go off. Scary D in a little bit of trouble. This is something Adapting's been doing all set, trying to find these picks in the solo lane, these early rotations over here. This time, all the mounts do is stripping away that cavalry charge. But we know what Benji's able to do with a slight lead. No ultimate available for that Guan Yu. Scary, it's not as safe as you might think. Not at all. Benji willing to be aggressive. So, for the previous conversation, Paul should be safe relatively if he's able to quickly get transformed when he's caught in the grasp of Roar's ultimate. There's Cyclone Spin getting aggressive wow. there with the ultimate. He trades ult for ult on the back of that field of love, and he doesn't end up taking the damage, and Neil stays patient with the blink the whole time. Yeah, with Cyclone Spin maintaining the jump there, Neil has to really choose his spots. If he blinks in, all he's going to do is potentially get the beads and a jump away from Cyclone Spin, so he has to play a lot more patiently around it. And with a roar waiting in the wings, I'm not sure I want to fight an Ares this early on. <laughs> but he didn't prioritize the boots, did he? I was thinking, especially with the fields of love to worry about, that maybe we'd see those come out faster from Cyclone Spin. But both of these hunters elect to grab the Devourer's Gauntlets. It looks like very slightly Cyclone Spin is ahead in stacks. Not too big a deal here if it's going to be only this three. But that's what they've elected to do, a bit of a slower start. But you feel good once you have those devos started, or finished rather. So maybe we are in rather than uh, what we thought for another slow game. But here's adapting, looking for Cubo wow. Fed, finding the root. And Cubo just stays calm and collected. Yeah, Cubo stays calm and collected, but also loses 50% of himself <laughs> nearly instantly. Maybe if the follow up is there from Big Man Tings, if he's a little bit closer, I'm a monster comes through his follow up. I mean, there's so much DC between the nine turns blessing as well as the turtle form from adapting that we get a proof of concept. Adapting is able to engage. He's able to be the aggressor. He's able to be the first one in. Kenneth, a man of many crowns. This is just another one. He is showing us that he is comfortable on this Erlog. I like this look here for him. I mean, we had that uh, at goodbye video for Adapting, and he's been doing all kinds of play styles throughout his career. This wait and see style, a bit more of the late, right? Early on in his career, he did this kind of initiating all the time. So certainly showing us that he is still comfortable on it, even though it's been a while since maybe we've seen this exact look from him. So another bit of a slower game than in this one. But you were saying you want both these junglers to get aggressive. Is that a must for these two teams, or are both of them plenty capable of fighting in the mid to late? Without the Aphrodite in this match in particular, I don't think you can really favor one of these squads over the other come late game too heavily. Still, you've got the healing coming through from Guan Yu as well as Cupid for PK, but Radiance is going to have the heavier scaling team as far as damage output goes. Cyclone Spin and Big Man Tings are both going to have one shot potential come late game, but I got to be worried about this Morgan. I think Paul is going to be very intricate and he's going to be very indicative of how this PK roster is going to want to play. Is he going to go for the Polynomicon Soul Reaver build? Is he going to try and one shot someone in the back line? Is he going to go a little bit more Dardes centric with a little bit of defense in there and play around the transform? It's yet to be seen. Paul has all these options at his feet of how he chooses to approach this game. That will likely dictate the flow once we get a little bit deeper into this itemization for this Morgan pilot and what direction that we'll be seeing from them. So Neil Ma with the reinforced Greaves into the Stone of Binding. Exact same start there for Aurora. For both of these Guardians, it's not a bad way to begin, right? Both of them with relatively easy to apply CC that can set up for some big damage. A ton of damage potential from both of these guys, but already we're seeing that Radiance and PK, they've established their own little meta here. They want to wait until around that 12, 13 minute mark until they group up around the Gold Fury, the Pyromancer, and starts trading out these neutral objectives. But look, I think that Radiance has a draft that should be favored in the early game. I know we don't really favor one in the late game too much, but right now Radiance 
is so strong. A roar on this area should be able to bring it to fall every single time. And yet it's Pittsburgh Knights looking for the first gank. Benji is the target, still has the ultimate available, but used it a bit too soon to avoid the stuns. Now even underneath the tower, he is the target. The Mystic Rush is there, but still what? Benji survives. He does not live. First blood goes over to the Knights and they get everybody out. Scary D, a little bit lucky in that one. One more shot. Would have put him down, but Radiance, no slouch. They're going straight to gold. And they use the I'm a Monster for confirm. So Gold Fury goes to Radiance. Even though they give up first blood, it's Radiance that end up on top. What a response from them. They've been a bit slow to do objectives so far throughout this set. But when their boy gets two man ganked in right, they're not afraid to start one. And now they're much more objective centric. They've got the burn potential. Essentially, how this uh, adapting pick is going to work is a secondary ADC already has the kin size online. Not only is he a tank shredder, but also an objective shredder. They've got the confirm from Big Man Tings. We saw it. I'm a monster. It's the hardest hitting ability on the map right now. There's no such thing as a 50 50 in this game. If Radius is on the objective, they should be able to confirm it. This is what we've seen Scylla do in these games, man. She has stalled him out. Adapting blinks in and gets the beat out from Paul. Great reaction from Paul as those do get forced out. I think adapting is fine with that trade every day of the week. His blink for those beads. Wouldn't be surprised if we see him back in there trying to punish Paul again. Yeah, I like this start for adapting as well, but this is such a slow build going for the kin size so early on. I wonder if he's going to go for the stone cutting sword next or where he's going to elect to go. It's going to be the ancient blade. Could move into a winged blade, potentially a witch blade, more than likely going to be the toxic blade. I Had to run so. the entire list to deal with some of that healing that we're going through from PK. Guan Yu and Cupid both going to have healing a little bit more so out of combat from the Cupid, but Guan Yu in particular, toxic blade is going to be a huge damper for him. That's the patented John Finch approach. Can't get it wrong if you name every item, <laughs> right? So they didn't, they didn't see me do the meme thing, but they got it back there at home. So I think you're right there where you landed on that toxic blade for adapting but as you kind of mo mentioned, we're not really going to see much from him if this is going to be a bit of a slow start. He got aggressive on to Paul, though, right, and forced out those beads. So I think there's a bit of uh, a pressure on him to come back in and look for that pressure once more. Even if he doesn't necessarily have to blink for it, Tings can find a route. He can find a range route himself. And suddenly Paul may be forced to ult, may be forced to use that Aegis if he wants to make it out. This is such a tense game, Finch. It just feels like at any moment the, the calm in the water is just going to break. One splash is all it's going to take. One pick, Gold Fury. Next pick, Pyromancer. Next pick, we're already going to be on the Fire Giant. These teams are playing on the thinnest of margins. I'm keeping my eyes on Paul, though. This guy has been explosive for PK throughout the entire year, and he's on a playmaker pick inside of this Morgan. This is a really big game here, isn't it? Within an important set. This is for the right to move on to those finals up against Ghost. This is to get the momentum here within this set. I mean, Radiant struck first, Pittsburgh Knights bounced back, and now we find ourselves here tied. The team that moves up to that 2-1 has a game to play with, can look for a bit of a riskier strat maybe, or try something out and see if it works as Cubo Fred passes by. Psycho and Spin, even with all that presence there, doesn't commit. Perhaps he recognized there were three members of Radiance chilling back on the red buff. Speaking of Fred, on this Robin pick, I expected to see him get involved much earlier on. Adapting hasn't really gotten much success for his gangs, but at least he's stripping away Paul's beads time and time again, making sure that he can't make these proactive plays. Cubo, on the other hand, has been playing very slow, a much more farm-centric play style. Maybe he's waiting to finish up that sledge before he's willing to get aggressive. It wouldn't be a bad timing there for him, right? I mean, sledge is a big power spike item for warrior for, for junglers for warrior supports or whoever ends up wanting to pick that one up so i won't give him too hard of a time for slowing down on it we just saw a big item finished for benji but before that the knights are starting up the pyromancer this is not exactly even with the gold fury from earlier but a big advantage for them since no one from radiance is coming to contest they'll hear the global notification far far too late as pk now actually enjoy themselves a bit of a small lead but it's been bouncing back and forth this five or six hundred gold now, Radiance in a position where neutral objective spawns in one minute. They know that Pyromancer is desync, so there's not going to be that counterplay. Sometimes we see these teams say, well, we don't really favor this fight here, so if they go for Gold Fear, we'll go for Pyro. PK essentially eliminate that option. Now, once this Gold Fear respawns, it's going to be the only POI on the map. Point of interest, it's going to be a fight there. Almost certainly, but if you're in the Knights, I don't know how much you want to be at that fight. Can you out confirm what Radiance are going to be able to do with this Scylla or step into the no escape from Aurora and adapting clutches? We're going to have to find a way to make it work. It's look at this. Cubo Fred rotating the right. Benji 
might be the target. No, Benji's not. It's the blue buff instead as Aurora and Adapter respond on the other side. There's the blink to the ult. Zatman is pulled back in, held on what? to the purification feed. Zatman has done it all set long, and he continues to be correct. In fact, he responds with an ultimate of his own, and Aurora now the one in kill threshold. He makes it out of there, but he not for long as Paul puts in the damage, and Neomoth just needs a little bit, but Aurora somehow still alive. Paul on the chase finds the snipe. Aurora goes down. Neoma has Cyclone Spin in the back, forced to use the jump. Paul turns into Cubo, but can't find the chase. And now Cubo Fred himself is here to look for Cyclone Spin, and Paul gets himself a double, took care of Aurora, and then cleans up the rest of the dual lane on the backside. And how about Pittsburgh Knights navigating these early parts of the game better than Radiance here in this third game and setting up for a fury? Who in their right mind just allows Ares to pull him? Says, call an ambulance, but not for me. <laughs> Zatman turns that fight around nearly single-handedly. Scary deep is adapting in the back. He might fight a solo too. He absolutely does. It's a 1v2 because Tings was here, but Tings dashes in looking for the kill, but the heal is there for Scary D, who has done it all week. Yet another impressive performance for him as he approves the 2 0. Same for Paul, plus the Oni Fury. Maybe we've been talking about Benji too much. Scary Bel Air, the, con the world champion, the defending world champion, yep. doesn't want us to talk about him anymore. It's time to talk about Guan Yu. What's he doing at that back end? How does he get there? <laughs> yeah, did he rotate behind the tier two? I didn't quite get to see it, but PK, this is a much different pace than we've seen all set. They're bringing it to Radiance every single step of the way. They've been able to establish the pace throughout the entirety of the set, yep. but this is really the first time that they brought it to him this early on. I mean, I think that this makes three games where Radiance have looked a little bit lost in how to deal with this Pittsburgh Knights draft. And it's because they keep getting these different looks. It was the Afro Guan first, and that was, was really causing them problems until they eventually were able to get a pick on Scary in game one. It beat him in game two. And now here in game three, it's just all of a sudden pressure. That rotation to left, where Zatman holds onto the beads and, and Pittsburgh Knights get the punish on the back end. That is such a great call from them and such a great navigation of that entire team fight. Now, here they are invading the blue buff and stripping that away, but Radiance want to take the fight. In comes Paul, but suddenly he is caught up. So onto the horse goes Scary D, and suddenly the Radiance members are low, but Aurora wants the pull. He gets two in, and that sets up for Tings to get a big on the monster. Scary D, pretty low, caught in the Let's crush. go, Tings! The big man, Tings. Neoma, the last one standing. Maybe a triple for Tings. We can get another cooldown. Benji strips away the honor, but they'll take those three kills. What a response from Radiance. They absolutely needed it, considering what the Knights just did. But well, what is PK doing? elsewhere on the map. Zatman stripping away the red buff. Now it's just Benji on the right-hand side. Is he going to go for the Tier 2? No one from PK is responding. Yeah, he looks like he was considering continuing a push, but no longer will that be the case. So adapting dropped on Radiance. And Scary D, Cubo, and Neo Ma all sent to watch through black and white back at their fountain. So Radiance hold for the moment. At least a little bit of momentum. Certainly not still the lead. About 1,000 still in favor of PK, but they have shown that they can still respond to this Pittsburgh Knights draft. And if you don't have the relics, you are gonna get pulled in by a roar and dunked on by Tings. That has gotta be priority number one for PK to avoid that combo. That's a combo as classic as Smite itself, right? This has been around for a very long time. And if you just look at PK's draft, the CC immunity ults, you're looking at Neoma, you're looking at Scary D, potentially Cubo if he's not using his ult to engage the fight. And that's about it. Paul, Zapman, both gonna have to use beads every single time and radiance they've got plenty of beads burners nine turns blessing benji's ultimate as well even big man ting's just finding the sickum they have a lot of ways to deal with the relics of pk they have to put the pressure on them because aurora be looking to pull and after that he's looking to sunder the enhanced sunder there in that second slot for him whereas neil ma went for the thorns i think agro would have loved to see this on a cruise in about earlier on in the year, but he'll just have to settle for Neil Ma electing to grab that relic. So the next time these supports get involved in Aurora level 14, we'll certainly get involved. You gotta worry about the Sunder and the ult. You really do, but even though Aurora's got a two level lead, there's some level leads for PK as well. One in the jungle, one in mid as well, and take a peek at the build from Paul. I think it's the first time we've seen Polynomicon picked up by a Morgan this week. The burst potential is absolutely there. If he's able to stealth into the back, find a stun, find an auto attack, Dark Omen afterward, immediately transform, someone's gonna die, and they're gonna die quickly. Yeah, if it's a squishy, he might even get to use that ultimate on somebody else, depending. I mean, that is a lot of damage as the Knights secure the Pyromancer on the top side of the map. Benji 
cannot get there in time to slow him down. So the Knights slowly extend out their lead, but not by much as we approach the 19 minute mark here in this one. And the game is gone largely as we've thought. When PK are able to start the fights and Paul gets in the back, it's theirs. But Psycho and Spin force out Kubo's ultimate almost on his own. There was the threat of backup, yes, but great work from Cyclone. Yeah, Kubo a little bit too far forward there. Immediately got collapsed on by the rest of Radiance, but now we're starting to group up again. Uh, this is exactly how the entire set's been going. Gold Fury respawns. Ten people are going to be there. That's where the fights are really going to establish themselves. PK have less healing this time around, but they still have the edge. Guan Yu and Cupid, no response and sustain. Uh, from the side of Radiance, outside of maybe a couple of lifesteal items coming through for a couple of these members. But Radiance bring the fight to PK. They've grouped up on the Tier 1 tower. It's time for PK to put up a defense. That man takes Tier 1 in left. And Radiance responds by getting the Tier 1 in mid. But that man's going to keep going if no one's going to join him and trust his team to defend the Tier 2 in mid. So that man should be guaranteed back there unless the minion wave doesn't survive. Meanwhile, Radiance have the Tier 2 in mid down below half. And PK aren't committing their Scary D moving in. But does he get there in time? The answer is no. Cyclone Spin takes the mid Tier 2. Whereas that man takes the Tier 2 in left. Radiance wins that trade every single day of the week. The map pressure stripping away both of those towers affords them is absolutely huge. Taking just the Tier 1 was going to be nice for these Gold Fury fights. Now, PK might have to run much, much further away to escape a fight if they start to fall behind. Looks like adapting use the 9 turns blessing. That Ud ultimate is just starting to, to come back up off cooldown. There are no relics down on PK except for the blink. Maybe it was 9 turns blessing for the blink from Scary. I didn't see, but either way, those are the cooldowns that are missing. Everything else is available coming into this fight. Red buff on Tings, two buffs on the sides of PK as they have started up the Fury, and now Dare Radiance to move in. The Fury at half, but Big Man Tings has the best confirmed with his ultimate, so the Knights must be planning on a reset as Paul moves in with the stealth, but is forced to retreat, and PK has to reset. The PK have to play very carefully here. As you already highlighted, Big Man Tings has the best confirmation on the map, but he's going to have to put himself in a position to get engaged on if he wants to step up for it. Cavalry charge available. Potentially two of them with the Morrigan. If Paul wants to, he can even turn into Big Man Tings himself and confirm the objective, but it seems like Radiance just showing their face of the objective is enough to scare PK off. But now, what's going to happen? Are they going to fizzle? Is it going to be Radiance starting it up? It's yet to be seen. PK is still hovering near the Fury. But they're not going to push up. Or, excuse me, Radiance still hovering to the fear, but they're not going to push up just yet. They send Cyclone Spin to clean up that wave over in left and then get started pushing up just a little bit more. But as you're, it looks like you're right, they're going to give up on this fear for now, head back towards mid, or even head back towards doing just a little bit more farming at this point. These Gold Fury fights have really determined how these games have gone, haven't they? These big duels around them. So it looks like neither of these teams want to make a mistake there, and instead they're being patient. But Zatman and Neil are back. They just haven't started it up yet. Yeah, PK went back to base and picked up a couple of wards. Two sentries in the pocket, two normal, as opposed to Radiance only having the one. So PK should have the clear advantage as far as vision goes around this neutral objective. But both teams very hesitant around this neutral. It seems like both of them feeling the pressure of this one and one set. No one wants to upset the balance, except Radiance is already there. They have the crush down. They have I'm a monster. Radiance confirmed the objective cleanly. And Pittsburgh Knights have nothing to say. So that brings the game back closer to parity. But at this point, the margins are so thin. I wouldn't stress about it if I was either of these teams essentially dead tied. 1,400 or so in a gold. Maybe a little bit more in experience. But as we approach these level 20s, we can see the mid laners are there. The, one of the ADCs is already there. A solo laner, two. That's not going to matter much more either. So adapting level 16 as opposed to Cuba Fred's 18, that's certainly not nothing. It's pretty big, especially considering how close Cubo is to hitting this insane power spike. There's going to be a clear difference between how these two junglers play. Adapting has clear sustained damage. He's going to stick in these fights and do a ton over time, whereas Cubo has got instant burst. Uh, ultimate committed there to try and lock down Aurora. Aurora uses the ultimate of his own, and that will pull in two. Adapting has the root in response, but that is two, two support ultimates used without really gaining much at all. So they both start to back up, but look at the Knights. Four members strong on the Fire Giant side of the map. Not considering starting it just yet, but they have the presence, whereas Radiance still don't quite yet. EK grouping so far into this lane might be trying to corral Radiance into a defense. If they can get eyes on all five, it makes it that much easier to group up on the Fire Giant itself. It is going to be a tier one Whoa. tower push, and Benji whiffs the ult. Benji blinks in and ults. Doesn't find much there either. Looks like Adapting's blink is on cooldown as well. 
And really, Radiants don't get much for that at all. Aurora Ultimate coming back off cooldown soon, as is Neil Maz. They use there to get together earlier on before that little skirmish. The Knights have a small advantage, but nothing they can capitalize on. But already they've split the map. Radiance getting strung along by the Knights grouping up. Uvo looking to take down that tier one tower, has to back up. Radiance groups very well. And now they're already on the pyro. PK, where you at? Radiance with a great call there to grab the objective, but in come the Knights, but a two-man taunt from what? adapting is the response, and Scary D low already, Fields of Love comes out from Zatman to split the plate, and adapting is alone in the back line, so Zatman gets the first casualty of this battle. But in the back line, there's Paul, he finds a stun, and Tings is in some trouble, he can't ult in, so Tings able to make it back out, but Scary D goes in, Kilbo Fry right behind him, and Tings will drop a roar, gonna be right behind him as Pitch for a Knight. Find three uncontested. Cyclone's fan drops the Desert Fury from a range. Can't finish anyone up. Scary D blinked in at one tenth health, maybe 10% HP. Wow. He did not care. He trusted his team to find the fight, and they absolutely do. Now it's only Cyclone's fan hovering around for the defense, but without the ult, he can't do anything. No, he has next to zero still potential. Pittsburgh Knights win the first big battle over near the Fire Giant, and Radiance continue for my money to look a little bit lost in this one, Mifflin. They are not sure how to approach this Pittsburgh Knights team that keeps giving them different looks, that keep finding new ways to push past this Radiance team. They were the real deal last year. There's a chance they're the real deal here as well. Yeah, PK, hey, they are playing so patient, aren't they? Every single time we yep. think, maybe they're gonna jump into this fight. No, they're gonna wait for Radiance to make a mistake. They're gonna wait for an opportunity to arise, find that clear thread, the opening thread to find these All fights. Right. But unfortunately for Radiance, they're giving them that thread almost every single time. There seems to be a moment where Radiance, someone steps too far forward. Someone maybe just goes for a dive that doesn't quite work out. That time around, it was adapting and PK optimized on it perfectly. Now, Fire Giant on five members. Only one tower standing between PK and the base of Radiance is going to be a tough one. Radiance going to have to defend. All right, chat. Here's what I'm thinking. Talking to chat. I'm going to say opening thread is a full Metal Alchemist reference. Do you think they think I'm joking? Do you think they understand that? I, a bit? I mean, like, <laughs> that's that's a deep cut, man. <laughs> I, it's not often I get into an anime discussion to wax poetic about it. Yeah, never once on that happened stage. with us, right? Yeah, yeah, no, no shot. No, no shot, chance not us. that we ever end up discussing anime on the broadcast. Three to eight in the kills. 26 minutes in, and we know what the Knights are up to. They're pushing up the waves, Myth. So if I want to talk about the opening thread from Full Metal Alchemist, then I Just can, stop. right? There's no chance they use alchemy in that. That's Dragon Ball Z where they use the alchemy, right? Am I doing that, right? Quit, dude. <laughs> <laughs> we probably just lost like 10,000 people. They're like, oh, okay, these guys are idiots. Let's Yeah, they don't know off. anything about anything. Let's get out of here, No, <laughs> Obviously having some fun on this one is Pittsburgh Knights have claimed the mid-tier two, and they are ready for a Phoenix Siege. About two minutes to work with here, Myth. How do you like Radiance's defense? I think it can work out. It's going to be very contingent on big man Tings. I think it's going to be in almost impossible for Aurora to get value out of his ultimate with the beads coming back up for PK. It's going to be very difficult. He's almost going to be the first one in every time, but let's see. Well, he does manage to pull in Neil Ma, who has to use the ultimate. So that's an ult for ult trade between the two supports. That seems to be about how that interaction has gone so far throughout this game. So now Scary D, Cubo Fred, and Paul threaten the middle Phoenix. Not much threat. They back up. A 3-2 split with the minion waves pushed up in mid and left. Gonna make this hard on Radiance as Scary D moves in first. Puts some pressure on the Benji, but their wave is dealt with. Yeah, very slow push from PK here. Just trying to divert the attention of Radiance. Let's see if we can get big man teams to come over to mid to create some space in left. But it seems like PK don't like the look of this push. Instead, gonna fall back. They don't have much time to play with here. Only about a minute and a half left on this Fire Giant. If they go to the Gold Fury, that tells me they're happy just getting a tier two tower at that fire giant push. So that's the red buff stolen, the primal fury stolen as well. And their positioning makes me think this siege is over. A bit surprised, but should I really be? PK are one of the most patient teams that we have here in this league. And they've showed it throughout this week as well. They're going to take their time. They're going to back it up here on this one and just elect to try and come back again and win another fight over near that fire. But this time they'll come in with an 8,000 gold advantage. And I think that is still going to be pretty relevant here for them. They're nearly six slotted, selling most of those starters, most of those uh, starters, and not going to be the case over there for Radiance. They still have Assassins, Mages, Guardians as well. So maybe a little bit of an edge for PK. Yeah, now Cubo Fred tops off his build with an Erendite as well as a Potion of Power. So he's going to be one-shotting just about anyone. Swing. If Big Man Tings goes into the I'm a Monster Ultimate 
and roots himself for however long it is, 0 0.25, 0 0.5 seconds where he has to fire that one off. And ultimate from Cuvo Fred should put him in the dirt with the help of Prana Onslaught. I mean, that's the amount of damage output he's getting with Erendite, Heartseeker, Jotun, Sledge, Void. This guy is absolutely swinging for the fences. But keep your eye on Paul, man. I can't emphasize it enough. He's got so much power under his belt. He's got the Polynomicon for additional burst. And I don't think my man's had to use these relics defensively a single time. No. Paul's essentially been free casting. He has been easy going throughout this game, hasn't he? And Zatman has not been easy going, and yet still enjoys the 1-0-3 and has been very cautious with his relics up until this point, hasn't he? So Radiance now to, to make the calculation. Do they want to come out and contest? I mean, it's down about nine, 8,000 or so in terms of gold. I mean, do they have to come out? They haven't lost a Phoenix yet, so they can do so safely. I think they should come out. You don't want to give away the enhanced fire giant as it's going to tick away in about 25 seconds, get to that 30 minute mark. It's going to make it so much easier for this siege from PK to work out. It seems like the best strategy they've had is just have Zatman backdoor a Phoenix with the help of a Nene Kappa. It's <laughs> really going to be hard to deal with if they do pick up that enhanced fire. So I'd really like to see Radiance try and work their way forward, utilize the ability to take these team fights off the back of Big Man Tings, have adapting, start it up, maybe burn out some of those beads. But so far, PK's front line has been doing such a fantastic job of disrupting Radiance. Scary D going in with the enhanced thorns every single time. Neoma doing the exact same. How many times has Aurora had to use his own ultimate on just Neoma? It's not working out. Just to try and get away from the aggression as Scary D lives through those chains pretty cleanly. The Pittsburgh Knights have the defensive positioning around the enhanced fire giant, but Rene, but Radiance, excuse me, have the best ultimate here for that secure in terms of that I'm a monster. So maybe PK don't feel great about the five on five trying to secure it. But they're starting to fire giants. That man's whittling away. Well, it looks like that wasn't a real commit. They've, they've reached it again. Yeah, they're waiting for Radiance to step forward. They want to take the fight before they take the fire. PK, patience is the name of the game. So who's going to engage on the side of Radiance? If they don't start the fire themselves, I don't think there's any reason that Radiance would step forward. PK right. has to generate threat, be it through damaging the fire giant or engaging the fight on their own. They got to be careful clumping up here or else Pittsburgh Knights will push in, Huge but that's big damage, Scary D removed in an instant, so maybe Radiance still have an opportunity as the ultimate for Paul is off the mark, and Kilbo Frank gets Cyclone spin and trade, so one for one on both sides, ADC for Solo, and now Adapting and Cuba Fred continuing to battle, but Adapting just going to lock him down because then the backup will be on the way, but a good overhead kick keeps Cuba Fred alive, and now they can look for the collapse onto Benzley instead, who finds the knockups and pushes onto Zatman, who has no hope of escaping. That man left isolated by his team. PK scattering to the wind. Benji, we can't stop talking about him. Finds Cubo in mid, and he might pick up another kill. Especially with the help from Adapting. There's the root, and Adapting adds on the third kill here for Radiance. What a team fight from Radiance. And what I've been saying that they have not been particularly clear on how they want to engage in these games, but that time they seemed obvious, didn't they? Adapting, start these fights off for us. I mean, PK essentially walk head first into Adapting. My man said, oh, you're just three. <laughs> News in front of me. Maybe I just nine turns blessing real quick. And the follow up from Big Man Tings is obviously going to be there. Yep. Now, 30 seconds left on Cubo, 20 seconds left on Zapman. Radiance are in the driver's seat for the first time in game three with Enhanced Fire Giant on the menu. Let's see if PK can put up a defense. Well, they're going to bring in the squad. At the very least, Scary D and Neil are on their way. Paul will be much further behind as the Fire Giant gets burned quickly, adapting. And Cyclone spins damage. No, Cyclone spins on here, adapting, doing this mostly on his own with a little bit of help from Tings. But the zone from Bindi is so good, it does not matter. If this enhanced fire giant is going over to Radiance, and now we got to see how they're going to push with it. I mean, they've got some options, but how do you think their siege is going to look against the Knights' defense? This is an aggressive composition that Radiance has. Benji adapting Aurora, the core of the front line, should be able to engage relatively easily. They don't have the same amount of sustain as PK, so they're gonna have to be a lot cleaner on their engagements around these towers, around these Phoenixes as well. I think potentially with the pace that we've seen throughout the duration of this set, Radiance might just go ahead and strip away these last three towers of PK and be happy with that there. But I think the defense of PK is slightly weak. They don't have a traditional mage like a Scylla or a Poseidon or even the Hebo. Instead, it's gonna be a Morrigan. That Dark Omen, fantastic poke tool, but a little bit less good at clearing out these ways, a little bit less good at creating space for the rest of the team. Paul 
is not going to be able to get usage out of the stealth either. The game simplifies on a Phoenix defense. The Morgan not nearly as tricky. You know, it's going to be so much harder for her to, for Paul rather, to find those sneak around plays and start the fights off with a stun and then getting value off that Polynomica as we have seen him do before. Still, Paul has not died in this game for what is worth. The only member still without a death to their name. It looks like, for the most part, Radiance will be pushing up this left side wave, looking where they can find a, a spot to push. And look at that. Paul elects to pick up an elixir of power before going for that true sixth item slot. He knows that he needs the additional power for that one-shot potential. That's going to be more scaling for the Polynomicon. If he is able to find a stun onto a priority target, that's guaranteed death every single time. Radiance moving right in. Zapman only just now gets the back off of the left side. Phoenix taking a ton of damage already. And Neil Maw getting pushed back into the Phoenix. Neil Maw does manage to get out of there, but adapting has to punish. So in goes Scary D. Desert Fury is the response as Aurora gets stuck inside the field of love. And Paul looking for his moment. He finds Tings who responds at the Aegis. And Paul has to use his ultimate to disengage. Turns into the Robin and looks to leave. But with the 5v4 advantage, I don't think Radiance are going anywhere. Tings uses the beads as well, though, so now he's got to play much more safe. He wasn't able to find the kill, Paul, that is, but he does at least burn through a decent bit of Tings' HP bar. But with the waves moving through mid, enhanced by the Oni Fury, maybe Radius could go for one more Phoenix. 5v4, but as you said, big man Tings is vulnerable. The middle Phoenix is vulnerable as well, though, as it is shredded quickly by the Enhanced Fire Giant team, so Scary D moves in. And then right behind him is Kubo Fred, who goes for Cyclone Spin in the back. Scary comes in with the ultra, but he gets melted right away. Cyclone Spin gets the kill. So now there's 60 seconds, a whole minute without Scary. But Neil is on his way, and Cyclone Spin heals up. The mid Phoenix remains standing, but just barely a full minute left yeah. on this Fire Giant buff as well. Radiance has plenty of time to work with, but Paul? We said he wasn't going to be able to get tricky, wasn't going to be able to get behind him. Already he's there. Keep your eye on him. He's got to go for Tings. He knows there's no relics, but Paul can't find the opening, so he backs up again. And Radiant to move in into what is a 5v3 without Paul there. And so far, the fight's favoring them, but adapting takes Watch so out. much damage. Paul gets Cyclone Spin in the back. Tings pops two more, and Benji gets a kill, but Paul finds himself a double. So that means the Knights are still in this one. That man has the shred to burn through a roar. If he can just turn around and land the autos, has to use the Aegis. Paul has the backup, and it's a triple kill. Triple kill from Paul to keep that man alive. One more tick of chains would have put him in the dirt. How is Fantastic this happening? play from PK. Paul so patient inside the jungle, waiting for the opportunity. My man went into the cell three times before he decided it was the right opportunity. And PK, he is scary. He's leaving the base with the Titan already under attack. They're going for the ends. Well, they think they have the opportunity. It's really only Benji they have to worry about, but Benji has a good ultimate to make this work. And Paul gets here so ahead of Scary that that's going to eat up a lot of their time. They can get a Phoenix, but I don't think they can do much more than that. It's 10 seconds left on adapting. 15 on Big Man big Tings. Scary D has to go back to base and defend his Titan, but Benji, you're getting burned, bud. Absolutely getting melted. The mid Phoenix still alive. Zatman and Paul are so low, they're not going to be able to do it at all. They're on different pages, but Paul turns into the Cupid with the ult. That doesn't work either. So Pittsburgh Knights don't get much off their stellar base defense. But they trade out half of the Titan's HP just for the opportunity to push down that mid Phoenix. It's going to be pretty hard for him to find an opportunity to defend if Radiance group up as five. All right, let's take a look back at Paul's patience. He comes in slowly and makes the opportunity work. Look at him. Fantastic play. And he ults the ult from the Scylla, man. Wow. Clean. This guy, we've been talking about him all year. He's the playmaker on PK with the deepest god pool, and he's proven it on the world stage. Yeah, Paul's about as good as they come in this middle lane, isn't he? It's a triple kill for him. Still has not died yet, 5-0 oh, and 6. And now can Pittsburgh Knights come out and defend this? Their Titan is so low at this point. Radiance is putting the pressure on the EFG right away. Neil Moss, Atman, Cubo, Fred, they're all nearby. But maybe I'm wrong, it's not EFG. They go for Pyromancer right away. Harry D does a good job pushing out that left-hand side, making sure those fire mini waves won't be contending with the Titan for much longer. Radiance, they don't have to force the fight right now. They've got a timer. If those fire mini waves start to leak into the base, we've seen the damage they could do. It's already 50%. What's another 50? Well, they're not serious about it. Cyclone Spin even took the back, so it's Tings. Looks like they are going to use this time to instead back and buy some more items. The Pittsburgh Knights just don't have that information to be able to try and make some kind of play on the back of it. So they have to stick around. They're forced to. 
just to make sure the fire doesn't, doesn't go down for free. But they send Paul over to left to continue to push up these waves. PK are still making good use of this time, but as soon as Radiant see that, I think they're going to be all in. Time to gas pedal, but that's why they send Paul. He can poke the wave without showing himself on the map. Radiants don't know he's over there, and now he's working his way back over, but he doesn't clear the entire wave. That bird might go down. So those mini waves will push up. The fire giant about at half, and Radiants are playing this patiently, but adapting, taking a good deal of poke. I don't think you want your jungler at half HP before you start a fight, so Radiants might not even do it. They're going to send adapting back to base and reset. But nobody on PK is there to defend. Finally, Fred. Cubo Fred goes back to base. He has to show himself on the wave. Right. So this is going to be an opportunity for Radiance. But as you've already highlighted, adapting a little bit low HP. He's been the initiator for Radiance the entire game. You don't want him low. He'll get blown up instantly. He had to go back to base. Oh, it's going to take so much time for Cubo Fred to get back. This is the opportunity Radiance needed from getting that Phoenix and then putting pressure on the FG. This should open it up for them. They're going to go right to the fire. And Cubo still in left. And Pittsburgh Knights cannot contest the confirm from Tings either. So how much do they commit to this one? How much do they push in? It's a bait. Radiance come off the objective and look for the fight instead. And Neuma is low, but so is Adapting, who is forced to retreat thanks to the damage from Zatman. Zatman free casting on Aurora. Don't let him do it. On low. And Scary D in the back battling up against Cyclone Spin as Aurora gets the first kill on the Neo, but Zatman gets Finji. But it is two for one in favor of Radiance as they have taken care of Scary. Perfect pressure from Radiance, forcing them to push over to left, and they win the fight. 40 minutes in, every single death carries so much weight behind it, Finch. 55 seconds left on Scary. The same for Neoma. Radiance, sure, they traded out Benji, but they're in such a good position. They maintain their DPS. Cyclone Spin gonna shred the Fire Giant. Big Man Ting's gonna confirm it. If anyone has to die on the side of Radiance, Benji should be willing to do it. So it's a 4v3. I don't really see how Pittsburgh Knights, that a single frontliner, can come up here. So instead, they'll send Cubo Fred up. They are not completely giving up on this one. As the Fire Giant has indeed been pulled. Under the back is going to come Paul, but there's plenty of wards here for Radiance. They're going to know. Cubo Fred is walking right over one, so Radiance turn around. But they've got to be careful. Crush is there for the confirm. Cubo Fred won't commit, and Radiance get the objective. PK are just trying to run now. Yuvo saw the crush come through and knew that was the last of his opportunity, but a blink forward from Aurora should find the slow. It's going to be up to Paul to find the peel, but no, the heart bomb is going to be just enough. The rest of PK respawn. We get to do it again. Radiance, they siege the left-hand side. It's weakened forever. It's going to be much easier to clear it out this time around, but Benji without Fire Giant, that's worth noting. Yeah, he does not have it, so he's missing out on a lot of that sustain, looks like. Maybe ready to go take the primal food before they make their big push. PK can only hope to hold on to their base, but I don't know, man. This is where the Knights are comfortable. How many times have PK had to make these big late game Phoenix defenses? How many times have they had to hold on? The pressure really on Radiance to find a way to break through, to not get got by Paul yet again, who found a perfect push in from the, from the jungle last time and could easily do something similar again. This is Paul's second elixir of power, and he still has the shoes of focus. He yeah. could have more permanent buffs if he decides to just go for the true six slot, but instead, maybe he thinks this one's just a little bit better. He wants that scaling instantly for the Polynomicon, but it is a little bit surprising. If PK is this team that likes to take these games out long, you'd expect them to go for the more just confirmed damage output constantly. Instead, though, it's going to be the elixir of power, not only for him, but also for Cubo Fred. Their damage output, nothing to be sneezed at. Yeah, they've got five sets of boots still, have not invested yet into those elixirs of speed, and then replacing to get truly six slotted. Whereas on the other side for Radiance, they have all given up on their boots, as far as I can tell, and have moved on to those elixirs of speed as the Pittsburgh Knights have not. So we'll see if that makes a big difference for them. Still, they come back and grab this red buff. Not pushing just yet, still two minutes on the clock. How do you want Radiance to approach this? I would like to see them try and split the push ever so slightly. An already weaker defense from PK due to not having a traditional mage only gets weaker if they're able to split up the map. But instead, it looks like it's going to be a five-man grouping from Radiance on the weakened bird. Now they're just going to push right in. Neil Ma gets pushed back by that impale as well as the crush coming out from Tings. But Adapting's ultimate is already down, as is the blink for Neil Ma. You don't look to Adapting to taunt anymore. Cyclone Spin impales him right out of the nine turns blessing, but it doesn't matter. They've already created the space. Scary D goes forward and loses 80% of his health before he even realizes it. Blink and Thorns down. 
for PK Solar Laner. And look at Radiant, still topped off, still ready to move in and threaten this left side Phoenix. They've got it low. There's the Fields of Love to deter and force Radiant to pull the push further back. And the rest of the Knights can now swirl in. Paul looking to move to the back line. He finds a stun, and they get some big damage on the Tings. Following Cyclone. up his paw, he's done it all. And Cyclone Spin is removed. Cubo Fred right behind him, and now they can look for a Daphne. But Scary D has fallen in the back. Pittsburgh Knights are a little too spread out in this fight, and I don't think they can hold on as Paul falls to Benji, who gets the shutdown. Adapting against Cubo Fred and Myth, this game might just be over. Don't count about it. It's still the world champion duo from PK. They might be able to clutch this one. It's a four-man grouping from Radiance. Only Cyclone Spin dead. It's going to be slow going on this Phoenix. Yeah, they are not having the easiest time of burning this one down. But Adapting is pushing forward. Has Neil Ma locked down. But Radiance are running into some problems without Cyclone Spin here. They are not melting the Phoenixes. I thought maybe in a 4v2 they go right for the Titan. I thought they would as well, but instead they elect to go for the Phoenix. Only so get about 50%. Curious. It's a slow push, but look how much time they have to work with. Half a minute left on the nearest respawn for PK. So a roar moves in, Benji right behind him. They have the knock up, and Zach Man is forced all the way back to the fountain. They'll let Adapting take care of the middle Phoenix. And they're gonna back up. Myth, I am very surprised by the way that they have elected to go about this push. Yeah, it's been slow going for Radiance, but that's the thin margins these pros are used to playing on. Was that's, it that thin? That's the stakes, I suppose so. I told you already, world champion duo lane. You don't step to Neomon Zapman unless you come correct. And Radiance weren't feeling confident this time around. The tags in the name, world champion. You can't be coming to them unless you're 100% certain. Radiance, not this time, but they have gotten some small wins. Mid Phoenix down, left Phoenix down, Fire Giant respawning in 30 seconds. I don't think PK can step up the defense. No, they cannot. That play, though, that decision, if Radiance don't eventually win this game, that could certainly end up weighing on these guys, whether they could have potentially went for it. I mean, what is the particular punish? Also, there's only two, but Radiance will like to play this one cautiously, to hold on to as much of this lead as they can. You're never complaining with two Phoenixes down on the other side, with taking the Fire Giant almost for free. You don't hate this spot that you're in if you're Radiant at all. You don't, but there is the argument made that they're going to have to work through the defenses of PK one more time. They'd already done the majority of the work, but now PK, five strong, every ultimate up, the majority of the relics available to them as well. And Hugo Fred, deep in enemy territory, maybe looking for someone straggling. Fire Giant, one more time, goes the way of Radiance. This next fight should spell the end of the match. The third one of the game for Radiance in terms of their Fire Giant and their second enhanced of the game at that point as well. So now Radiance, all five members healthy, all five members with their relics, except for the blink from Benji. That'll be up in 30, likely in time for them to use it in this next fight, if they so choose. Meanwhile, on the right side, PK, it's a little bit of time for the Aegis and the Beards, but those will be up as well. So a full-on fight underneath this Titan. And it doesn't look like Radiance are planning on pushing into that right side. Phoenix, are they just going to look to push right into the Titan room? I think they should likely group up on the right Phoenix just to concentrate the defense of PK. Already you've got Fire Minion Waves leaking their way through two lanes. Those are going to push up naturally as time goes on. They've got three minutes to work with here. I think Radiance, they can do just about no wrong. That's the Sanguine special, Oni Fury into push. Now, PK, they're going to be spread incredibly thin across the map. Scary D has got to run the other direction back towards his team because this way, he's alone. There's no chance he lives. He's trying to distract Radiance to pull them away from the actual push. But they're just going to put Adapting on him. How do you like this decision from Scary? Well, at least Adapting's on him, right? I mean, that's just one last person working on the push. But Scary you know, D too? has been huge in this engagement. If Adapting keeps chasing, maybe Hugo would be able to pick up the kill. But instead, look at this grouping Zapman on the opposite side of the map. Radiance, they got a free bird. I don't know about any of this late game decision making here, but isn't it working out for Radiance? How can you complain when they have all three Phoenixes down? Almost never can you return from this position in competitive. Aurora blinks in, Scary D with no B, just the target, what? and he gets dunked by I'm a monster. What a play between Aurora and Big Man Tings as they set this one up. Aurora now a little bit low, has the heart bomb on him as they commit everything it takes to make sure that he falls. Only four left standing to defend. They're gonna go all over the left side, Phoenix. I've never seen a game this thorough in my life. <laughs> Let that be a masterclass on why you pick up Sunder as support. Scary D wrongfully thought he had defense and he instantly gets shredded. Adapting will move in from the left. 
Ra Radiant have done more than dot their I's and cross their T's. You cannot get more formal or more complete than what they have elected to do here as they show Pittsburgh Knights every bit of respect that the world champs have earned. It looks like they're going to wait and maybe even take this mid Phoenix once it respawns as they continue to hold in this formation. Half a minute until Scary D responds. And after he moves in, take some poke, but the whole squad is here as they finally move into the Titan room. There's the taunt. Neil Maw is the target. He goes right into the ultimate, and that does buy him some time. Aurora moves in as Zetman is incredibly low, but still makes it back to the fountain as Paul retreats as well. But the Titan will become the target here at this point. It's down to half HP. Aurora pulls everybody back in. And that is it, Radiance, making sure they get it done to improve to 2-1. Look, we thought that maybe in a battle of attrition, PK would have the edge every single time. Radiance can do it too. They'll take it as far as you want. That's got to be so mentally draining for yeah. both of these teams. This is a battle of endurance. It's a triathlon. They got to run the entire gambit if they want to be able to win this set. It is a full-on gauntlet. And who, what was taking away this game? The Aphrodite yes, and sir. Radiance find the win. Is that a big difference maker for you? It absolutely is. I mean, Paul does find a triple kill. Hard to fault the He's man still on nuts. the defense. He still <laughs> absolutely pops off. He only dies one time in that match, if even. Look, Aphrodite is hard to deal with. But I think you might be able to just remove the word Afro and put the word Paul in instead. Well, Radiance now have the 2-1 advantage with a higher-seeded team win. Let's find out after the break.
Well, Radiance managed to take the advantage this time around. Up two to one over the Knights now as they're looking to potentially knock out the reigning world champs. But before we get into that, we want to know how you're enjoying this thing at home. You're sitting around, you're comfortable. You either got pets, friends, something going on for you. Maybe some people I saw cooking earlier. Hashtag SWC at home is the way to get featured on the broadcast. Speaking of pets, a nice little kitty cat coming through and making sure getting their pets and attention just as much as these smite games deserve their attention being able to come through and that's okay i wasn't expecting that <laughs> i said pets and we're gonna keep rolling the bird making sure what parrot that comes through to make yeah. sure that he is going to be a little more visible shout than out anything going on in the background and there's my lovely wife sitting around i think she jacked my chair for that too she's sitting she's looking <laughs> comfy in front of it in her loki cosplay Absolutely stunning and gorgeous from her. And speaking of chairs, I mean, you can see the Maxonomic right there. Looks comfortable enough for someone like Loki to sit in. I assume you at home could also sit in a nice Maxonomic chair. Well, Needforseat.com. Make sure you go use code SMITEMAX. Either way, this is going to be a really good one. You get nice colors like the black and gold behind me. You could technically root for the Knights if you want to, but, you know, make sure you root for whichever team you're most comfortable with. And this reigning world championship team. They pushed it back from the brink of the edge last year, pushed it back from the brink of the edge yesterday, and now they're right back in that seat. They have one win under their belts, and they've been able to keep this one close. Even that game was close, but Agro, Radiance pulled ahead there, and it's weird because I don't have much to say about Radiance. I just wrote Paul. <laughs> Man, Paul was playing so well in so many really, really close fights in this game, and I think that one of the things that can oftentimes go underappreciated by the casual Smite fan or even the Smite fan that hasn't played a lot of competitive Smite in their past, is that when fights are close, but always seem to go one way or the other, like it was for Radiance, like all these close fights just kept going in Radiance's favor, that's almost always because of your front line. Your front line yeah. doing something well, and, and I've got to give a ton of credit to Benji in this game. Benji has been absolutely incredible all game long. Radiance had so many of these quick, bursty fights really set up by adapting in big man tings. I thought those two worked really, really well together in this game. But the backline peel provided a lot of the time, the way that these backliners were getting help from Aurora and from Benji and from adapting in the space that Benji was able to create in the late stages of the game. Guan Yu just does not scale late very well. He just gets killed in the midst of that horse, and we saw that a lot in this game. I mean, you mentioned the front line. I also think Aurora deserves a, a massive shout-out because yep. there were so many times, I mean, how many I'm a Monsters after Aurora ulting did we get to see? Like, that's the dream when you're playing Sully. You go into a casual game, someone locks in Ares in your arenas, you know what you're looking for. You're burning the beads the first time, and then you're pulling them together for your mage the second time, and Aurora did that wonderfully. Look at that. A great slash line. 2-3, 12 assists, 11 up there for Benji with his 4 and 2KD beside that one. Both of those front lines, like you said, deserving of a lot of respect. Same thing on the other sides. Neil, I, I think Cuvo as well. But we had the one big question mark going into that, which was adapting. And Erlong? It didn't seem like a mix that would really, really mesh together, but he played the setup really well. He did, and, and that's exactly what we needed from him. You're, if you're going to be playing Erlong, you have to be the setup guy. Not to say that you can't come in late, kill everybody, but that's more of an early game Erlong Shen thing, not a late game Erlong Shen thing. And for adapting to add another wrinkle into a very storied career right on, a, on his final run, fitting. The dude's been able to do it his whole career, whatever way is necessary of him. He does it well on the Erlong Shen in this game. I think that Radiance just really handled that Morgan as well as they could in the late game. I mean, Paul makes that one flank, it's that triple in mid. Yeah. That was PK's last real chance. I think PK didn't have the clear shot call at that time. I mean, you see Scary D come sprinting out of the base in order to come and join a mid-Phoenix Siege that he's really never going to be able to get to in time. That meant that PK didn't push out that left wave enough, which then meant that the next enhanced fire giant for Radiance was a little bit easier for them to get. I don't think PK even contested on that. PK's map macro wasn't as clean in this game as it has been le like yesterday mm -hmm. up against SSG and... Little things like that, those moments where, hey, we made a big play, we decided them, what are we doing? Or we, you know, we got four, we got four of them, Benji was the only one, only one alive. What are we doing with this time? That's where the great teams 
get their wins. They don't make mistakes in that zone. And I think that was a small mistake from PK that really ended up having some pretty big results. And I will say this, if there's any team right now, like in mental elasticity, the ability to just snap back and not tilt, PK is PK. definitely in that conversation. So no doubt. I, I think you could see it. Having a, a conversation there in the live cams, they're talking to each other, trying to figure out what did we do wrong? What, like, how do we fix that? What was the issue? And, you know, discussing that through because they don't want it to happen this game. And that's the big threat. So far, Ra, Cupid, and this Guan Yu going to get banned away on the side of the Knights. It's a Yemoja, an Aphrodite, and a Ymir getting banned away on the side of Radiance. And so first pick, first come, first serve. It's Scylla. She looked good for Big Man last game. She's looked good for Paul every time he's had her. I think this is going to be more of the same. 75% win rate across eight picks. That means six out of eight. That's really good. I know that, that Ven played at one earlier, I think, today. So... You really know that that's been uh, really, really clean for these PK and Radiant squads. And that does leave open for Stephanie and giving Benji that Kukulin again. I mean, how could you not? This dude has looked like vintage Benji, season four-esque for sure. <laughs> it's something you got to be scared of overall. Although I think worth noting, last time we had that Kukulin come through, I think at least two games ago, didn't quite get the win. So it is something at least that Knights have shown case they can manage. This Persephone I want to talk about a little more, though. We got to see Sanguine pick her up uh, uh, pretty often. We've seen her come through with a decent win rate here in Worlds, but... She's not been picked or banned as much as I would expect. I mean, after what we saw in Phase 2, after what we've seen all year, she's mm. just kind of been thrown to the wayside. We finally get to see her. Is she going to be able to be this big mid laner up against the Scylla? She definitely can be. She has a little bit more lockdown, a little bit yeah. less burst potential. And Persephone damage is, it's hard to describe and play against. And I think that's one of the reasons why <laughs> she's really good, because sometimes it feels really bursty. Sometimes it feels lengthy with the one. The Bone Rush ends up being a long poke ability, but then the two damage can come out quickly if you're underneath her, but delayed and hard to see sometimes if you're away from her. Persephone's a unique mage, and it's one of the reasons why she's been so heavily prioritized in these really, really top-tier player hands. For this game in particular, Big Man is oftentimes going to be looking to use his ultimate against whatever Fred and Scary are picking because no Guan Yu this time around for Scary. He's going to get his pick of the litter because Radiance instead decide to ban away Fred Gods. Wonder what they're going to pick to try and dive this Persephone effectively because that's really the key. Being able to follow that leap and then not stress about the ultimate. So usually you need someone with mobility and CC immunity and that can limit your picks a bit. Well, I was thinking uh, of actually this exact pick, someone who has the ability to close the gap and can get some CC immunity, Robin, who we just oh, saw Kivo play and has come. had a pretty good weekend on. 40% win rate, though, on the Robin. Maybe not the best thing you want when you lock it in. So uh, Jungler adapting, going to be taking that one as opposed to Kivo Fred. But Kabraken being locked in here, pretty good against Sobek and Hachiman, but it's the first time we get to see a Roar play because PK have been so, well, adamant about banning it. For good reason. This is a signature Aurora pick, and we saw what he did on the Ares, which is one another one of his signature picks. It's not great against Asilla, obviously. She has that Sentinel to get under those walls and <laughs> escape that ultimate, but you still have a great lock-in potential against the Hachiman right as he's hopping on that mounted archery in order to get away. You lock him in, and you're going to feel pretty good about your chances. Now, set... Oh, and Ratatoskar. Okay, I just throw everything I was about to say out the window. I was going to say he's been banned a whole ton, but he had a very abysmal win rate. Wow, here set. really? Has not been picked up too often, Ratatoskar. And now a Freya hover? I mean, Radiance, this is something Cyclone Spin played a lot, but that's we're talking Ring of Hakate meta pre-mid-season phase one discussion. We're not talking in phase two, except for maybe a few times overall. Is she someone that could work well? I mean, with Kabraken as well? When you think of Freya, I think everyone kind of thinks of Fun Baller as a big Freya player. Yeah. I mean, it, you think about a couple different players throughout Smite's history. Cyclone Spin Freya is one of the best Freyas of all time. You think of their run, the Season 5, there for Splice. Part of that insane the draft games. they got Game 5, I think, was part of that Freya. But he decides to switch it up and go to the Chernabog. And this is a pick that brings hmm. some similar things to the Apollo. Think about how... Cyclone was playing that Apollo split pushy and then getting to the fight and landing near his own team in order to set up. If you're going to do that. Isn't Chernabog just kind of better because you don't <laughs> have to worry about using your ultimate for damage in the first place. That ultimate brings more utility. You get to the fight mm -hmm. much more quickly than something like that Apollo. And I think of Chernabog as one of the safer hunters in the game, especially against someone like a Ratatoskr, where if he's hovering over you, 
you can use that into darkness, go into a wall, and buy far more time for your front line to come back and help you. So here's the fun shuffle then. We've got Set and Ratatosker. Yeah. We have seen both in the solo lane. Ratatosker for Fine OK earlier, set by most solo laners. Well, also Fine OK, actually, notably. I'll just use him as both examples because it's a lot easier. In the regular season, which do you prefer over there? I mean, either can really go over there. I think they can both flex in the jungle as well. But do you have a preference which one you'd send over? Before this tournament, I would have said I'd prefer Rat Jungle set solo. Um, but, but with how successful Fine and Variety were with this pick, I, I think I'd prefer the Ratatosker in the solo lane. The only, the only problem that I think I have with this PK draft, if you do have set jungle, is that in the majority of the fights, you're not going to have a lot of beads burners. And so Neil's oftentimes going to be using that charge prey only to get it beads out, and all of a sudden he's caught in a bad spot, locked in by that Kabrakan. I think that even when the Ratatoskr joins the fray in the late game, when Sobek is usually that fantastic initiator who can break these stalemates around these objectives, you're not going to be able to let Neil be that aggressor because everyone's going to have their Magi's or their Beads. There isn't a lot of Beads burning at all on the Pittsburgh Knights. Now, if someone doesn't have Beads, their all-in potential is fantastic. You've got a Pluck straight into a Hachiman stun, straight into Sikkim, straight into death. You know, it's not like that there isn't any CC whatsoever, but a lot of it is shorter range, low confirm rate CC that you're not going to be able to pull easily in team fights. I'd expect to see some Magi's cloaks for the frontliners in this game of Radiance. Give yourself that bubble. Make sure you're not going to get plucked. And I don't really know what you have to be that scared of, especially if it's Rat Solo, who's not going to be going for that acorn that gives him the wider stun radius. Yeah. He's going to go Thick Bark. So he's going to be more tanky and less focused on that range stun. And, I mean, when you're looking at it, especially if you remove that stun like you just highlighted, if it does go over to the solo lane, I mean, Kukulun's got really good engage. Man, Persephone seems to have good... Well, oh, but so does Zaka Bracken and the Robin. Like, the only person who maybe doesn't have the best engage is Chernabog, but then you just ult and let your team engage on them. Like, you don't have to worry yep. about it. It feels like Radiance are going to maybe dictate the pace of this fight and all of these fights, this game maybe, from uh, the get-go, especially with Scylla... Is there enough in the early game here for the Knights to try and find an advantage? I mean, we haven't really been looking. The first 10 minutes of these games hasn't been the crucial moments. It's been 20-plus minutes in before either of these teams take a lead. And that's not a surprise based on how these two teams have played coming up to this tournament. I, I don't think that we are going to see one of these teams really try and crack the game open in the first 10 minutes. That being said, PK has the better tools just based on whoever they have in the jungle, I think, has a better chance to get the snowball rolling. Robin's a great early game jungler, don't get me wrong, but a fed Robin, I'm not like, oh, you know, I, I can die at any given time. He doesn't have that mobility across the map like someone yeah. like Set or Ratatosker has. He doesn't have that chase potential like someone or, like Set or Ratatosker has. And he doesn't scale as well as Set or Ratatosker, I feel like, do in that mid to late game. Rat just having that semi-global pressure at all times means that even if he isn't one-shotting me off that alt, even though you can if you build full damage, he puts so much more pressure on you into the stage of the late game than someone like Robin. Well, now the Sobek Hachiman, like, I, I think that's something we've already seen and has done decently well enough that you're not too stressed about it. Kabrakin Chernabog, that's going to be the interesting one. But guys, there are eight world champions in this matchup. Depending on how this goes, only four will be left. Let's see if Radiance can pull out ahead. Let's move into game number four then. The current advantage sits with Radiance. Let's see if they can maybe find a way to close this out. Our Pittsburgh Knights can yet again find a way to extend a set and maybe move on into the finals. And then who knows what could happen for any one of these squads. Obviously, so Finch and Mifflin. And still Doug making sure we can see everything that is going on. Mifflin, in this one, you heard them talking about how maybe this Robin won't quite be able to match up with where Kiva Fred could be on this rat later on. But also that we might not see this pace really pick up any from what we've seen in other games. Do you want to see a change, or are we going to be in the same spot we were in before? Look, I love fast games, Finch. I mean, ghost gaming for me, that's idyllic smite, right? When you're able to run it down in 25 minutes apiece. But I really do like these calculated chess, 4D chess, okay? Yeah. You don't go to 50 minutes without me saying 4D to quantify the chess. But this is a much different look for both teams. It's going to yeah. be a completely different feel in this match because of one defining characteristic. No more healers. Sustain doesn't exist. It's time to fight. Yeah, no Guan Yu, none of the take a little bit of poke, come back into the fight again. I mean, if they do go for those poke battles, they're probably just going to end up leaving afterwards because, as you said, they don't have those same options for sticking around in the fights like the way that we might see in some of those other games. So it is going to be the set for Scary D here in, here in solo. We've seen sets in the jungle for the most part, but you also see them over here in solo. 
how do you like it in here in Scary D's hands, and, and what's he looking to do? I'm expecting early rotation. Set's got some of the best lockdown possible for the aggressive play style, but... I, I think it's interesting. I mean, the deaths seemed to think it was going to be the Red Attasker out of the soul lane for the additional sustain and the ability to bully in and fight up against this Gakulin. Set, not really as much. He's going to be under a lot of threat in this lane, at least through the early levels, because of exactly what we're seeing right now. Benji in that transform state, there's no way for Set to deal with that. No, not at all. I mean, very few feel comfortable fighting Gakulin when he's in that form. There's very few places where this set, at least early, can afford to keep up with what Binks is going to be able to do. But later on in the game, that Bruiser-esque build we'll see from him could certainly cause some problems for Tings, for Cyclone Spin. But you heard the way they talked about Cyclone Spin's Chernabog on the desk as one of the safest hunters, a pretty safe hunter, who can use the ability to dash into walls or go up into the sky and retreat as an option here. How do you feel about Chernabog at this point? We really haven't seen much of him. I think it's interesting. Aggro already highlighted on the desk in that every single time we saw the Apollo Ultimate go through, every time he went into the air, he was landing next to his team as Cubo Fred finds a stun in mid, should fizzle out there. He would always land next to his team instead of drilling for these aggressive dunks that we saw from Zatman or we see from Barracuda. But Chernobog doesn't have that option. He's got to land on the shadows that are spawned. Sure, you're getting the additional utility, the, the global slow on the enemy comp, but it's not nearly as safe as Apollo. He's always gonna know, or the enemy team's always gonna know exactly where he's landing. He's either coming to one of us, or he's going right back where he left from, right? And you can play around that certainly if you're on the side of Pittsburgh Knights. How about having a Scylla Crush waiting for him or something like that? If he doesn't want to run into someone else's waiting arms. Maybe gonna be a bit difficult for Psycho Spin to navigate this, but he's played this Chernobog certainly before. Something we know that he's comfortable with and he can't perform with. You saw the Freya highlighted for a minute there on the desk. Chills. Would you have liked to see that one come out here in this critical game? Look, this deep into the set, I'm sure Radiance do not want to go to a game five situation. <laughs> Freya is a very strong pick, has the potential to absolutely dominate a lobby, especially when a player like Cyclone Spin is piloting her. But she's so easily punishable in the early game. Yep. The Valkyrie's discretion really, her only get out of jail safe free card. I think that this is a much safer pick. It's going to fit the play style that we've seen. But with every match going 40, 50 minutes, not much scales better than a Freya. I think it might have been pretty cool. It might not have been a bad look here. And we know Psycho Spin. They mentioned Psycho Spin is one of those Freya players. Netroid comes to my mind as well. But it's those two guys as, as being able to pilot at a high level here in the SPL. So it might have been fun to see it come out. But uh, alas, it is not to be. So we find ourselves just under four minutes into this contest. Three blinks for Radiance. Only two on the side of Pittsburgh Knights. The early beads and Scary D, I wonder if that kind of speaks to what you were talking about. He's under pressure in solo even and needs the safety. Yeah, I think that's exactly what it is. He's also worried about the gank potential, right? Set, not nearly as safe as something like a Guan Yu, like he's been playing the entirety of the set. If adapting rotates over and he finds the root, should be pretty easy to lock down this guy. So the beads is a very smart pickup early on, but it's also gonna dampen his ability to rotate out of lane, not like a blink. Or like a thorn, something that'll make it much easier for him to sit on the back line. I think it's a, a double-edged sword here. Sure, you're more survivable, but you're also cutting your ability to frag out. Well, it sounds like he's happy with being parked over in solo as Neil and Kivo Fred I'm making some rotations over to the right side. In fact, Neil looks like he wants to come underneath, but Benji is back under the tower. There's the knock-up. He gets the knock-up of his own, has some dodges, but nowhere near enough. A three-man rotation to right. Net PK first blood. Scary D. He's been playing with fire the entire set. Makes it out of there. One more tower shot. Would have been able to return the kill. Benji, it's got to be upsetting. Is this the third game in a row we see a three-man rotation <laughs> in the early game into his lane? It's Last kind of time a compliment, around. really. Right? Yeah, my, they got, I live in their head rent free. That's what Benji's <laughs> saying right now. I'm sure he's not too worried about it, especially considering Scary D has to split that wave three ways as, or three ways as well. So even the lead that they get off that is going to be cut. Going to be a bit mitigated in. Kind of to your point, Radiant still hold a small gold lead. To be fair, that's the kind of small gold lead that PK has enjoyed in every start of the game as there's the tectonic shift, but Zatman leaves cleanly one dash, and he never thinks about that ult. And Zatman's been really patient with his relics all day long. I don't expect that to change here. Look, you play Smite for eight years, you know when you're in danger, right? <laughs> and Zatman not in danger in that situation, not when he's got plays like that one. Holds on to the ultimate, holds on to the bead. So now he does not have to be worried about subsequent ganks. So Roar, on the other hand, losing out on his ultimate, the 3v3 in mid, you're not gonna be really able to win that until that's backed up. So now Radiance probably gonna be spinning their wheels for another 40 or so seconds. Yeah, 
can't afford to get active, at least not on Aurora's behalf, in a world where he does not have that ultimate on his side. So instead, we'll see him kind of play a little bit back. As we've kind of seen all set so long, I don't think that we should be really surprised at all if maybe there's a couple of ganks, maybe a kill or two, as we've already gotten first blood. But kind of like they said on the desk, this game's going to be decided much later in the game, 20, 25 minutes in or so. So this game, this point in the game is all about setting them up for that later point in the game when they know it's contested, but keep up threat. In danger getting collapsed on, not in any danger at all. One quick dart, and he's out of there. He's already got the Thistlethorn Acorn available to him, so now he's got the additional Acorn Blast, making it much easier to land those stuns. I want to see Cuvo get involved early on, but I've been saying the same thing about both junglers throughout this set. It seems like the pace here really is looking for that 12-minute mark for the objective. Yep. Cuvo completely surrounded. My man's got Yeejer still in his back pocket. Hop on a branch, get out of that situation, Scott free. That's what all Radiance could have been looking for, though, right? Was to at least force that ultimate out of him. Now, without beads, maybe if there's a perfect CC chain, they can have the damage. But more than likely, Cuvo Fred escapes there once he realizes that there is some danger. So they got what they wanted. That ultimate's out from him, and Cuvo Fred's a bit slower. But kind of as you were saying, there's not been a ton of early pressure throughout this game. So even stealing that ult from him may be not quite as valuable as it would be in a game that were paced a little bit faster than this one or a set paced a bit faster. He might not have been looking for much anyway. Uh, it seems like farming is the name of the game at this point. PK are kind of enjoying, or maybe not so much enjoying, a 1,000 gold deficit as Radiance <laughs> yeah, has been not. playing the neutral game a little bit better this time around. But we're starting to approach that time, the double digits, the 10-minute mark, 10 to 12 minutes, has really been the marker for when these teams start to group up around the gold fury. And this time around, it's not nearly as cut and dry. Scylla still has the heaviest hitting ability in the map as Grasp of Death hits the wall and no one else. I'm going to say one thing real quick before I talk about the Craft of Death. This game, the games have not been just staring at each other, low action. There have been invades, there have been attempts, for sure. These two teams are trying for early advantages, but they're both really strong and they just don't quite materialize. Also, Persephone has not had a good event, has she? I mean, certainly she's had some stuff there, but I feel as though we've seen a lot of Grasp of Deaths not hit home. Yeah, it's, a, it's not the easiest ability to land. These pro players are always trying to min-max their game. You want the maximum damage, you gotta hit an enemy god. That thing is slow moving. You could dodge it very easily in big man things. Is trying his best to land it. I think the best Persephone we've seen all week was likely out of Shinto, consistently putting out the majority of damage for his team. But big man things is a guy who is very consistent on this god. He's been yeah, playing it throughout the entire more. year. I mean, get them one miss out of the way early. <laughs> you're not gonna see him anymore. Not at all, not from this guy. As big man things has been elite this year. I don't think I would have said that at the start of this year, right? I, I wouldn't have said Radiance had an elite mid laner at their disposal as Neomar goes to the block, adapting, what? takes so much damage from the crush, and you shall not escape. And now Cubo Fred moves in, Tings is the target, those beads are forced, but Cubo Fred won't find much more. Another kill, plus the beads taken from the mid laner. Paul had the Alma Monsters lined up for adapting's ultimate either way, even if the tower shot doesn't finish him off. My man was dead to rights, no overhead kick available means that he's just going to die every single time. Fantastic pluck from Neoma, recognizing the opportunity and setting up PK pretty well. Radiance, though, still going to be in the gold lead. They've been putting pressure on some of these buffs. The red buff in particular has had Radiance's name all over it. Likely part of the reason why they still enjoy a nice lead for themselves. But clearly, the combo is working. Scylla is absolutely here. Zap. Zapman's caught out. There's the tectonic shift. But he responds with the ult right into Ting's hands. And Grasp of Death is there. How about three kills in the first ten for this game four? Yeah, Radiance trying to match the pace that PK is setting here. We already said it. BMT ain't going to miss many more. Slams the Zap one with the Grasp of Death. Well, Benji should keep going. He's got the rage transformation coming. And Scary D cannot hope to survive. Cupo Fred. Would love to find a way to close the gap, but he does not have Blink. He already used the dart. Then he gets away with the kill and makes it back to safety. And what about this adjustment in the page? Now Radiance are going to go right to the Gold Fury. Nothing like what we've seen up to this point. Three members of PK are in soul lane, by the way. Benji, solo, scary D. Two members of PK say, bro, you just wait like three seconds. We'll be there. Unfortunately, though, Benji, simply built different, able to find that one easily in the early game and walks out in style. And look at this difference in build between these two soul laners. Berserker's shield coming through from Scary D. He wants to be able to fight constantly using those auto attacks. Whereas on the other hand, Benji with a, a bit, or mystical mail as well as the exhaust, his second ability, it's going to be constant yellow numbers popping up. Only one nearby to stop this pyro is going to be Paul. But can he afford to get up any closer? Or says no. 
and Radiance add on to their lead. About 3,000 gold out in front, one of the largest early game leads we have had all set. Perhaps Radiance not liking these 50-minute coin tosses. I want to try and get out in front early. Look, I mean, if PK is the king of the endurance war, Radiance doesn't want to go there again. It's a, it's a, a battle of asphyxiation, isn't it? It feels suffocating how long these matches have been going. It's whether or not you're able to play perfectly for 58 uninterrupted minutes. Three times. One mistake three times. It's not easy. Radiance trying to keep it up here. Neil Ma setting up the red buff invade. Paul and Zatman are here. So great work there by the order side team to move in, but adapting is aggressive. I'm telling you, this is a different Radiant squad. Ulting in, looking to punish Neil Ma, but I think Neil has escaped. Grasp of Death doesn't get there in time, but Zatman has to use the ultimate. They force some cooldowns. Yeah, Zatman does get caught by that Grasp of Death. The ultimate is used, but he does maintain the relic. Down, actually, as Big Man Tings caught in mid. Scary D picks up the kill. But he did manage to get them low, so that means Cyclone Spin can come in with a hope. But Zatman elsewhere has got a kill and adapting, but Benji puts down Cubo for red. I don't know how Scary D is still alive, but Benji is looking to rectify that situation shortly. They have sent Scary D back towards Aurora, but Neil and Zapper here. Good work. And Scary D is out. Two for one trade in favor of the Knights, but it seems like Radiance went out on the pressure trying to invade out this red buff. Not quite able to strip it away, but they do take the small camps. The mid tower, on the other hand, that's gonna big. go the way of Radiance so early on. That's huge map pressure loss for PK. Gold Fury, Pyromancer. Now there's nowhere to retreat to. These fights need to be won cleanly by PK. And they don't have the sustain that they're used to either, right? So PK have got to make sure they brace themselves for a different type of pace that Radiance are bringing right now at this point in the game. Good invade, though. It was that man and Neil. They'll steal away the purple buff and even leave a BM small camp up. That is absolutely toxic. I can't believe <laughs> it. I mean, Radiant just showed them the goodwill of clearing out that red buff on their own. Even when they don't get the buff, PK, leave up the small. These guys are <laughs> rude. I guess that's a good point. They made sure that red buff spawned again on Radiance, didn't they? They, they sure got a little did. bit of farm for it at the very least. Now the tower, a little bit weak on the duo hand side of the map, but it seems like PK not really going to risk this one. They don't want to worry about that rotation adapting has been playing this much more aggressive style the entire set. We said it earlier, it's not really his MO, is it? That tanky bruiser shame. frontliner, but now he's doing the Robin. I think it's really him trying to step up the plate and make sure that he wins it. You think Adapting wants another one, huh? I feel the same way. This guy trying to take his destiny to his own hands as Benji secures his own blue buff up against Scary, or at least tries to as Neil Ma becomes the target, Adapting up downs with the ultimate, but with that slow there, he gives up the chase. They come back to their own red. Make sure they take that one as well. But once again, the Knights are on the chaos side of the map, stripping farm. Radiance have had a great pace, but PK have not shied away from it. They really haven't. They've got the kill lead. They've been able to find these engagements going their way. I mean, if, even though Radiance has got the gold lead and even a little bit of experience, actually experience dead even. Nice pickup there, Doug. It seems like PK is starting to shift the pace a little bit. The power balance is starting to tip a little bit more so in favor of the order side, whereas you felt like, or at least I did, Radiant should be setting the pace almost exclusively. They've got a Cabracken out of support, one of the most aggressive lockdowns you can have, as well as a Robin out of the jungle. But so far, it feels like PK has been doing a little bit more. They have been keeping even with them. Let's do a little bit of an item roundup. Cyclone's been going into a heavy crit build. It's fail not. It looks like he wants that Wind Demon right behind it. Meanwhile, Aurora has a favorite of his in the Stone of Binding right behind the Gauntlet of Thebes. So they've got a great thing going with this dual lane. Some aggression, some damage they're available for them. If they go to the fight, they will be slinging. And Cyclone Spin, instead of going for the traditional Aegis, picks up the shell for yep. his team. Now that auto attack focus draft from PK, Zapman, and Scary D yep. are going to be struggling to burn through Cyclone Spin. And because he doesn't have Aegis, it means he pops Shell. He can remain fighting. It doesn't put him in that non-combat state. I really think that's a smart pickup. Oh, but look at this. Radiance are here for this Gold Fury spawn. Both solo laners are up there near the blue buff battling it out. So if this happens, it'll be a four on four. But Radiance not interested. They had the grouping. Didn't like what they saw, so they gave it up and moved right back to mid. 
Yeah, they have to play around Cuvo Fred. They want to keep eyes on him at all times. That semi-global is going to be so detrimental to the back line of Radiance. I think it's right that they back up there and get ready for the fight. Adapting has to use the ultimate to defensively avoid getting rooted. But there's so many members here that where can he go? Grasp of Death makes his way through. It does catch Paul, but Scary D is still in Adapting. He needs some assistance. There's the shell, but Adapting can't just make his pathway in. Cubo Fred drops and gets the kill. So much chase, and Adapting never gets to live. Benji on the chaser, Cubo, no ultimate available. Cyclo has been using his own ult and picks up the kill. That's a huge one to make it one for one in favor of, well, not in favor of anyone, it's one for one, but to tie it back up for Radiance over the wall. Paul does not hit the ultimate, but I like to try. So with both junglers down at this point, I don't know that we'll see much more action on this. Maybe right back to farming. Look, I think that if anything, Radiant's in a very good spot here if they want to try and force a fight on the gold for you. Adapting for Cuvo is huge value for him. My man is three levels down, a Mr. Kennet. So you want to be using this time while you've got a slight lead. So they bait the Fury and instead go for the fight. Benji pops the thorns. But cannot lock down Paul or Zapman. Meanwhile, Neil evades Big Man Ting. So right back going to the Fury, go Radiant. Neil, Zap, scary. And Paul making their way back in. They don't want to give this up for free, but Neil this time has been rooted. This time Neil Ma's in trouble, but Scary D makes it to the back line and deletes Scary D. Pittsburgh PK. Knights get the Primal Fury as well. And now they've got a chance to lock down Aurora. Scary D stepping up for them, though they do lose that man as Scary gets the triple. And they're going to not stop there. Cubo looking for things, and he absolutely finds a BK from the Brink. We thought Radiance was going to get the gold. We're just wrong. Scary D was allowed a free cast for 15, 20 uninterrupted seconds. That's huge. Just a tough, tough fight there for Radiance. They thought they'd push the Knights out twice in a row, but really the Knights were just waiting for an opportunity to re-engage. The overcommit onto Neil at the start gets adapting, punished, and the fight looks bad from there, man. Radiant now on the back foot. The game's still not entirely out of their hand, only about 500 lead for Pittsburgh Knights, but it's got to be feeling a lot different now that you just lost that fight so handily. That's crazy. Four for one and a gold for and it's still a completely even match. Radiance was so far ahead that can't feel good to have their lead immediately cut as Cuvo goes up in the air. Cyclone Spin uses his own ultimate. He's in trouble. Cyclone Spin goes into the wall. He makes their way out of there but has to give up the purple. You saw the, the gap, the disparity between gold and experience as now the Pyromancer are going to go down for PK alongside the invades coming out from Cubo Fred. So take a look back. This is Scary D going off. He's just able to hover around the back line of this fight. I mean, that, that's free right there. My man just tremors the entire time. Those auto attacks easy to land and adapting, but you can't step up when you're that low level. No chance he was going to be able to contest on that one. Got a good fight from Scary D, who has been such an impact player for the Pittsburgh Knights all week since they were SK, just as long as they've been together. He has been a big part of everything that this team has done well and even doing it here again on the biggest possible stage. So as we said, a small need for Pittsburgh Knights that have gotten bigger, about 2,000 gold now they're out in front, and the experience deficit is huge. Look how far back adapting is, and they've got about a one-level lead everywhere else. So Radiant's going to have to play this a bit more careful now. They should, and then PK, now is the time to start pushing this advantage. Scary D is massive at this point. He's a tanky frontliner. His damage output is really hard to contend with. If he's able to set up, he might be able to just 1v1 big man Tings on cooldown, especially considering the build Tings decides to go for. We've seen a lot of these Persephones lock in and pick up things like Sovereignty or just some straight-up defense items to contend with the dive. PK, dive in spades, big man Tings not showing very much respect. No, he's got to make sure that he is giving some respect over his income the Knights in enemy territory, at least Cuvo and Neil. I think likely looking for a red buff invade at this point. They have pushed Radiance back as Zapman takes tier one tower in left. This pressure from PK is great as they absolutely do take that red buff uncontested from Radiance. And Zapman even putting a little bit of pressure onto this tier two in left with backup looming. Though Zapman does come out the worst for that trade. Yeah, Zapman likely doesn't win the 1v1 up against Cyclone Spin just because of the build difference. Cyclone Spin elected to pick up that crit means that he's going to be swinging for the fences for 500 damage for every single crit. Whereas Zatman, a little bit more so focused towards that tank shred. He wants to be able to deal with Aurora. He wants to deal with Benji adapting. So it makes sense that there's that slight disparity there. But even then, he needs to know Cyclone Spin is not to be trifled with. Not at all. He is swinging. Big Man Tings has the glow about him. Did he pick up a potion or 
that is an effect I'm overlooking. He's ready for battle either way, though they do end up losing that mid tier one tower. The only one they have left is the tier one tower over in Solo, which is hanging on by a thread. A minion takes that down. So if I'm Radiance, I'm really not putting much stock in it. No, that's not even worth putting up a soft defense around. But look at this grouping from Radiance. It feels like to me they think PK is likely going to be going for the Fire Giant or trying to push their lead somewhere around there. But it's only about 3,000. It's not enough to feel confident going for the most important neutral objective on the map. And instead, PK showed their hand with Zapman on the left side showing up on those minions. They're going back to this neutral state trying to find some sort of advantage to push them into a position where they can go for the win. Now, right now, they still have to go about this a bit slowly. They cannot afford to head over towards fire and make a mistake that gets Radiance back in. And there are no safer neutral objectives to look for at this point either, as you covered already with Fury and Pyromancer down here at this point. So they'll be going about this one a little bit more slowly, just kind of waiting for their next opportunity to force Radiance into yet another awful position. And once they do, I mean, when does Radiance have to make their stand? Can they afford to contest a Fury or a Pyro? Or do they have to fight on Fire Giant or Bust? I think it's, they're likely going to group up around this Oni Fury or once it respawns in about 15 seconds. It's 3,000 gold. It's a decent amount of experience. But because of the draft that Radiance have here and because of how large Benji is already almost in direct parity with Scary D, I think he should be able to at least disrupt the backline, make sure that Paul is able to follow up properly. If Radiance survived the initial dive of Cubo, Fred, and Scary D, then it's time to gas pedal. They're starting off with damage on the Neil Maw. There's the ultimate as well, but Neil lived through it all with that ultimate. Great work from him to get away from Aurora's tectonic shift and even the tremors on the back end. So that's ult for ult. Paul's ultimate down as well. Maybe Radiance have a bit of a shot here after all. That is a huge loss. The armor monster not only going to be a fantastic confirmation tool on the objective itself, but also just a great way to finish off some of these kills. Big Man Tings maintains his grasp of death. This is going to be a good opportunity <laughs> for Radiance to move forward. Even a little bit more farm has been stolen away. Kivo Fred moves in and strips away that alpha, denying adapting even a little bit more chance to try and close that gap a bit. Now the only fear started, Zapman is on it. Has some help from Paul, who can still confirm with Crush, even without the ultimate. And Radiance never even contest. Yet another bit of an advantage going to the Knights. 5,000 gold, Oni minion waves flooding down every single lane. Now's a good time for them to try, PK that is, to establish some ward dominance on the right side of the map. Because the neutral objectives are desynced, that means this Oni minion wave should spread thin the defense of Radiance and make an opportunity for the Pyromancer easy for the PK boys. Looks like it will be maybe a roar kind of hanging around. No, all of Radiance moving in. They've got Benji, Tings, Adapting, Aurora all here on the right side. Only Cyclone Spin who could rotate at any time with his ultimate. They sent Zatman over to contest, but Cyclone Spin can just leave. Now he does have to go to a shadow that is near an opponent. So his team comes in, makes it safer for him to go to Kivo Fred. The Cyclone Spin is out. It creates the space though. Now the threat of that ultimate means that really no one can go for the Pyromancer. Zatman isolated on the opposite side of the map. Radiance decided to play a little bit more defensively. PK reassumed the defensive positioning around the Pyromancer. Think better of it. They've got bigger fish to fry. Fire Giant pulled 24 minutes in. They've got I'm a monster. This force is Radiance in. I like this call from them. Though Neil is taking quite a bit of damage. I wish they had everyone at least around. And it looks like as a result, they are going to have to drop it. So Radiance kind of get a little bit of free poke onto Pittsburgh Knights via the Fire Giant as they end up getting neither the Pyro or the FG. And every bit of poke matters more than it ever has. Again, PK, no sustain this time around, but they do have confirmation. Pyromancer goes their way. No contention from Radiance, but already we're seeing PK backing up. They want to make sure that they cross their T's and dot their I's. They're waiting for the perfect opportunity to push in. Keep your eyes on Cuvo Fred. He's going to be the one initiating the majority of these fights. A lot of the time, it'll be him or Neil looking to get them off on a good foot. Approaching 25 minutes in, and Pittsburgh Knights seem to get stronger the tougher the situation is. They have a sort of Zenkai boost, don't they? Whenever they get beat down, they are right back in the skirmish and ready to try and find themselves another win. So next time they come into one of these fights, what's your priority for Radiance? Is it, is it Paul? I mean, I mean, you said just living through Scary D. Is that the priority then? Just making sure he can't run through your team. I feel like Radiance's ideology is we have to survive the initial engage, and then we can send our own people in forward. If they can get through Cuvo Fred's ultimate, that's going to be a huge hurdle for them. And then immediately they can start to look to shut down Paul in the back or potentially even Zatman, maybe a little bit less so the Hachiman. 
one of the safest hunters in the game. But either way, Radiance needs to start putting up a defense on these neutral objectives. That's Oni Fury, Pyromancer. Everything's going down for free. Yeah, that's what it look. Yeah, that's what we're gonna be doing here. Um, you've seen exactly how Pittsburgh Knights can start this fight off on their side. They have already got the positioning around the Fire Giant here once again. Pushed further back though is Radiance. Not really gonna step up to contest here at all, but I don't think Pittsburgh Knights get all in here. They are so spread out. Kubo over near mid, Zapman all alone in left. So if you're Radiance, you still don't need to overact to this point. Make sure you're not giving anything up too much, and that's about it. PK is kind of spinning their wheels right now. 5,000 gold in the lead. They're giving Radiance an opportunity to start farming up. They need to force the issue here. Fight while they're at the advantage. Instead, it's been a very consistent, we're just going to go back to farming. Sure, we're going to strip away a little bit of the farm of Radiance through jungle boss, through neutral objectives, whatever it be. But either way, take a peek at the XP across the board. You only hit level 20 once. What was a three-level lead out of the jungle just moments ago has dwindled to one. The majority of Radiance is starting to tick over to level 20. 10,000 experience at 26 minutes means a lot less than it did just even five minutes ago. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, sl slowly but surely, Radiance are catching up. I mean, look, adapting is level 19. The experience gap can't keep increasing. Obviously, the gold can, and that is significant. Already a fit slide item finished as Cubo Fred has been locked down, adapting, looking for a chance for the punish, but doesn't have the damage to do it here at this point. So they keep the mid tier two standing, though they've lost the one in left. That's huge. Finally, a bird exposed, a win condition created. The PK are able to cleanly win a fight at this point. They could very easily barrel on down that left side Phoenix. But this grouping from the Knights tells me they're trying to find anyone on the side of Radiance stepping forward, lingering in the jungle, catch anyone out, immediately move to the Fire Giant afterward. It's very interesting that both teams are electing to go for this much slower style. Essentially, at this point, if you want to go just macro view, Radiance is playing with house money. They're on match set. If they win this game, they're going on to finals. All the pressure should be on PK. 100%, and instead they're giving Radiance some time. Now, obviously, I don't, I don't mind. This is now they're able to find a good initiation right on the Benji, who gets blown up right away. But he is still alive. But for how much longer? In comes Cubo Fred with the ultimate, but he doesn't find him. Instead, adapting gets Paul. They have given Radiance time, and Radiance are making it work. That man does get a roar in trade, but in come the rest of this Radiance squad. But maybe a little bit too far ahead here is adapting as he falls to Cubo Fred. But Cyclone Spin finds the trade. It's two for two, and as you said, that's got to favor Radiance. They're the ones that are behind. That's right. How does Radiance do it every single time? They find ways to turn around these fights. It's Benji. That's who it is. He's doing How work. How does he survive that situation? Plucked into five members of PK. It just walks out and from that point adapting creates space cyclone spin wins the 1v1 up against scary d it's just a ridiculous situation but at the end of the day two for two adc still alive for radiance and grouped up around this fury that would be a huge boon for the boys in red yeah i gotta think radiance with both backliners plus having the front line available as well are in a favorable position they can have Benji set up and everyone else move in but it's not going to matter who the favorable position is both teams are backing up a bit, and looks like we'll have a chance for everybody else to respawn from this point onward. Still, though, a little bit of positioning around this Fury for PK. They want to contest, as already onto it is Benji, and they've got this Fury down to about half, even lower than that, and there's the zone coming through for Benji. Finally, Radiance getting a little objective of their own. Getting a little, but is it enough at this point? 4,000 still in the lead are PK at this point. I mean, 5,000 rather, but my bad. Never do math live on, on camera, hey, we'll right? You both Fred able to strip away another tier two on the opposite side of the map. This gold lead is still ballooning in favor of PK, even off the back of Radiance, winning a small engagement for themselves. And another neutral objective getting started by PK. These guys are dominating the map. Now they move over to the Pyromancer and grab this one. So maybe that lead is still a little bit of a, of a problem here for Radiance, but they should at least be able to try to contest over one of these fire giants that are coming up next, right? Because that's got to be PK's goal. Once again, we're waiting till beyond the enhanced fire giant before we even start trying to contest it. So for whichever team does, it is going to be difficult, likely requiring a kill, or at the very least, and I'm a monster, to be there for that confirmation. But we are really getting into the nitty gritty here, aren't we? I mean, two to one, Radiance with a chance to move on, and PK needing this game to stay alive in this tournament. Couldn't be more important.
Uh, nothing could be more important than this one, Finch. But look, Radiance is used to competing at this level. Adapting wants a ring on the way out. He wants to pick up the third one. He's not going to make it easy for PK here. It's going to be a steep hill to climb, but PK are primed to do it. Tons of gold in their favor. Defensive positioning around the Fire Giant itself. Ward coverage deep in the enemy jungle. From here, we know what the strategy is. It's Neoma on the front looking to pluck whoever he can so Paul can follow up and find huge damage. That's gonna be the call, and there's Neil blinking in, and it's Aurora that gets pulled in. He is so low already on the monster, still doesn't get the kill, and somehow Aurora continues to draw breath. So the Radiance dive Adapting. is on, but they are so far ahead of the rest of the team, but at least Adapting gets one. Benji gets the second, two for one so far in favor of Radiance, and they need a regroup so they can look for more pressure. Benji still moving forward, finds the root. Cyclone spin can't do the same, and a good stun from Cubo should be able to get the majority of them out. How do Radiance do it time and time again? It was PK that had me flabbergasted yesterday, but it's Radiance that had me questioning it all here in this one. Adapting, moves in, gets a priority target, and trades his life forward, and now Radiance with the dominant advantage at this point in the game with four members against three. Crit damage coming through from Cyclone. He's going to be shredding through this objective. It's just Scary D here with a little bit of help from Cubo Fred on the side. If he's able to get in there, just slow him down, maybe they can stop this push. This is such a critical fight. They've got, Radiance has got to secure this Fire Giant, or PK have got to steal it. The Fire Giant is low, and it goes the way of Radiance. A critical Fire Giant secured, and now Scary D has dropped. Neo Ma will be right behind him with nowhere to go as Aurora finds another. Only two members up. Zatman will be there soon. So Radiance cannot end it, but they sure can push. Look at the staggered deaths as well. Neil and Scary wait too long to go in for the defense. 40 seconds left on either one of their respawns, and Radiance have accurately identified the opening. The left side Phoenix already weakened by minions. The waves already pushed up. This is their way in. This is the call. There is no front line left. Cubo Fred is the best that they have as moving in as Benji. He loses the Magi's, but gets some poke onto Paul all the same. Everyone except for adapting is here. So four against three. As Radiance moving to left side Phoenix, and no one can afford to contest without a tank. That's one big objective over to Radiance. And it's the best Phoenix to take the one furthest away from the Fire Giant. Fire Minion Waves going to be leading their way down that lane. Going to be very hard for PK to contest that and subsequent Fire Giants. But there's still plenty of time to work with. About two and a half minutes or so until this buff wears off. Tier 2, that's free. Radiance, they're happy with what they got. Got gold in their pockets to spend. We're going to be moving into the true six item slot. Elixir's likely to be coming through very soon. Power pots, wards. Radiants are primed to start sieging the base of PK. Yes, they are. What a response from the Radiance boys on this one. Absolutely necessary that they're able to win that fight. What a dive. I didn't think that it would be that effective for them. But Aurora was the initial target, remember. And it just didn't work. He was able to survive all of the damage, even the I'm a monster. And when that's how the fight starts, it puts PK at such a disadvantage. Yeah, Nilma only been able to find plucks onto Benji and Aurora so far to start off these engagements. If you're using all these tools, even if it is burning multiple shells to keep them alive, it's just creating the space for adapting to work his way into PK's backline. It's creating the space for Cyclone Spin to do the exact same with his ultimate PK need to work a little bit more on their target selection. So we've had mostly three O's. Yesterday our first three two. Yes, sir. Could this be our first three one to complete perhaps the trifecta? Radiant in a strong position with Fire Giant on four members with the tier two tower down with all five pushing in Zap. right. Now those shells are still a bit far away, but you're right, Zatman is working on the Oni Fury. I don't know if they can know this, but if they can, Radiant should put on some pressure. They don't know. Instead, backing up into the jungle, they're going to learn. It's going to be a rude wake-up call when they realize the opportunity that they missed out on. It's just a three-man stacking on the right-hand side. PK, pick up the Oni. Now, Radiance caught with her pants down. Now, they'll recognize it, but Zatman will be back too soon. So there's Aurora blinking into the back line. He pushes out a Very member fast. of the PK team. But in comes Aurora, and he makes Paul leave to the right side. Phoenix falls as well. Grasp of death as a nice hello. And Radiance got the two side lane Phoenixes. Only one bird remaining, standing between Radiance and the base of PK. Only a minute left on Fire Giant, but these staggered birds means that at no point are PK going to be able to contest subsequent Fire Giants without also simultaneously having to deal with these Fire Minion Waves going through the base. Those Oni Minion Waves that Zapman acquired for his team should be able to slow down the push for a moment, but it looks like Radiance have their eyes on Cubo. 
or maybe even pushing up a, a whole another wave. I think it at least makes sense, if nothing else, to clear some of these Oni waves, to clear a path for your own fire minions to push. And it looks like that is the goal. They even send Cyclone Spin to mid. So the Oni minions in right will still push, but Radiants do a good job. They open up the side lanes, they push out the waves a little bit, and now they can group up for this next fire. It'll spawn in about a minute. And keep in mind, everything that Radiants just pushed, they pushed at a disadvantage, at least as far as gold goes. Still, having stripped away two Phoenixes every single tower, they're down about a thousand gold despite all of it. Wild. DK have been doing such a good job priming themselves for the late game, but they missed the critical moment. One stumble around the fire giant changes the entire pace. I mean, this has been the decision-making process, right? It has been to, to hatch your bets towards the late game, and that does mean only one or two fights kind of decide it. It is the other side of that coin of what is sometimes a slower pace. I don't know if that's entirely fair in this one. We had something like 20 kills in 24 minutes, minutes something close. Maybe not 20, maybe more like 12, but still a pretty good pace for what these teams have done so far. So we certainly can't complain as Radiant start up the Pyromancer and dare the Knights to come in. They do, and the Knights, they don't pick up on that there. Instead, Radiant have established themselves a solid defensive positioning around the Fire Giant. Benji is going to be acting as an iron wall as Scary D may have stepped a little bit too far forward. Well, nearly gets caught out, is forced to retreat. And he makes his way out of there, but Radiants are going to happily head right on back towards the fire and start this one up. They've got Magi's on everyone, and Pittsburgh Knights are forced to come out. They've got the waves pushed up at the very least. And that's certainly good as Aurora gets the Magi is pushed back out. So that means PK can fight this one, but the fire is already so low, and Radiance confirm it again. So now all of a sudden it's an awful fight for PK, and they're forced to retreat. But I don't know if everyone can make it out. In comes the aggression from Cyclone Spin, but still they've claimed no lives as the Crush actually does quite a bit of damage, and Radiance are forced to slow up the chase. Watch Cubo, he goes up into the tree. There's plenty of targets out there. He lands on a roar, can't quite do more than that. Cyclone Spin putting some damage into his back. Cubo falls, Benji picking up the first kill. So 5v4 now, the kill's tied up at 12-12 and Radiance with another real lead here in this game. No relics with the jungle and support, but their back line is still looking in tip top shape. So they head back, pick up this minion wave and Mifflin, I don't think there's any doubt where they're heading. They're going for that mid Phoenix. The left Phoenix has respawned slightly weakened here, but already PK realize it, trying to push forward as many waves as they can. But this is a huge power play opportunity for Radiance. 35 seconds left on the Ratatasker. No ultimates available for PK. It's time to surge forward. And they do kind of flex over to this left lane instead for the weakened Phoenix first. And Pittsburgh Knights had to send someone back to defend the minions. Someone has to move away. That leaves only three on the Phoenix. And three is not enough when Radiance are playing at this level. Radiance get one more. And now Pittsburgh's nice base is even weaker. The right side Phoenix is close to respawning. They might decide to set up there, but they still have the power play opportunity. Five seconds left on Cubo. Aurora already taking up the mid Phoenix and no defense is there for PK. So Radiance just move right on in. Benji's in the face of Zapman making life tough. He's got three back there looking at him. Meanwhile, the rest of his team puts the hurting on the Neo. So Benji does eventually die and his team gets to the middle Phoenix during that window, but they split up now. There's two in mid, two in right. The two in right get the last Phoenix, but Radiance have got to get a clean retreat. Aurora likely going to fall here. Finds the three men stun, but it just buys him a second. Neoma picking up that kill. Benji steps a little bit too far forward for my liking, but he does create the space for all three Phoenixes to go down. Not often is there a comeback to this caliber at the SPL level, especially on the world stage. Look at this siege. Pittsburgh Knights, recognizing their opportunity, are surging forward. They left Paul back at the base, adapting, going to be backing. So there's only two to defend that middle Phoenix. Three once adapting gets there, but it's four men strong, and they should be able to at least get this Phoenix. Three fire giants on the side of Radiance might argue to the contrary. Scary D losing the majority of his health. Big man Tings doing it all for his team. Said, you want my bird, you're going to have to come better than that. And they do not come better than that. In fact, Pittsburgh Knights leave better than that. It is a 14 to 12 lead in the kills, but the map state tells you everything about this one. Three Phoenix is down for PK and Radiance waiting on their full squad to return. Once there are five, they can make their big push. I mean, at this point, do you wait for another fire? Do you try and just push under the Titan? What's your approach if you're Radiance? The Titan's so low health at this point, I'm getting antsy. I'm getting antsy, and I know that means the players are getting antsy as well. I think, if anything, 
We might see them wait a little bit longer. Fire Giant respawning in about a minute and a half. They've got so much time to work with these with these Phoenixes, and the Titan is not going to start regenerating health until all three respawn. I mean, the game's in Radiance's court. They can do whatever they want. It's about a 2,000 gold lead, but that doesn't matter at this point. It's all about map pressure, and Radiance has it all. Let's take a look here for Radiance. They've got a blink for adapting and Aurora, so those two can get onto the Titan quickly as Radiance go with a straight down middle attack. But in the back, they have to worry. Cubo Fred looking for a dive as well. But so far, Radiance still looking Huge better holds. for wear. But Cubo Fred's gotten rid of Aurora. Big Man Tings has one in return, but it is two for one in favor of the defense so far. Aurora and Cycle and Spin have been removed, but look at adapting running for his life off to the right, forcing Scary D to chase. Adapting, uses the overhead a kick, keeps his life intact for a moment, goes for the third. Scary D able to pick up the kill. Oh, Radiance, no. they thought it was an opportunity to end. Not against PK, not in a battle of attrition, not 42 minutes into the game. You're gonna have to work much harder. And that means now Pittsburgh Knights have a moment, but what can they do? I mean, they have three finishes down. They must keep these waves out. I don't even know if they can push with this opportunity. So Radiance kind of get reset here a little bit. Not back to square one. It's a bit better than that. But not to the point where they can just run down mid again. No, there's no way. But still, PK, even with this huge advantage, three dead for another 20 seconds. I don't think they get anything off it. Maybe right. some of their Phoenixes respawn. But Fire Giant should still likely be going towards Radiance with the advantage that they created on the map. That's what you get when you create so much space. Radiance create an opportunity where even if they do make a mistake, there's really no punishment for PK to get. Well, it looks like the Knights are going to commit to this Fire Giant, but they got to be careful. There are Fire Minions in left and in right that will threaten those Phoenixes when they respond. So they send Cubo Fred back to deal. That means Benji and Tings have to step in and find a way to contest. So much of the game rides on this fight and how well Radiance can try and defend. So Benji loops around behind, steps into the Fire Giant pit with the ult but not enough for the steal. PK secure the enhanced fire giant late in the game, but Radiance have four members here. They're surging forward as well. There's the blink, locks down pole, and that's gotta be the biggest target to try and get at this point. Cyclone spin, ults in, just a little bit more is all it's gonna take. Big man Ting puts Paul down, and the mid Phoenix has respawned already. Radiance knocking on the door of the base. Fire Giant on four members of PK, but it's still them on the back foot. The left side Phoenix has already fallen as well. That tied to the minions. Cuba Fred is up in the sky and crashes down for a two man knock up, then heads to the back line to look for some more shred. Big man Tings has fallen. Aurora right behind him as that man gets another scary D. Shreds through Cyclone. Spin and Radiance right on the precipice seem to have fallen at the last minute. It's a deicide, but now the Titan low HP to the minions. It's really only scary that is here. No Cubo trying to defend, and that is enough. The Titan should stand, and that means PK have a chance to push up. 50 seconds left on every single respawn, but fire minion waves everywhere on the map. Can PK even go There's for There's only the three of here? them. There's nothing they can do. I think Radiance may still have created enough space that PK just have to spin their wheels a little bit longer. But I'm not sure. The fire minions have stopped over in right. They stopped in left and mid, and Pittsburgh Knights are continuing to push up. They have an opportunity to close this out, but there's also minions now coming through the right-hand side, so they're contesting a base race. They have to send Paul back. No, Paul's respond to deal, and the rest of PK can push up. Mifflin, I think they've extended this to a game five. PK, the absolute maestros of a battle of endurance. Radiance, we thought they were going to win it. Three Phoenixes down for five full minutes. PK, they're not going to make it easy for anyone. The defending world champions want another ring. My goodness, is this PK team resilient? You are not beating them easily. They will not go quietly. You must come correct, or you must not come at all. What a performance from the Knights, from the whole squad. And Radiance get a little impatient there at the end, Myth. I don't think there's another way to describe it. They push down mid, that push down right wasn't so great either, and PK stall them twice. Look, PK bringing the best caliber of smite I've seen all week but they will always have a career as entertainers. Game five twice, what an absolute treat. Yeah, you are not getting rid of these guys quickly. Pittsburgh Knights drag us all the way into a game five, coming up after the break.
Oh, for a team that's already given us two historic reverse sweeps, they go ahead and add to that list aggro with a three Phoenix down comeback. I don't know that there is anything this Knights roster can't do. And if you are enjoying it as much as we are, you have to be enjoying it with other Smite fans, not just in Twitch chat, but out there in the official Discord as well. Make sure you go to discord.gg slash Smite game. That'll get you the invite to come into the server you can talk with other Smite fans and just geek out over these teams as much as we are here watching them play, giving us another great set. You'll also get to interact in those meet and greets with these pros as they come through and talk to them and what they like to do and, and maybe find out some of those just burning questions you've always wanted to know, like whether or not Paul actually has a solo, although he's answered that one for us pretty yes. heavily here. Just again in Every that guess. game, Agro, I mean... PK control early, then Radiance just knock them down like it's nothing. They take three Phoenixes, and the Knights just won't stop. That's like the equivalent of a TKO. They just keep getting back up, and no one's going to stop them. Well, I'll tell you one thing. Number one, Cubo Fred's chair is TKO. No chance that thing is ever standing again. <laughs> he, he hit that thing with a right straight that would have knocked out Conor McGregor for the record. But regardless of that, let's rewind a little bit and talk about how PK even got to the point where Fred could be KO punching his chair. It's, it's so messed up that how well Radiance played and the reason they got their lead was because of their front line and how well Benji, first and foremost, but adapting in Aurora played to keep Radiance's back line super safe. The dive was impossible, but this is the turning point right here. Benji goes way too deep in order to kill Zap, and then it's okay, that's fine. We'll get the next EFG in. All right, well, we didn't really end off that one because we made more mistakes in order to make it happen and, and not allow ourselves to to end, excuse me. Look, all the credit in the world to PK. I don't think any other collection of five players on the planet ends this game in their favor. I really don't. I think Ghost is the best team in the SPL right now, and I think they lose this game in PK's situation. That's just how locked in these guys are at any given moment. I've never seen a team with this type of mental fortitude. That being said, I just don't, Radiance should never have gotten to a point where this happens. Keep an eye on Fred's cam, by the way, top left. What did that chair do to him, man? <laughs> yeah, oh, man. not a maxonomic chair, as production said. Maxonomic chair hits him back for the record, so that he's a little bit lucky in that moment. The Radiance team, I mean, you could see him a little bit lost right there, and can you blame him? That is unbelievable that the Pittsburgh Knights are able to come back and win a game like that, but Radiance just has to play a little bit tighter. They have to find a way to end that game. I, I don't know how... You get to that point, and you're so close, and, and, and it just starts to fall apart from you. It really started with that front line. That was the reason they were winning, and I think the front line's the reason they lost in the end. I mean, we have to talk about Carry D, right? I mean, whether you want to call him Carry D, Scary Diff, whatever it is, the set so often in that back line able to disrupt 8, 3, and 11. And Fred, in particular, on that last team yes. fight on the right side, Phoenix, 
his target selection was unbelievable. He landed down on a frontliner, and I think, okay, they're going to all in the frontliner, kill him off Scylla. But he instantly dashes the Cyclone spin and gets on a priority target and insta-killed him. I mean, it was unreal, his target selection and his ability to, to understand the fight's macro as a whole. And, and then, of course, <laughs> I mean, PK starting to march it down mid, and we're sitting there like, they're Titans 971 yeah. HP. There's fire minions There's coming fire in. fire minions coming. Is someone going to get that? And <laughs> Ajax tweeted the best meme possible. The one, the dude rising from the coffin like, Paul, like, I've got this one, fellas. Don't worry about it. Perfect timing on understanding the game. Imagine thinking you could eliminate the Pittsburgh Knights on the world stage. Imagine. It could not be me because they aren't going to go away. And we thought they dodged a bullet. I was sitting there a few minutes before they had those turnaround fights and straight up thinking, oh, well, they, they didn't go up 2-0, so therefore they're not going to have the sweep come through. This is where Radiance win. And no, the no. Knights will not stop for anything short of death at this point. If you do not eliminate all five members, anything is possible here in game number Five. Picks and bands starting up. Radiance opt for this first pick. It's been very coveted between these two teams. I don't even know where to go. I, they opt for the Aphrodite. It makes sense. It was very dominant for them. And the first two games made it difficult for Radiance's life. Yamoja comes through. Not surprising. But do you change anything up based on that last game? You have to because, again, PK would have lost if Radiance kept their composure through the end of the game and, and played the way they should have. So I don't think PK can come in feeling like, oh, we can't lose. That being said, I don't see a way that PK lose just mentally after that set, <laughs> uh, after that game, but you cannot come in and just expect to wow. win outright. I think you, you've you got to make some adjustments through the mid game. They were losing those team fights. Their dive towards the late game was really good, and their dive towards the early game was really good, but there was a big chunk of that game in the middle where all of a sudden Fred and Scary couldn't make anything happen on the back line because Radiance's front line was creating too much space. I think you do have to make some sort of change. Well, they do. And they ban out the Scylla. It's something that both of these teams have picked. I believe both teams have first picked even to try and take it away from the other. And that Ymir is what makes it through. Raw Persephone on the other side by the Knights. But Ymir, Cupid for your duo lane, picked up for Radiance. This Ymir was good for them. This Cupid was good for them. This Kukulin literally has a skin based on Benji. You have to think these top three are feeling really comfortable and confident. I mean, Benji, it, it, it's so hard to say what Benji should be doing because I thought he carried through the mid game and then also lost him the game at the end. So do you want him on that same pick? It seems like Radiance does. I like the switch up back to Cupid. I like the Ymir pick. These are picks that can all of a sudden bring a ton of pressure to that duo lane. And I think Zap feel, feels that and goes th towards the Jing Wei as the most immediate answer to getting some space for himself in that lane, trying to stay as safe as possible in a very, very scary kill duo. Well, speaking of scary, Guan Yu was the first pick there for the Knights, more than likely going over to that lane. You mentioned earlier, doesn't scale as well into that late game as what we've seen out of things like this Kakulin. So maybe trying to expedite this victory, if anything, for the Knights. The Morgan Jing Wei going to get locked in aside that. Knights ban out the Discordia. They're looking towards Tings as of right now. Radiance are looking towards Kivo. They get rid of the Pele. Kamazots has been in that position as well, up towards the top. And this is something, I mean, they haven't even gone to it, but this is a pick for Big Man, this Agni getting yeah. banned out here. I mean, it's not too surprising to see, but considering he hasn't had an impact, is that just to sway the pocket pick? Yeah, I mean, you banned basically everything Big Man has played this set, right? I mean, Scylla, Persephone, Disco have been the picks for him so far, if memory serves. So I, it makes sense to me to take those out. Then the Agni is one that he goes to. I'm looking at Poseidon as, as Big Man's most likely next pick, just if I had to guess based on what he played during the regular season. But Big Man's proven to me a lot that he can play literally anything. So I, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> Poor Scary, bro. Of course, we had to catch that on Kim. Someone caught him off guard telling a joke. Poor man. But he deserves it, bro. He, he's been playing lights out. I mean, if anything, that's exactly what you want to see if you're a Knights fan right now, right? Like that, you can't have a spit take on your camera and picks <laughs> and bands if you're stressed out. Every single member of this team in the black and gold is smiling. Paul is actually showing emotion as opposed to his triple kill earlier. He's got something going on. Although there's that gamer face that we're Locked used to seeing in. as he goes back into the game. Ratatosker getting banned out over this Kamazot. That's good for Cuba. I mean, even just the difference in what these two teams have looked like wow, on these cams yeah. is stark, right? I mean, PK is yucking it up. Someone told a real knee slapper in the comms, and everyone's <laughs> having a great time. Radiance 
it feels like they just got the worst news they could ever hear. You know what I mean? They, they look well, they a little did. bit shaken. Yeah, the, the news yeah, is you had three. Game five against the Knights. That's scary. Right. Yeah, you just had three <laughs> Phoenixes down, and here we are in picks and bans yet again. That's not good news for them, as they really think this one through. Ooh. I was going to say, man, I had a feeling that Big Man was going to go something weird right off the bat. And the Anubis is one that I like against the Guan Yu. I talked about it a lot on the cast for Ghost Renegades. Why I like Anubis up against Guan. He can he cuts down every mage. You can't get away from him anyways. So why don't I just stand still and out DPS him and try and out heal him? But I don't like the pick up against Kamazots because Kamazots goes up and you're healing off nothing. You know, you're, you're just kind of an immobile mage at that point. You're no different than, than someone else. I'm not in love with the Anubis pickup against the Kamazots, but I don't have a problem with it here for Radiance. I really don't. Now, I think the biggest question, Twig is the only person I think that has run this with success in the Pro League this year, and that's saying something. A lot of people, you could get to mid-tier list. We, there's a lot we could try to break down when it comes to just talking about mid-laners and where people think they are. A lot of people will put Paul towards the bottom, even though we've seen what he can do. I mean, there's a lot of ways to cut it. But can Big Man make this Anubis a game five winning pick not just one that has to do well on the world stage but one that has to win this game for them because if it doesn't i mean what you're falling back to erlong he's set up kakulin ymir they're set up the cupid would have to be the carry it can but i think it requires a, a drastic game plan switch from radiance look at these five gods first of all this is a very ghost style composition yes. and it's a very it's a very renegade style composition Read between the lines, what am I saying? It's an early game composition. This comp is great early. It doesn't scale that well into the late. I mean, it's got great CC, but you're, all of your strengths are in the early portion of the game. And Radiance has not shown me the propensity to do that to any team at all in the last six months. So is that the composition you want to go for at a time like this? Again, especially against a team like PK, who has shown the ability to slow the game down really well. I don't know. I don't know if Radiance is going to try and play it like they play every other composition, slow it down, take it to late, or if they're going to try and completely change the way they play the game here in game five. I mean, it's the only way, I think, at this point, right? You were just three Phoenixes up against the Knights, and unfortunately you weren't able to do anything with that advantage, but that's more, I think, the Knights playing well from behind and not them necessarily, well, a little bit on Benji there, I guess, going over yeah. aggressive in the one fight. But, I mean, for the most part, you've got this team that has to change it up because otherwise the Knights are going to do what they did the last game and do what they did a few games ago over in game two where they just take you to 35 minutes, outplay you at the time, and go forward, especially when you're feeling tilted. But it, it comes down to this, right? Erlang Shen, you, you had kind of mentioned the Kakulin, depending on how things went, and their direct matchups over on the other side, having to deal with this Kamazots and then having to deal with this Guan Yu. Is that going to make a big difference into the late game for their setup? Kamazots can carry a little better than Erlang, but Kakulin lasts a little better into the late than Guan. It's going to be a little bit volatile is the word i'm going to use because i think that <laughs> if the if these if if, a, if picks like erlong in in kakulin get ahead it can be lights out really really quickly which is really the case for all five of these radiant gods which is why i think their early game is so important in this one if pk get to the later stages i mean kamazots really once he hits three items feels pretty oppressive for backliners because if you just get blink one two that's so that's such quick damage and Cubo is so lethal with those shots, he does not miss in those moments that you, you can just burst people really, really quickly, and then you have that get-out-of-jail-free card with the ultimate. You know, it's been a little while, but I actually want to rewind back to Ghost Gaming and Re uh, Renegades Game 1, which is uh, you get a Ymir, a Cupid, an Anubis. Ignore the jungler at this point. This Anubis being able to rotate over, Ymir, Cupid being able to get aggressive. Are Jingwei, Xing Chen safe enough to be able to get away from that kind of rotation, or are they susceptible to this? It's a good question. The Anubis was picked against Ymir Artemis, so it was really easy to kill those types of compositions. Y y Anubis does not have that same type of easy kill potential up against Xing Chen in particular, or Jingwei either, I suppose, in that lane. I, I don't know. I don't think he does. I think that it's going to be much harder for Big Man to make that same impact that Twig was able to make in the Ghost Draft. Well, I mean, this is insane from the Pittsburgh Knights. It's not something you get often. Two game fives, two days in a row, eight world champs in this one. Four of them are going home right now in game five. Radiant and PK and Mifflin.
I'm out of prescriptions. I am out of diagnoses. At this point, I don't know how you stop this team. It seems like even three Phoenixes down is not enough, man. They will not quit or give up. Did you see those player cams? The way they were talking about Kifo Fred might not even have done it justice. They were incredibly pumped. They believe they can win this one, Myth. And Radiance finally come in with an aggressive comp. Are we going to see them take it to them early? Look, they have to with this draft. Aggro highlighted it perfectly. They do not scale well into the late game. But you know what? If I got Gormizer listening, I'm going to give him a little bit of homework. I want to hear how many three Phoenix Down comebacks we've had in the <laughs> SPL, right? I'm not sure if that's available information out there, but especially on the world stage, right? Absolutely ridiculous. Radiance bringing a brand new look into game five, and they're needing to make it work. I want them to see aggression in the early, and this is exactly it. Aurora starting it off strong. Blinking in, looking for the glacial strike, and Zapman taking all of this damage. Even turning around and putting that wind gust on the farm, though, he's not getting denied off it. So clearly, Zapman ready for it. And I know you guys couldn't see Gore, but as Mifflin said it, he stopped, started writing it down. My man's on it, if Mif asked for it. As Cyclone Spin gets aggressive, Dash is in, but Heart Bomb not there. Not there this time, but already. We're seeing a brand new mentality from the Radiance boys. Aurora getting involved early on the Ymir pick, blinking onto the first invade possible. This is a draft that needs to work before the 25 minute mark. No longer are we waiting 15 minutes in for a gold green. No longer are we gonna wait for PK to hit their stride at the 30, 40 minute mark. Radiance are looking to bring the fight early. And they're gonna have to. Big man Tings pulls out the Anubis a Captain Twig special with adapting on this Erlong Shen we saw earlier from him in the set. Those two in particular, Myth, they're going to have to be lights out for, for me for Radiance. They have to drive this early game aggression early to mid and make sure they're in a spot where Pittsburgh Knights can't fight back. More aggression from Aurora onto Zatman, who stays old as ice in response. He does not flinch, does not give up the relics. And Aurora finds little. There's not going to be much that Zapman's going to give you away for free. Bead certainly not on that list. But what did we see earlier today when Ghost Gaming played almost this exact same draft? Early rotations from the mid laner. Captain Twig rotating over to Duo almost the second he ticks over to level 5. And we saw exactly this from Sam for soccer. The aggression out of the jungle. You already highlighted it. Adapting big man tings. The big names throughout the early game. I'm expecting them to make waves. I want to see it. Radiance fans want to see it. If we have any hope left of a three-time world champion, Radiance has to prove it here. If Adapting wants to make it, what a way to leave, right? Playing up against these Knights teams that you had down with two wins, all three Phoenixes down as well, and they still push back past you for the win. In comes Neil Mabo on his Aurora. He's looking for the purple buff invade. There is the contest. But not enough. Nice little purple buff invade. Not enough this time around, but I like the mentality already. It's been a huge shift, but so far, it hasn't been enough throughout the early. Zapman been closing it pretty easily. No beads usage. No need for him to feel any of the pressure that's been coming his way. Aurora got to be frustrated with the pace set so far, but it has not shown on his face just yet. We've got 10 absolute competitors in this lobby stony eyed only one thing on their mind and it's lifting the hammer yeah i think the rest of the world has melted away at this point hasn't it mifflin this has become their world who can win this final game of smite we are deep into the hours here in alpharetta our eu fans have probably had to clock out already but here in north america nine o'clock is starting to just become the norm when pk plays smite isn't it deep deep past what you might normally expect for a smite game, but this team will drag it to that point, won't they? They will calmly, happily wait until 40, 50 minutes. They will calmly wait for that one error you make that lets them back into the game, and then they will take it, and they will not look back. If, Radi if Radiance want to win this one, man, they cannot give PK any way back in. We know for a fact they'll take it. They're waiting for it. PK 
it almost feels like they, they wrap a rope around their opposition and drag them to the bottom of the ocean, choking them out, give them no air. You want to play against us, you're going to have to play correctly for a full hour. Not just one, not just two, five, six hours straight. Radiance has been put against the ringer from the world, the defending world champions, PK, bringing it this time what around. Big Mad Tings. He's the target of it, and Tings goes to the ult. It's not enough. Pull and Pittsburgh nice. Are the ones that strike first. Meanwhile, Cyclone Spin drops the ultimate. That man is low, but the freeze it connects. So does the glacial strike, and Cyclone Spin finds the answer back. Radiance and the lights brawling here before the five minute mark. PK thought they might have got away with something. Radiance not going to make it easy either. Aurora catches the dash from Zatman, makes it easy for Cyclone Spin to wander up and pick up a kill. Neil Ma has to watch on his horror as Aurora picks up the purple buff. Duo lane off to a fantastic start for Radiance. It does hurt, though, that Anubis, that big man Tings, the one that fell in mid. Great work from Paul and Cubo Fred, getting aggressive in the middle lane and cutting him off. Mifflin, is that going to have to be the priority? Is that killing Duo? I mean, aside from the first blood, obviously that's more. But is killing the Anubis close to killing Zap? I think this Anubis getting shut down early is huge. An immobile mage falling means that it's likely not the first time this man's gonna stumble. He's got rocks in his shoes at this point. <laughs> not easy to walk, big man Tings. He got an early taste of what the rest of this match is gonna look like. Cubo Fred put a target on this man's chest. It proves that it's doable, even with the ultimate, even with the damage as Benji forces Scary D's ultimate out with one of Benji's own. So an easy trade over there in Seoul. This game's still very, very tight through the first six minutes or so. Barely any gold, 300 or so, separates these two teams at this point. So a couple more of these skirmishes, of these ganks, of these dives. That's what's going to decide this one. That is will be the difference maker. I don't know if we're going to make it all the way to 55. Probably, right, based on what we've seen. But <laughs> it feels like they're already looking to try and end it. It really does. Every single one of these players have to be tired. It's not easy to maintain this level of concentration for this amount of time. True, truly athletes, masters of their craft here. Now, Big Man Tings finds the stun. Aurora does the same, but Cubo doesn't use the leap, doesn't use the bat out of hell. These guys, razor focused. Are you Shouldn't there have been more commitment? I mean, Cubo does not have beads. He is not escaping that CC chain. Does an ultimate from Tings not kill there? It might. It's hard to say. Maybe he wasn't completely reliant on the double freeze, right? The double stun to line up that entire duration. If at most, maybe Fred has to jump out of that situation as adapting goes for a cheeky little invade. Scary D makes it out of there alive. Nice work by the Knights because that was aggression from Radiance looking to move in and take what they could. Their Cyclone Spin using the ultimate, forcing the airstrike from Zatman. We use it away from the tower, but Zatman gives up on the chase, rightfully so. He gets the call from Amir and from Big Man Tings that there's trouble on the way, so he backs up, but Aurora doesn't care. He moves in 1v3 with a blink. Can't find much, though. My man got tricked by the decoy Morrigan, ever tricky. He, he didn't have to see it, so he doesn't know which one's the real one this time. PK get away with looking at the enemy's purple buff, or their own purple buff, rather, as Radiance try to get aggressive continually. It's always looking for fights on PK's side of the map. Aurora's been the originator of a lot of this aggression, and I'm expecting more of the same, but so far, it's been very quiet from adapting out of the jungle. It has. He's not done much. There's the freeze on to Neil, but this Xing Chen is tanky and hard to defeat. Another good wall, but the damage is not there. Neil Ma can't even overreact. He's got Blink, so not much accomplished for the push, but teams is stripping away farm. Take a look at the way Radiants are aggressing on this map. They are looking everywhere they can for something to take away, and, and Knights are making it hard. There's not a lot open for them to go in and strip away. Yeah, the Knights want this game to go long. If they get their way, we're going to be talking about them 40, 50 minutes from now, whereas Radiance, they're certainly on a timer. But they've got tools to utilize throughout the early game. Erlang, Shen, and Anubis together absolutely shred objectives. If the Knights get caught asleep at the wheel for three, four, five seconds, immediately Gold Fury could go down. Pyromancer could go down. Keep your eyes on big man Tings. It's going to be him on the Pyro, on the Gold, trying to force these fights and make PK respond. Now, we're still in a bit of the slower beginning of the game. Take a look at how Tings is starting. Probably no surprise, it's Bancross into those purple boots as the response. Kivo Fred understands how much he's reliant on that. Brawler's beat stick picked up 
as that first pin item from him. Is there a chance we see Divine Ruin from Paul as well? Is it to that extent that you want to buy that level of, of anti-heal? It's interesting. Divine Ruin is easy to apply with the Morrigan, but it's going to slow down the burst potential by a lot. It's not like a Soul Reaver. It's not like a Polynomicon. It's not going to give him that one-shot potential that he's really looking for. So I am very interested to see how Paul decides to itemize this time around as Radiance big grouping around the red. They want to look for the invade. Neil takes quite a bit of damage, but there's four members of the Knights that are here. Even Scary D rotated over. So the whole squad is here. And I don't know if Radiance were ready. Aurora is already the one target. It gets a friendly Fields of Love to help, but there is the leap in from Cubo Fred into the bat out of hell and Aurora cannot escape. Tings will fall right behind. And once again, the Knights are better at early aggression than Radiance, even with this kind of draft. The draft favors Radiance at this point in the game almost wholeheartedly, but instead it's PK sneaking away with the big plays. Surprised to see them not go for the gold free there, especially considering all the utility already used by Radiance. Feels a love, down, a roar, big man Tings dead for at least 10 seconds, but instead they're happy with the win that they've already established for themselves, even though they win that fight handily, reading three to one at the top of your screen. It's Radiance with the gold lead 10 minutes in. Radiance are a bit ahead, but I think the Knights are fine with this pace, right? I mean, they get those kills, and every time they get one, they're thinking, yeah, we shut down the aggression once more. But as you said, the Knights, they don't need to win right now. They don't need to win 20 minutes from now either. They are comfortable trusting themselves going much further into this game clock, and it's Radiance who are struggling to make all these, all these aggressions work, all these invades work. That, are, that have the pressure on them, all of a sudden, isn't that what it feels like PK do? The whole set, it feels as though the pressure's on the other team because you know, you trust that PK have the potential to, to drag it out. PK just waiting for Radiance to hang themselves. <laughs> it feels like we just pull on the own rope. Aurora moving in, can't quite find the freeze, lands the slow. PK, they don't want any of it. Time to back up. How did they disengage out of that fight? Great work from Paul to outmaneuver Neil and then continue running from adapting towards the tail end as Kivo puts good damage into Big Man Tinks. 0-2 oh, for the Anubis at the start. He's not been able to do nearly what they expected from him. He's had the damage, but the dive potential on him is just too good. It's the Kamazots matchup, like they talked about on the desk. It really is that damage potential, even from a range so hard to deal with. But Big here stun. it is. Big Man Tings puts Kivo Fred down, feeling a little bit too confident on that dive immediately. You need to have beads if you want to step to Anubis like that. Well, that is huge. Big Man Tings hits the Mummify the first chance he gets to deny the aggression, and it makes all the difference, keeps him alive, and keeps the momentum in Radiance's court, which they desperately need. It is perhaps their greatest ally here is that they continue to move this snowball. They continue to try and jump out into the lead because we know that they cannot wait. PK's done it too many times before. But the clock is ticking, 12 minutes in. It's less than a thousand gold, maybe a little bit over separating these two teams. It's not enough for this early game draft. Already aggro highlighted perfectly on the desk. Come late game, yeah. how do you contend with this PK draft? So they have to do this. They don't have a new basalt, that's some of their best burn, but they still have a chance. Zatman comes in, but Radiance secure the gold very cleanly and Zatman cannot contest. In fact, Zatman must sacrifice the beads. So Radiance now, finding some ways to extend this, but still not quite enough for them to feel comfortable, especially with the response from the Knights as they take care of the Pyromancer and Benji cannot get there in time. The Knights doing their best to drag this game out as long as possible. This reactionary play style. Radiance, you can have the gold greed. Doesn't matter. You're not going to be able to establish enough of a lead. We're going to get the Pyromancer in return. It seems like this patient play style is the new hallmark of this PK roster, a team that you would honestly associate with aggression. Players like Zapman, Neil Ma, Scary D all scream to me that they want a W key constantly, but instead it's this calculated counter punch play style. The defending world champions almost looking like Floyd Mayweather on the world stage. Being very patient, dodging, ducking, and weaving here, aren't they? And waiting for their moments. It's, it's been great here from the Knights. So far, I mean, they, it looked just the same up against Space Station. I have the same feeling. Chat is reacting all the same way to what the Knights have done here. And a team with a ton of support. Zapman has his fans. Paul, Cubo, all of these guys bring with him this big crowd that is not going to let them go away quietly. And neither are the Knights. I mean, this is a little bit different, right? It, it's kind of been a bit more back and forth. One, 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 one. And now that that rhythm has come to an end, 
here at Game 5, Pittsburgh Knights would like to break it and get out in front with that fifth. They sure do, but Radiance bringing a brand new look into Game 5, constantly looking for aggression with no neutral objectives available on the map, no POIs to force the hand of PK. Now, there's nowhere that Radiance can go and just force PK to respond. Instead, they're getting dragged again in the defending world champion's pace. They want to farm. They want to get to that sixth item slot. They want to group up as five. That's when they look their best. Oh, adapting not able to find the taunt with the ultimate. Neil Ma escapes it, and once more, the aggression for Radiance does not work. And this is where I feel like maybe I need to make a correction. It's not as the Radiance has not been trying all set with this aggression, with this aggression, but things like that keep happening, where they're just a bit off, where the Knights seem ready, where they can't quite connect the pieces together. And as such, they can't create that much distance. They're still at about 2,000. You don't feel bad about that at this point in the game at all, but it just feels like they need a bit more. Maybe on a bit of a joking note. If you, you watch some boxing, what do you call that punch that Hikubo gave the chair there? What is it, a right hook, maybe, a haymaker. Yeah, that, that was a right hook. You, you <laughs> nailed it, man. A little cross. Maybe I, yeah, I gotta very good. watch more Ipo, right? And I know that with, with some confidence, I could say it with my full chest, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but look. Radiance is doing a very good job of trying to establish map pressure. It's, it's controlling where PK is allowed to walk on the map. Watch how they path around. It feels like if we were to just paint the map, Radiance has got probably about 60% of it under their control at this point. But still, that's not enough. They need to control the neutral objectives better. They can't allow PK to continually trade out like they have been in the past. If Radiance groups up on Gold Fury and PK goes to the Pyro, I think Radiance needs to drop the Gold Fury and bring the fight to PK. That's how much stronger this draft is in the early game. But so far, PK been doing a great job of mitigating loss. Well, what about Paul here as Neil Ma puts some aggression on the Cyclone? It's been Cubo Fred here as well. So Cyclone drops the ultimate. Cubo forced to use beads and keeps up the aggression. The hearts have healed him, but it's too much with Zetman there as well. And Cyclone Spin cannot survive. So Aurora looking for revenge, drops the wall and the freeze, but Airstrike provides too much safety. And in the back, Paul has turned in to Cubo Fred, is using the Camazot to burn through Ting's, adapting narrowly escapes. But Scary D's aggression continues as the Knights find two for zero. There's an easier target in the tier one. Aurora left alone, but the Knights have to back up ever so slightly. Neoma, low health. Benji rotated over, but instead, shift your focus. Tier one tower, that goes the way of PK. Such an impressive rotation from PK. They come over, they absolutely drop Psycho and spin. Big Man Tang falls the same way. Now I was just about to ask you, who does Paul turn into in the end of this game? Is there ever a well return to the Anubis, but why bother? when the Kamazots is clearly this destructive. The Kamazots is just enough. Having two of them on the map is absolutely oppressive, especially considering how Cubo Fred has decided to itemize. He is a frontliner through and through. The Sledge at this point, all the additional health as well as the power, the Brawler's beat stick to contend with some of Big Man Ting's lifesteal as well. It's so hard to shut him down. And even if he does fall low, He's got the ability to just get out of jail for free, bat out of hell, gonna get him out of every sticky situation. PK absolutely feeling themselves moving into the Oni. Can't quite stick on it as Radiant show up in great numbers. And PK only have three on this side of the map. In fact, Hugo Fred taking a back and Paul a little far away as well. So I don't think Pittsburgh's actually gonna overstep just yet, but I think this is their eventual plan, Myth, as you alluded. Once they have the boys back, they certainly can't start it, but also, there's not as much pressure on PK to start it. If it's there, they'll take it, but if not, they'll happily continue to play this patient game. But it's been PK finding the fights inside the enemy jungle that have actually worked out. It's been them yes. getting the successful early aggression despite Radiance having such an advantage throughout the early game. It feels like that opportunity for Radiance to run away with this match is slowly drifting through their fingers like sand. And already, they're already taking consolation prizes. Cyclone Spin, eyes no longer on the Gold Fury. He went over to Pyro. Looks like a roar came over for a moment. But yes, the Pyro will go over to Radiance pretty cleanly. They'll enjoy it as the Pittsburgh Knights have now moved pressure over to the Gold Fury. At least they have three, four members on this side of the map. Radiance 
now moving over for their chance to respond as it has been pulled by Neil Ma. Cubo Fred has gotten aggressive, moved in as has Scary D, and there's the horse. They're moving in as Cyclone Spin drops the ultimate at his feet. But the taunt from adapting is better. It pulls in Scary D, but Paul finally punches Cyclone Spin. Zep Man removes the roar, and adapting on the left side of the fight has few options for escape. Cubo Fred misses one, but not the second, and that's three for one, easily in PK's favor. The defending world champions will not make it easy. In fact, they won't let you have an inch. They're going to take the air out of your lungs and breathe it themselves. Gold <laughs> Fury, Oni Fury should go their way. Paul, Zapman, they're going to trade it back and forth. The only one in range to defend is Benji. Can he do it? Can he put on the hero's cape? I think he can. Benji's got an opportunity here, but they're dropping it. They're not going to give him that chance. The Knights take the Fury. Benji is forced to retreat. And PK now the holders of about a 1,600 gold lead. Not so bad on that one. And I don't know, man. If you're Radiance, you've done all you can. They've tried. They've picked the aggression, the Anubis, the Erlong, and they just get stuffed at every turn. The gold lead, not too bad. The 4,000 experience, on the other hand, much worse, especially considering, again, can only highlight it so many times, Radiance's draft is going to get outscaled the longer this game goes on. So far, PK, they've primed themselves for a very good looking late game. Yeah, they're gonna be very comfortable coming in. I mean, they've been winning these, some of these games even when they're behind, right? And now they get to come in from a position where perhaps they are ahead, where they've shut down Radiance at every turn. Obviously, we got a quick pause here. We're working on getting that sorted out free and getting right back in to what has become a critical set. Apparently, this is the only way PK gets it done, <laughs> taking you to the limit and then getting over you. A myth, is there anything left? Where does Radiance go to try and turn this around? Everything they've, they've tried has failed. Look. You gotta pray that PK makes a mistake. But if PK, this PK, they're not making mistakes. No. They're playing damn near perfect. I'll take the fine, Hindu man. I'll <laughs> take it this time around. Because Radiance, they have a good draft. They have the ability to get away with some sneaky plays. If Anubis is able to sneak his way into a fire giant, if Radiance creates just a little bit of space around big man Tings, Pyro, Gold Fury, all those should fall down incredibly easily. That's right. They've got that objective burn potential, right? And that's going to be big for them, for big man Tings, to be able to have some of that objective control. But that hasn't materialized yet because it's not just Cubo Fred. It's Paul as well, right, turning into the Camazots and sitting on top it's of tough. this Anubis. There's not been room for him to breathe so far. The aggression has all come from the other side. PK somehow are the ones that are starting off most of these fights. They really are. And Radiance has to be feeling that pressure every single step of the way. They draft a completely new look in game five and yeah. it immediately gets shattered. It's so surprising that this is where they end up on the back of their new look of trying to be aggressive. We are obviously back into the game though. And PK from the driver's seat trying to send this Radiance team home. You saw the tape. You saw how much Adapting's career has meant to this league as a whole, to the entirety of Smite perhaps. And it's not stopping the Knights from taking it away. PK have stolen two careers this world. They're looking to take a third one, adapting. Sure, you might want the hat trick. The fans might want to see it, but it's not going to be easy. It's going to be PK starting up the fire giant. It's burning fast. Cyclone spin, nowhere to be seen. Now this is not free. Big Man Tings has some great steel potential. If he can make it in, spin G and Aurora and adapting can disrupt. But look at this. Radiance just with their presence, with their patience, they deny this fire giant to the knights. I'm surprised. If they didn't want a contested one, I think they stuck on it a bit too long, but it's not a big deal, right? I mean, they can essentially just back up, heal around Scary D, and go wherever they'd like. They at least force Radiance to rotate to the opposite side of the map, and sure. now they've corralled them all into one exact corner. This created so much space. BK, strip away the purple buff, strip away the red buff, and still Radiance farming nothing on the map. They created pressure just by looking at the Fire Giant. Well, there you go. Radiance have to give them that respect. It's not a misplay. I mean, they're at a point now where if they leave the Knights alone with that fire for too long, it might be gone with Cuba, Fred, and Zapman working together at this point in the game. So Pittsburgh Knights still get something out of it with multiple buff invades. And they're going to be able to take a little bit of time to reset. Now they got Cuba, Paul, both at 20, Zapman 19, and Scary right behind. And all of them with advantages over the direct opposition. Radiance really do need a bit of an opening from PK rather than creating one of their own. And no one is giving anything up. Just one break is all Radiance needs, but they haven't been able to find it anywhere on the map. But take a peek at Big Man Tings. He's made his first adaptation, a pivot, if you would, inside of his build. Instead of going for more damage, 
picks up the mantle of Discord. Pair that with a life steal that he already has from Typhons and Bancrofts. He's going to be incredibly survivable inside of these fights. Cuvo Fred has enough penetration in his build already to make it hard, and he's going into Heartseeker as well. But still, I think this is going to be huge for Radiance. If Big Man Tings can survive the dive, it means he's going to get value out of this build. It's going to change a lot for Radiance if they can keep him alive in that back line. There's a couple ways to make it work, right? If there's peel for it, that's great. But when it's Camazots, especially double, you can't peel. So Big Man Ting just makes himself more survivable. And that will be the axis by which they pull to try and keep him alive. 3 to 8 in the kills, 11 in 23 minutes. And now Pittsburgh Knights starting to group a bit around this fire. But still, I don't know if the onus is on them to start it up, right? I mean, I like what they're doing, kind of pulling Radiance over and then spreading the map out in response. It's making it tough for Radiance to catch up. And they've drafted well around that strategy in of itself. Zap man on the Jingwei can go split push for all we care and then go back to base and immediately fly into the fire giant. Make sure that Radiance never feels like it's truly an advantageous fight, even if they see him on the opposite side of the map. So if that's the strategy for PK, it's one I can get behind 100%. But now adapting one's aggression, Cubo Fred maybe went up a bit too far alone, so his ultimate gets forced out quickly, and Pittsburgh Knights are retreating. That is Cubo and Zapman's ultimates both down, plus the blink from adapting. So maybe Radiance can use this window where there's less aggression and less safety to move up. With an easy neutral objective like Pyromancer having respawned as well, that's one good POI to force PK to respond. No defensive ultimates for either Zap or Cubo, as you already highlighted. Now's the time for Radiance to move forward. And it looks like adapting will be the one out in front. Big Man Tings is outputting the damage, and it's got Scary D-Lo. Benji finds the very first casualty of this engagement. Now Paul comes in and trades it out onto adapting, immediately transforms into the Camazots and starts putting out the herd. Aurora falls, and Paul continues his excellence, his elite performance with a double. You thought Scary D would be enough of a pick to move forward He's against the on. defending world champions? Not when Paul's alive. Not when Zapman's in the back line. Pyromancer going the way of the Chaos team. I don't see how, man. Paul is just absolutely wild with it. Going on to adapting with the mage abilities, immediately transforming out into that Kamazots. And look what the middle of this map has done. 8, 1, and 11 between Cubo, Fred, and Paul. They have become unstoppable. And that's not even to talk about how much Scary D has earned, how much Neil Ma has, has created space. That means the Gold Fury now free for the Knights, well earned on the back of a good FG fight. And they extend this lead out further. This lead is becoming stifling as the match goes on. It feels like every step forward, Radiance takes PK, takes three strides in exchange. <laughs> now, no more is it gonna be about this neutral objective fight. It's going to be W Key City for the boys on PK. Keep your eyes on Scary. Keep your eyes on Cuvo. And I don't need to say it out loud, but watch Paul inside of these engagements because they're on a tear. But Radiance, Hail Mary, Fire Giant. This is such a risky call. It has to work. And in comes Scary D to look for the punish. Neil Maul there as well. Good wall does stop the damage. They're getting worse, but adapting gets melted. No hope for him on the Fire Giant ring. So Pittsburgh Knights keep up the aggression. Over the wall with the airstrike goes Zetman following in line with his teammate. But Big Man Tings keeps them at bay with the ultimate. But so what? Pittsburgh Knights now settle for the consolation prize of the FG. I don't think they feel bad at all as they start this one up. You spent all that time running away, Radiance, but now you have to answer the question. Are you going to give up Fire Giant to BK? There's the transformation for Paul. He moves in and Aurora, clearly the target. The bat out of hell sets it up, and that's yet another kill going the way of PK. Two for zero yet again, and this time they should be able to confidently start up this fire. I don't see a world where Radiance can step in on this one and hope to contest. And maybe, Miff, maybe they won't need 50 after all. PK look locked in. They look honed in. And Radiance are lost looking for answers. Radiance looking punch drunk in the last hour. PK making is the, short work of him, isn't is it? Is it the empty anime eyes? Are we getting that yes, chest yet? Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Radiance. I don't know if they can hang in there much longer already. We're seeing concessions in the build. It's not a feels good moment when your Anubis is forced into defense. It's not a feels good moment when you make it away from a fire giant fight barely just to be forced into walking back in and lose another fight alongside the objective. PK exposed the first bird. Now it's time to push. And it's a 10K gold lead, certainly still relevant. No one six slotted here at this point. No one selling off those blessings either. So it's a full, full lead here for the Knights. 
We're riding along with Paul and Cubo Freds. They are the men who have done the deed. And forgive me if I have not given Zatman his due credit. 4-1 in 6, I believe second behind Paul on the damage charts as well. The Knights have become an unrelenting force. And whichever one of these teams move on, whichever one of these teams faces Ghost next, don't you think they're going to be locked in? What a show they put on here. And it sounds like they're going to make Ghost work. No, Zap has passed Paul. Those two are absolutely leading. 2K more above the next one. And how often is it really the carries? How often is it the mid and the ADC at the top of the damage chart? Yeah. Usually, at this point, it's just solo laners in the conversation, but that's just the difference that these guys are able to bring. The focus, the laser focus inside of these engagements, they're stepping up for their team. They want to keep going forward. And now, Radiance, Four stacked inside their tier two tower in mid with a world champion staring them down across the court. So it's Zatman pushing up left. They've got Paul and Neil on the flank in between and Scary D and Cuvo pushing up the wave in mid. Meanwhile, Radiance have all their efforts focused on defending the mid. So Zatman gets the tier two tower in left for free and can even be joined by Paul and Neil who have moved in between. No, they'll wrap, they'll wrap around to mid. It looks like it's the plan. I like this better. Send back, Zat back to left and continue this pressure so that they have to move off. I like that. So who's going to respond? Cyclone spin and Aurora forced to rotate over. The second that happens, tier two and mid falls. You're getting spread thin. PK controlling the pace, controlling the map. What are they going to do? That's a big gold swing for them. They've got plenty of time to work with about a minute and a half left on this fire giant. Do they want to go for the Phoenix or do they spend the gold? And Myth, look, we're adapting as of this player damage chart. Sandwich between the Guardians here in this game being outdone by Aurora. Even in that damage, I mean, this is such a big game for him, adapting Lux in the Erlong, and it hasn't been there. I know he's more of a facilitator, but you got to have more than 3,700. It's not a good look, definitely not, especially considering how much we put pressure on him to perform in the early game. Right. We haven't seen it. As the middle Phoenix is under siege, PK back up for now, though, but I believe that's a blink in on the left-hand side. Hard to tell for sure. It was Neil that jumped in. Indeed, a blink, but he and Zatman stay calm. They stay home. And the Knights continue this 3-2 split. Aurora uses the ultimate Cyclone spin as well. It's a 2v2. Oh the God, duo lane trade. remains in the duo. It's going to be the ADC in support up against each other. And again, PK coming out ahead. There's the stun on the Scary D. The damage there as well. But Scary seems to have been tickled. The wall from Aurora denies the aggression for a moment as Tings rotates into this fight in left as well. Neil has to retreat. Zetman in trouble. So he falls back. And Radiance. Despite everything that's happened, doing a great job defending, only about 20 seconds left, 25 or so, on this Fire Giant. Maybe Nice have to give this up after all. Great performance from Radiance to keep them at bay here. And it's not just that they were able to defend, but they're defending up against a Polynomicon Morgan. It just takes one auto attack to strip away four or 500 health from these Phoenixes. Radiance playing on the knife's edge, able to reflect one more push, but the gold lead continues to extend. That's two tier two towers off of that fire giant push, as well as a primal fury. The next fire giant is going to be dealing less damage, and they're going to be dealing more damage to it. Opposite side of the map, Pyromancer falls as well. Now, PK, huge in the lead. And this 6 take 6k gold difference, 16k, excuse me, is making a difference, right? In this one. Maybe a little bit more tight, like 15k, but you're seeing these blessings get sold off. The true six slots starting to come in. Unless they sold the pooch, then they'll really be working. But over there on Radiance, still not that last item finished for Aurora. Still some blessings left for Tings and Adapting, who have not quite caught up. So can they, considering that, come out to contest this next Fire Giant? If you're Radiance, is that a must fight or can you wait on Phoenixes? Look, with this next Fire Giant being enhanced and them only barely able to hang on to the defense in the last one, I think it's a situation where it's damned if you do, damned if you don't. If you step up and you die, you lose the game. If you give up the Fire Giant, you're essentially seeding the game there as well. Radiance have to go for something here, and then they have to come up big. They stepped into the Fire Giant pit first. Bendy does some de-warding to get some vision, and Neil evades Aurora's freeze, so Neil holds on to his Magi's cloak anyway. But now the Knights are coming back in to reclaim the vision around this gold for you to drop some sentries of their own. They've got a few. One did just come out to regain the control on that actual FG pit. And now Radiant seem to be trying to decide what they want to do with that difficult question. Right now, though, they're showing, they're showing to try and contest. Yeah, they are stepping up the plate here. Keep your eyes on Aurora. He's going to have to be the initiator. And this far behind, it's the most difficult role to fulfill 
for your team. He's going to be walking on a tightrope. If he finds a freeze, great. But if he steps too far forward, it's going to cost him his life already. Isolating Cubo Fred. Big play. Great patience from Cubo. They really wanted to make Cubo ult on that one, but he didn't as Aurora goes into the ultimate for the CC immunity. But he's been picked up by Neil and thrown back to the Wolves. Cubo Fred finds the first one. Paul gets the second. This ultimate has been a little bit too much as Cubo continues the battle. The backup shows up and adapting is done. It's a double from Cubo Fred in the game. Now hangs in the balance. PK on the precipice of another win. Fire Giants on the menu, Finch. They want to play with their food. We're not going for the end yet. We want to embarrass Attack King <laughs> on the world stage. Put him down. 40 seconds left on the respawn. Fire Giant goes the way of PK. It's time to start the push. This is it, man. This is the game. This is the set. This is for World Finals and Radiance. After a great season, second seed, they come in this tournament with a bye. Will they go home in their very first set and never see See the finals, never even see what Ghost had yeah, planned. That is it for the Middle Phoenix. Benji, 13 seconds out, adapting another 20, but there are three up from Radiance to look for the defense, but into the base go Pittsburgh Knights and Tings in trouble right away, forced to retreat. Aurora low as well, but the Pittsburgh Knights will not yield. They will not slow down. The Titan continues to fall. The damage too much, and PK are in your finals. The defending world champions are looking to do it again, Finch. Ghost Gaming, you better watch out. Zapman, the boys, they're all stepping forward. Scary D looks good. Paul looks good. They all want it. And you know what? If they're going to be able to take the air from these boys from Radiance, I don't think Ghost is safe either. How safe can you be with PK playing like this with Paul and Cubo Fred hitting everything with Scary D playing this way? What about Zapman leading everybody in the player damage? This is the PK of last year. We'll see if they can make it work tomorrow. But before that, quick break, we'll break it down.